16. She'd forgotten about dinner until minutes before Cade knocked. There'd barely been time to wash her face and repair the damage from the crying jag and what had followed it, and no time at all to think of an acceptable excuse to send him away. She couldn't get her mind around it. The bout with tears had left her hollow head and body. The swing back into Hope's past brought both uneasiness and sorrow. And a thrill. That was the oddest part of it, she admitted. This lingering thrill of that first solo ride, the sheer delight of wobbling down that lovely shade-dappled lane with Cade running beside her, the way his eyes, so blue, so bright, laughed into hers. The love she'd felt for him, the innocent love of a sister, still shimmered through her and mixed dangerously, she knew, with her own emotions that were very adult and had nothing to do with kinship. The combination made her vulnerable to herself and to him. Better, wiser, to be alone until it passed. She'd tell him she was exhausted, too tired to eat. That, at least, would be the truth. He was a reasonable man. Almost too reasonable, she told herself. He'd understand and let her be. When she opened the door, he was standing there holding a casserole dish. Neighbors, she thought, brought food for death. Well, she was dead on her feet, so it seemed appropriate enough. Lila sent this. He stepped in, handed it over. She said anyone who worked as hard as you shouldn't have to cook on top of it. You're instructed to put this in the freezer and pull it out the next time you come home and just need to sit and put your feet up. Which, he added as he continued to study her face, looks like tonight. Yes, she thought, almost too reasonable. I hadn't realized how geared up I was about today. Now that it's over, I'm limp. You've been crying. Delayed reaction. Relief. She carried the dish into the kitchen to put it away, then wondered what to do next. I'm sorry about tonight. It was a nice idea going out to celebrate. Maybe in a couple of days we could... She turned, all but bumped into him, then backed hard against the counter. There was a rough and ready jolt of lust. From her, from him, she couldn't be sure. You had a lot to deal with today. He didn't give her room. He figured he'd already given her plenty. He simply laid his palms on the counter on either side of her, caged her in. He saw her awareness of the move in her eyes, the wariness. A lot of people and the memories they bring along with them. Yes, she started to shift, realized there wasn't anywhere to go. It was her blood that was hot, she thought with some embarrassment, running hot, fast, and greedy. It seemed like memories were shooting out like pebbles from a slingshot, she said, and had ultimately taken her down. All of them painful. No, oh God, she thought, don't touch me. But even as she thought it, his hands were on her shoulders, running down her arms. Everything inside her body began to pulse. It was wonderful to see Lila and Will Hansen. He looks just like his father now. When I was a little girl, Mr. Hansen, old Mr. Hansen, used to give me great knee-high on credit if I was a few pennies short. I often was. Cade, his name was almost a plea. She couldn't have said for what. She was trembling. The little jumps under his palms were wonderfully arousing. I like the way you look today, all tidy and crisp all calm and cool on the outside. Always makes me wonder what's going on under the surface. I was nervous. It didn't show, not the way it's showing now. Defense is down, Tori. I want them down. I'm going to take advantage of it. Kate, I've got nothing in me. Then why are you trembling? He tugged the band from her hair, heard the quick catch in her breathing. His eyes stayed on hers, watching the irises darken as he combed his spread fingers through her hair and unwound the neat braid. Why aren't you stopping me? I, was that her knees going weak? She'd forgotten that could be such a lovely sensation. Surrender wasn't always weakness. I'm thinking about it. He smiled then, a lazy slide of amusement with power at the edges. You just keep right on thinking. I'll keep right on taking advantage. He undid the first button of her shirt, then the second. He'd taught Hope to ride a bike, she thought. He'd only been ten years old and already man enough to care. He'd sent flowers today, the right flowers, because he'd known they'd please her. Now he was touching her as she hadn't been touched in so long. I'm out of practice. He flipped the third button open, thinking, no. Her breath came out on a shaky laugh. I'm very good at thinking most of the time. Then think about this. He gave her shirt a little tug to pull it from the waistband of her slacks. I want to touch you. I want to feel your skin under my hands, like this. He skimmed them up her sides, down. Her stomach quivered when he unhooked her slacks. No, keep your eyes open. 
He leaned forward, caught her chin in his teeth, a brief nip that shot an ache down the center of her body. Since you're out of practice, I'll just guide you through, and I want you looking at me when I touch you. Look straight ahead, he'd told Hope, and had steadied her. I want to look at you, she told him. He lowered the zipper slowly, knuckles grazing against her. Her own low moan echoed like thunder in her ears. It had been so long since a man had wanted her, since a man had made her want. She wanted to tense, go rigid at the thought of the invasion, of privacy, of self, but her body was already yearning. Step out, he murmured when her slacks pooled at her feet. As she blinked, open her mouth to speak, he simply covered it with his. Gentle and warm, somehow reassuring even as the edge of something reckless shimmered at the edges. Then his arms were around her, sliding and skimming over her back as he circled her, a kind of seductive waltz toward the doorway. Nerves chased after the heat that rose to her skin. Cade, I want to take you in the light. She was already his. No barrier of doubt would stop him, so I can see you when you're under me, when I'm inside you. At the door of the bedroom, he lifted her. There are all manner of things I've imagined doing to you in this bed. Let me. The sun streamed rich and gold with the spring evening. It washed over the bed, over her face as he laid her down. The mattress gave under his weight and he linked his fingers with hers. Restraint and unity. And watching her, always watching her, he took her mouth. Slowly at first and sweetly until her hands relaxed under his, until her lips softened, parted, invited. He felt her heartbeat begin to slow, begin to thicken, and as she opened for him he changed the texture and set to ravage. The sudden demand stabbed into her, shocking the senses, scraping the nerves. She arched as heat balled in her belly and the groan strangled in her throat. He aroused her to shudders with his mouth. He didn't want her to anticipate, wanted all her senses stunned and her mind empty of all but pleasure. She would think of him, only of him. He would see to it. When she was steeped in him, finally, he would have her. Her body was slender, the muscles surprisingly firm, almost tough, with delicate skin, a delightful contrast. He indulged himself in the taste of it while part of him calculated how to exploit those nerves and destroy every barrier. He dragged her up, hands rough, gripped near to bruising, ripping another gas from her as her head fell back, her hair tumbled. Then he used his fingertip to nudge the straps of her bra over each shoulder. He danced his fingers lightly over the swell, with his thumb circled her nipples through the cotton. Is it coming back to you yet? Her head was so heavy, her skin so hot. What? Good. He unhooked her bra, drew it aside. But when she reached for him, he pressed her hands flat on the bed, sliding them back until her elbows locked. I want you to take this time. Take until you can't take any more. Then you'll let go, and you'll give. Everything. His mouth all but savaged hers, ripping down to her gut with one jagged and panicked thrill. She wanted to resist, to push him back before he dragged her over a line she'd sworn never to cross again. But then his mouth was on hers again, the scrape of teeth, the flick of tongue whipping hot points of pleasure into her. Her back arched, willful invitation, and her hips began to rock. Little cries and whimpers, she couldn't bite them back. Her arms trembled from the strain even as her body gloried in it. Something frantic was clawing inside her, fighting to break free. A fast, hard orgasm shocked her eyes wide, left her stunned and embarrassed. Then he was pulling her against him, wrapping her close. Let go. He rolled her back on the bed, tugging off his shirt. Her eyes were blurred now, her breath as ragged as his. This time, when she reached for him, he slid into her arms. His mouth was urgent, his hands impatient as they molded and pressed and stroked. She dragged at his trousers, desperate now that nerves had been swallowed by needs. He stripped them aside, then sent her flying when he yanked up her hips and used his mouth on her. Her hands locked around the rungs of the bed, as he'd once imagined. Her head whipped to the side as sensations, dark delights, swamped her. His taste, his scent, flooded her senses, swelled them until there was nothing else. Her breath sobbed out an instant before her long, mindless cry of release. Even as her hands went limp, he locked his around them. His heart was pounding, a rage of blood. The last lights of day and the dying breeze of evening brushed her face. Her hair was a wild mass over the pillows, her cheeks flushed.
He would remember this, always, and so he promised himself would she. Open your eyes, Tori, look at me. When her lids fluttered up, he clung to the last link of control, bent his head, kissed her long, deep. Say my name. The pressure had built again, the terrible, glorious heat of it. Cade. Say it again. Her fingers flexed under his. She wanted to weep or scream. Cade. Again, and plunged into her. Her mind went brilliant. She moved with him, matching each slow, smooth stroke absorbing him, feeding on each individual sensation until they became one glorious feast. Cade, hot and hard inside her, the weight of him solid, strong. The spread soft and smooth on her back, the iron slick against her hands, and the last rays of light going gray with dusk. When the rhythm quickened, she was ready. She was eager and enraptured by the way his eyes, the stunning blue of them, remained fixed on hers. Stay with me. He was lost in her now, drowning in her now. His heart beat brutally against hers as he buried his face in her hair. With their hands still gripped, they let go. She'd never been taken over so completely, not by anyone, not even the man she'd loved. Tori imagined she should be worried about it, but at the moment she couldn't work up the energy for concerns and calculations. She lay under him while the air in the room softened in the twilight. For the first time in much, much too long to remember, she felt completely relaxed, body and mind. She had a hand tangled in his hair. It seemed all right to leave it there. When he turned his head and his lips brushed the side of her breast, she smiled at the lazy pleasure of it. I guess we celebrated after all, she murmured, and wondered if it would be terribly rude to slide into sleep just like this. We'll be sure to find a lot more to celebrate from now on. I've been wanting to get you here since I helped you cart this bed in. I know. Her eyes were nearly closed, but she felt him move his head again, felt him look at her. You weren't all that subtle about it. A lot more subtle than I wanted to be. He thought of how he'd imagined gilding their first time with music and candlelight. We did fine without them, she said sleepily. Without what? Without the music and... Her eyes flew open, filled with horror, and met his considering ones. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She tried to push up, push away, but the weight of him held her in place. What are you sorry for? I didn't mean to. She pressed her hands into the bed, gripped the spread, and was already beginning to shake. It won't happen again. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. Read my mind? He shifted so that he could brace on his elbows and frame her face in his hands. Stop it. I will. I'm terribly sorry. No, damn it, Tori. Stop pulling in. Stop anticipating my reactions. And God damn it, stop wondering if and when I'm going to take a crack at you. He shifted to sit up, then lifted her to face him. Her cheeks had lost that rosy, contented glow and were pale. Her eyes looked strained, near to terrified. He hated it. Did it ever occur to you that there might be times a man wouldn't mind having a woman read his mind? It's an inexcusable breach of privacy. Yeah, yeah. To her shock, he rolled over and pulled her with him so she was sprawled over his chest. Seems to me a few minutes back the two of us breached each other's privacy pretty damn effectively. You want to snatch a stray thought out of my head, I'll let you know if it pisses me off. I don't understand you. You ought to have a pretty good clue since I'm lying here naked in your bed. He kept his voice deliberately careless. If that doesn't do it, take another look inside, see what you find. She didn't know whether to be insulted or horrified. It's not like that. No? Tell me what it's like, then. When she shook her head, he cupped the back of her neck and began to rub. Tell me what it's like. I don't read minds. It doesn't happen by accident or hardly ever. It's just that we were very closely connected physically. I can't argue with that. And I was nearly asleep. Sometimes it can sneak up on you when you're drifting like that. You had an image in your head. It was a very clear, distinct thought, and it just came through. Candlelight, music playing, the two of us standing by the bed. I saw it in mine. So, what were you wearing? When her head snapped up, he shrugged. Never mind, I can think that one through for myself. You get images, pictures of thoughts. Sometimes. He looked so relaxed, so at ease. Where was his anger? God, you confuse me. Good, it'll keep you on your toes. Is that the way it always works? No. No, because if you have any decency, you don't go poking into someone else's private thoughts. I block them out. 
It's simple enough, as they only come through with effort anyway, or if there's a great deal of emotion on either side, or if I'm very tired. All right. Then I'd say the next time we make love and you're drifting off to sleep, I better keep any fantasies about Meg Ryan out of my head. Meg, baffled, Tori sat up again automatically, crossing an arm over her breasts. Meg Ryan, wholesome, sexy, smart. Kate opened his eyes, seems to be my type. He cocked his head, studied her. Just trying to picture you as a blonde, it could work. I'm not going to be a party to some prurient fantasy you've cooked up about a Hollywood actress. Miffed, she started to climb off the bed and found herself flat on her back again and under him. Oh, come on, darling, just this once. No! God, you giggled. Meg, she's got this sexy little giggle. He nipped Tori's shoulder. Now I'm excited. Get off me, you idiot. I can't. He rushed wild kisses over her face, foolish and sweet as a puppy. I'm a victim of my own helpless fantasies. Giggle again. I'm begging you. No, no, but she did. Don't, don't you even think about Jesus. Her laughing struggles stopped as he slid silkily inside her. Her hips arched up and her hands gripped his hips. Don't you dare call me Meg. He lowered his head, chuckling as he took her. They ate Lila's casserole and washed it down with wine and tumble back into bed with the eagerness and energy that fuels new lovers. They made love at moonrise with the light shining silver over their joined bodies, then slept with the windows open to a fitful breeze and the ripe green scents of the marsh. He's coming back. Hope sat cross-legged on the porch of the marsh house, the porch that hadn't been there when she'd been alive. She tossed her handful of silver jacks, then began bouncing the little red ball while her hand darted deft and quick, plucking the star-shaped metal. He's watching. Who? Who is he watching? Tori was eight again, her thin face wary, her legs bruised. He likes to hurt girls. She scooped up the last jack, tossed them again. It makes him feel big, important. Toosies! In that same steady rhythm, she began snatching up pears. He heard other girls, too. Not just you. Not just me, Hope agreed. You already know. Threesies. Jacks clattered, the ball thumped methodically on wood. A light breeze danced by, twined up with the scent of rambling roses and honeysuckle. You already know. Like when you saw the little boy's picture that time, you knew. I can't do that anymore. Inside the child's chest, Tori's heart began to swell and bump. I don't want to do that anymore. You came, Hope said simply, and moved on to Forzies. You have to be careful not to go too fast, not to go too slow, she continued as she swiped a set of four and nipped the ball on the bounce, or you lose your turn. Tell me who he is, Hope. Tell me where to find him. I can't. She swept for another set and knocked a finger against another jack, sent it spinning. Oops. She looked over at Tori with clear eyes. It's your turn now. Be careful. Tori's eyes shot open. Her heart was knocking against her ribs and her hand was curled into a tight fist. So tight she was nearly surprised that a little red ball didn't roll out when she spread her aching fingers. It was full dark now. The moon had set and left the world black and thick. The little breeze had gone with it, so the air was still, hushed. She heard an owl and the shrill bell sound of peepers. She heard Cade's steady breathing in the dark beside her and realized she'd moved to the edge of the bed as far from him as was possible. No contact in sleep, she thought. The mind was too vulnerable then to permit the luxury of casual snuggling. She slipped out of bed and tiptoed into the kitchen. At the sink, she ran water until it chilled, then filled a tumbler. The dream had given her a desperate thirst and had reminded her why she had no business sleeping with Kincaid Lavelle. His sister was dead, and if she wasn't responsible, she was obligated. She'd felt obligated before and had followed through. The path she'd taken had brought her great joy and shattering grief. She'd slept with another man then, given herself out of careless and innocent love. When she'd lost him, lost everything, she'd promised herself she'd never make those choices, those mistakes, again. Yet here she was, opening herself to all that pain a second time. Cade was the kind of man women fell in love with, the kind she could fall in love with. 
Once that step was taken, it colored everything you thought, everything you did and felt, in the bold hues of joy, in the drowning grays of despair. So the step couldn't be taken, not again. She would have to be sensible enough to accept the physical attraction, enjoy the results of it, and keep her emotions separate and controlled. What else had she done nearly all of her life? Love was a reckless, dangerous thing. There was always something lurking in the shadows, greedy and spiteful, just waiting to snatch it away. She lifted the glass to her lips and saw. Beyond the window, beyond the dark, in the shadows, she thought dully, waiting and the glass slipped from her fingers to shatter in the sink. Tori! Cade shot out of sleep, out of bed, and stumbled in the dark. Cursing, he rushed toward the kitchen. She stood under the harsh light, both hands at her throat, staring, staring at the window. Someone's in the dark. Tori! He saw the sparkle of broken glass that had jumped from the sink to the floor. He grabbed her hands. Are you cut? Someone's in the dark, she said again, in a voice much like a child. Watching. From the dark. He's been here before, and he'll come back again. Her eyes stared into Cade's, through them, and all she saw were shadows, silhouettes. What she felt was cold, so much cold. He'll have to kill me. I'm not the one, but he'll have to because I'm here. It's my fault, really. Anybody could see that. If I'd come with her that night, he'd, he'd have just watched, like he'd done before. He'd have just watched and imagined doing it just imagined until he got hard and used his hand so he could feel like a man. Her knees went out from under her, but she protested as Cade swept her up. I'm all right. I, I just need to sit down. Lie down, he corrected. When he put her back on the bed, he hunted up his trousers. You stay in here. Where are you going? The sudden terror of being left alone brought strength back to her knees. She leaped up. You said someone was outside. I'm going to look. No. Now the fear was all for him. It's not your turn. What? She held up both hands and sank down onto the mattress. I'm sorry. My mind's confused. He's gone, Kate. He's not out there now. He was watching earlier, I think, earlier, when we were... It made her queasy. When we were making love, he watched. Grimly, Kate nodded. I'll look anyway. You won't find him, she murmured as Kate strode out. But he wanted to. He wanted to find someone and use his fists, use his fury. He switched on the outside light, scanned the area washed in pale yellow. He walked to his truck, got a flashlight out of his toolbox and the knife he kept there. Armed, he circled the house, sweeping the light over the ground into the shadows. Near the bedroom window where the grass needed trimming, he crouched beside a flattened area where a man might have stood. Son of a bitch. He hissed it between his teeth and his hand tightened on the hilt of the knife. He straightened, spun around to stalk into the marsh. He stood on the verge and strained against impotence. He could go in, thrash around, work off some of his anger, and by doing so, leave Tori alone. Instead, he went back inside, left the knife and flashlight on the kitchen table. She still sat there, her fists bunched on her knees. She lifted her head when he came in, but said nothing. She didn't have to. What we did together in here was ours, Cade said. He doesn't change that. He sat beside her, took her hand. He can't if we don't let him. He made it dirty. For him, not for us. Not for us, Tori, he murmured and turned her face to his. She sighed once, touched the back of his hand with her fingers. You're so angry. How do you tie it up that way? I kicked my truck a couple of times. He pressed his lips to her hair. Will you tell me what you saw? His anger, blacker than yours could ever be, but not I don't know how to explain, not substantial, not real, and a kind of pride. I don't know, maybe it's more a satisfaction. I can't see it, see him. I'm not the one he wants, but he can't let me stay. He can't trust me this close to hope. I don't know if those are my thoughts or his. She squeezed her eyes shut, shook her head. I can't get him clear. It's as if something's missing, in him or in me. I don't know, but I can't see him. It wasn't a drifter who killed her, the way we thought all these years. No. She opened her eyes again, turned away from her own grief and toward his. It was someone who knew her, who watched her, us. I think I knew that even back then, but I was so afraid I closed it up. If I'd gone back the morning after, 
If I'd had the courage to go in with you and your father instead of telling you where she was, I might have seen. I can't be sure, but I might have. Then it would have been over. We don't know that, but we can start to end it now. We'll call the police. Cade, the police... Her throat wanted to close. It's very rare that even the most forward-thinking, open-minded cop listens to someone like me. I don't expect to find that particular breed here in progress. Chief Russ might take some convincing, but he'll listen to you. Cade thought he would make sure of it. Why don't you get dressed? You're going to call him now at four in the morning? Yeah, Cade picked up the bedside phone. That's what he gets paid for. 17. Police Chief Carl D. Russ wasn't a big man. He'd reached the height of five feet six and a quarter when he was 16 and had stayed plugged there. He wasn't a handsome man. His face was wide and pitted with his ears stuck on either side like oversized cup handles. His hair was as grizzled as a used-up scouring pad. He had a scrawny build and topped the scale at 130, fully dressed and soaking wet. His ancestors had been slaves, field workers. Later they'd been sharecroppers eking out stingy livings on another man's land. His mother had wanted more for him and had pushed, prodded, harangued, and browbeat until mostly out of self-defense he aimed for more. Carl D.'s mother enjoyed the fact that her boy was police chief nearly as much as he did. He wasn't a brilliant man. Information cruised into his brain, meandering about, taking winding paths and detours until it settled down into complete thoughts. He tended to be plodding. He also tended to be thorough. But above all, Carl D. was affable. He didn't bitch and moan about being awakened at four in the morning. He'd simply gotten up and dressed in the dark so as not to disturb his wife. He'd left her a note on the kitchen board and had tucked her latest honey-do list in his pocket on the way out. What he thought about Kincaid Lavelle being at Victoria Bodine's house at four in the morning, he kept to himself. Cade met him at the door. Thanks for coming, Chief. Oh, well, that's all right. Carl D. chewed contentedly on the stick of big red gum he was never without since his wife had nagged him into quitting smoking. Had yourself a prowler, did you? We had something. Let's take a look around the side, see what you think. How's your family doing? They're fine, thanks. Her Aunt Rosie was down for a visit. You be sure to give her my best now. I'll do that. Cade showed his flashlight on the grass under the bedroom window, waited while Carl D. did the same, and pondered. Well, could be y'all had somebody standing there playing Peep and Tom. Might have been an animal. He scanned with his light, chewed contemplatively. It's a quiet spot, off the road a ways. Don't see that anybody'd have good cause to be wandering around out here. Guess they could come across from the road or out through the swamp. You get any kind of a look? No, I didn't see anything. Tori did. Guess I'll talk to her first, then do some poking around. Anybody was out here has hightailed it by now. He got creakily to his feet and swept his light over the darker shadows where the live oaks and tupelos closed in the swamp. Yeah, this here's a quiet spot, all right. Couldn't pay me to live out this way. Bet you hear frogs and owls and such all blessed night long. You get used to them, Cade said as they walked around to the back door. You don't really hear them. I guess that's the way you get so you don't hear the usual sounds anymore, and something that's not usual gives you kind of a jolt. Would you say that? I suppose I would, and no, I didn't hear anything. Me, I'm what you call a light sleeper. Least little thing pops my eyes open. Now, Ida May, she won't stir if a bomb goes off. He stepped into the kitchen, blinked at the bright lights, then politely removed his cap. Morning, Miss Bodine. Chief Russ, I'm sorry for the trouble. Don't you worry about that. Would that be coffee I smell? Yes, I just made it. Let me pour you a cup. Sure would appreciate that. Heard you had a nice turnout at your store today. My wife sure enjoyed herself. Got one of those wind chimes. Fussed about it the minute I got in the door. Nothing would do, but I hang it up right off the bat. Makes a pretty sound. Yes, they do. What would you like in your coffee? Oh, a half pound of sugar's all, he winked at her. You don't mind, we'll sit down here and you can tell me about this prowler of yours. Tori shot Kate a look before she set out the coffee and sat. Someone was at the window, the bedroom window, while Kate and I were. Carl D. took out his notepad and one of the three chewed-up pencils in his pocket. I know this is a mite awkward for you, Miss Bodine. You try to relax now. Did you get a look at the person at the window? No. No, not really. I woke up and came into the kitchen for a drink of water. While I was standing at the sink, I... 
He was watching the house, watching me, us. He doesn't want me here. He stirred up that I came back. Who? The same man who killed Hope Lavelle. Carl D. set his pencil down and, tucking his gum in the pocket of his cheek, picked up his coffee to sip. How do you know that, Miss Bodine? Oh, his tone was mild, she thought, but his eyes were the cool, flat eyes of a cop. She knew cop's eyes, intimately. The same way I knew where to find Hope the morning after she was killed. You were there. She knew her voice was belligerent, her posture defensive. She couldn't help it. You weren't chief then. No, I've only been chief for going on six years. Chief Tate, he retired, moved on down to Naples, Florida, got himself a motorboat, does a lot of fishing. Chief Tate, he was always one for fishing. Russ paused. I was a deputy the summer little Hope Lavelle was murdered. Terrible thing. Worst thing ever happened around these parts. Chief Tate, he figured it was a drifter did what was done to that little girl. Never found any evidence to the contrary. You never found anything, Tory corrected. Whoever killed her knew her, just like he knows me and you and Cade. He knows progress. He knows the swamp. Tonight he came up to the window of my house. But you didn't see him. Not in the way you mean. Carl D. sat back, pursed his lips, considered. My wife's granny, on her ma's side, holds whole conversations with dead relatives. Now, I'm not saying that's the true case or that it's not, as I'm not the one having those chats. But in my job, Miss Bodine, it comes around to facts. The fact is, I knew what had happened to Hope and where she could be found. The man who killed her knows that. Chief Tate didn't believe me. He decided I'd been out there with her, then had run off when I got scared and left her there, or that I found her after she was dead and just went home and hid until morning. There was kindness in Carl D.'s eyes. He'd raised two girls of his own. You were hardly more than a baby yourself. I'm grown up now, and I'm telling you, the man who killed Hope was out there tonight. He's killed others, at least one other. A young girl he picked up hitchhiking on the way to Myrtle Beach. He's already targeted someone else, not me. I'm not the one he wants. You can tell me all this, but you can't tell me who he is. No, I can't. I can tell you what he is, a sociopath who feels he has the right to do what he does because he needs it, needs the excitement and the power of it, a misogynist who believes women are here to be used by men, a serial killer who has no intention of stopping or being stopped, He's had a run of 18 years, she said quietly. Why should he stop? I didn't handle that very well. Cade closed the back door, sat down at the table. He and Carl D. had walked the property, scouted the edges of the swamp. They'd found nothing, no fresh footprints, no handy, torn swatch of material on a tree branch. You told him what you know. He doesn't believe me. Whether he does or not, he'll do his job. Like they did their job 18 years ago. He said nothing for a moment. The reminder of that morning was always a quick, sharp stab to the gut. Who are you blaming, Tori? The cops or yourself? Both. No one believed me, and I couldn't explain myself. I was afraid to. I knew I'd be punished, and the more I said, the worse the punishment. In the end, I did what I could to save myself. Didn't we all? He pushed away from the table, went to the stove to pour coffee he didn't want. I knew she was out of the house that night. Knew she planned to sneak out. I didn't say anything, not then, not the next day, not ever, about seeing her bike hidden. That night I considered it the code. You don't tattle unless you're going to get something out of it. So what if she wanted to ride off for a couple of hours? He turned back to see Tori watching him. The next day when we found her, I didn't say anything. That was self-preservation. They'd blame me as much as I blamed myself. After a while, there just didn't seem to be a point. We were all missing a piece and could never get it back. But I can go back to that night, replay it in my head. Only this time I tell my father how Hope stashed her bike, and he locks it up and gives her one hell of a talking to. The next morning she wakes up safe in her bed. I'm sorry. Oh, Tori, so am I. I've been sorry for 18 years, and over that time I've watched the sister I have left do whatever she could to ruin her life. I saw my father pull away from all of us as if being with us hurt more than he could stand and my mother coat herself with layer on layer of bitterness and propriety, all because I was more interested in my own affairs than seeing to it Hope stayed in bed where she belonged. Cade, there would have been another night. 
There wouldn't have been that one. I can't fix it, Tori, and neither can you. I can find him. Sooner or later I will find him. Or he'll find me, she thought. He's already found me. I have no intention of standing by this time while someone else I care about takes foolish risks. He set the coffee aside. You need to pack some things. Go stay with your aunt and uncle. I can't do that. I have to stay here. I can't explain it to you except to say I have to stay here. If I'm wrong, there is no risk. If I'm right, it won't matter where I am. He wouldn't waste time arguing. He'd simply find a way to arrange it as he thought best. Then I'll pack a few things of my own. Excuse me? I'm going to be spending a lot of time here. It'll be more convenient to have what I need close at hand. Don't look so surprised. One night in bed doesn't make us lovers. But that, he said, pulling her to her feet, is what we're going to be. You're taking a lot for granted, Cade. I don't think so. He caught her face in his hands, kissed her, sliding her closer until her lips softened, warmed beneath his. I don't think I'm taking a thing for granted, most particularly you. Let's just say you get your feelings about things, Tori, things you know without being able to explain them. So do I. I've had one of those feelings about you, and I'm going to stick close until I can explain it. Attraction and sex aren't such a puzzle, Cade. They are when you haven't found and fit in all the connecting pieces. You let me in, Tori. You won't get me out again half as easy. It's a clever trick, how you manage to be annoying and comforting at the same time. She drew away, and I'm not sure I let you in at all. You just pretty much go where you please. True enough, and he wouldn't bother to deny it. Going to try to kick me out? Doesn't look like it. Good, that saves us an argument. Well, since we're up and dressed, why don't we do some business? Business? I've got those samples out in the truck. I'll bring them in and we can negotiate. Tori glanced at the clock. It was still shy of seven. Why not? This time you make the coffee. Faith waited until half past ten when she was certain both her mother and Lila had left for church. Her mother had long since given up expecting Faith to attend Sunday services, but Lila was bullheaded about God and often considered herself his drill sergeant, whipping the troops out of bed and into church with threats of eternal damnation. Whenever she was home, Faith was careful to hide and hide well on Sunday mornings. She made up for it by occasionally putting on a demure dress and presenting herself in the kitchen so Lila could shuffle her off toward redemption. But this particular Sunday, she wasn't in the mood to be obliging or to sit on a hard pew and listen to a sermon. She wanted to sulk over a breakfast bowl of chocolate ice cream and remind herself what bastards men were. When she thought of all the trouble she'd gone through for Wade Mooney, she could just spit. Hadn't she slathered herself all over with perfumed cream, slithered into the sexiest lingerie money could buy, and would have been perfectly willing for him to rip those bits of satin and lace right off her body, too? She dug out four-inch heels and had strapped herself in an excuse for a little black dress that shouted, I want a sin. She'd raided the wine cellar for two bottles that cost more than a college education, and when Cade found out, he was going to skin her for it. And when she'd arrived at Wade's, primed, polished, and perfumed, he hadn't had the decency to be home. Bastard. Worse, she'd waited for him. She'd tidied up his bedroom like a little housefrau, had lighted candles, put on music, then had damn near nodded off during the vigil. She'd waited another hour till almost one in the morning, primed for a different purpose. Oh, how she'd wanted him to walk in the door so she could have kicked his inconsiderate ass all the way back down the steps. It was his fault she'd gotten half drunk on the wine, and certainly his that due to the alcohol content in her blood, she'd misjudged the turn through the gates and scraped the side of her car. So, it was absolutely his fault that she was sitting there on a Sunday morning, miserably hung over and stuffing ice cream in her face. She never wanted to see him again. In fact, she thought she would just give up men altogether. They weren't worth the time and trouble they drained out of a woman. She'd just cut them out of her life and find other areas of interest. Cade walked in the door as Faith was digging her spoon back into the half-gallon carton, and since he knew what mood dictated that particular behavior, tried to slip right out again. But he wasn't quite quick enough. Oh, sit down. I'm not going to bite you. She lighted a cigarette, then proceeded to smoke with one hand and eat with the other. Everybody's gone off to church to save their immortal souls. Aunt Rosie went with Lila, I think. She likes to go to Lila's church more than she does Mama's. I caught a glimpse of them as they were leaving. Aunt Rosie had a hat on big as a turkey platter and lime green tennis shoes, so she couldn't be going with Mama. Sorry, I missed it. He got a spoon, sat, and scooped out some ice cream. So, what's wrong? 
Why should anything be wrong? I'm just as content as a goose with a nest of golden eggs. She blew out smoke, narrowed her eyes against it, and took a good look at him. His hair was a little damp, so the gilt edges of it stood out. That meant a recent shower, since Cade never bothered to do more than rub a towel over his hair to dry it off after one. His eyes, blue as her own, were lazily content, his lips quirked in a half-assed smile. She knew just what sort of activity put that look on a man's face. You haven't changed clothes since yesterday. Haven't been home, have you? Well, 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 I guess somebody got lucky last night. Cade licked a spoon, studied her in turn, and I guess somebody didn't. I'm not going to sit here and discuss my sex life over your breakfast ice cream. You and Tori Bodine, isn't that just perfect? I like it. Cade scraped out another spoonful. Don't get in the way of this, Faith. Why should I? What do I care? Just don't know what you see in her is all. She's pretty enough, but she's got a coolness around her. Sooner or later, she'll freeze you out. She's not made the way the rest of us are. You'd find out differently if you took time to get to know her. She could use a friend, Faith. Well, don't look at me. I make a lousy friend. You can ask anyone. And I don't even much like her. You want to bang her a few times, that's your business. Hey, she looked up full of surprised insult when he grabbed her wrist, thumped their joined hands to the table. It's not like that. His voice had gone soft as silk, and there was the warning gleam of temper in his eyes. Sex isn't a casual pastime to everyone. You're hurting me. No, you're hurting yourself. He let her go, then rose to toss his spoon in the sink. Thoughtfully, Faith rubbed her wrist. What I'm doing is making damn sure I'm not hurt. You want to lay your heart out so somebody can stomp on it, that's fine for you, but I'll tell you one thing I know for sure. You don't want to be falling in love with Tori. That's something that's never going to work. I don't know whether I want to or not. I don't know whether it'll work or not. He turned back. What you don't seem to know, Faith, is how much you're like her. The two of you barricaded against your own feelings in case, just on the off chance, that something might sting. She does it by closing in and you do it by acting out, but it's the same damn thing. I'm nothing like her, she shouted it at him as he walked from the room. I'm nothing like anybody but myself. Furious, she heaved her spoon across the room and, leaving the ice cream melting on the table, stormed upstairs to dress. She had to take it out on somebody, and since, through the maze of her thinking, it all stemmed back to Wade, he was elected. She dressed for this bout, too. She had her pride and wanted to look stunning when she skewered him straight through the heart, ripped him into little pieces, then dumped him and danced away singing a happy tune. She wore silk tailored and trim in a deep blue to bring out her eyes and make him remember them. She started to shove open the door to his apartment, stopped herself, and knocked formally. She heard yips and whines on the other side and rolled her eyes. He'd brought one of his sick mutts upstairs. How had she ever let herself get to this stage with a man who thought more of a stray dog than he did of a woman willing to jump his bones? Thank God she'd come to her senses. Then he opened the door, rumpled, sleepy-eyed, wearing only jeans he hadn't bothered to button and she remembered how she'd gotten to this stage with this particular man. Her juices wanted to rise and churn, but she ignored them and, grabbing his hand, slapped the key into it. What? That's for starters. I have a few things to say to you, then I'll take my leave. She shoved him aside and strode in. She'd worn heels that showed off her legs in the short dress just to torment him. What time is it? She gritted her teeth. He was simply destroying her timing. It's nearly noon. Oh, Christ, it can't be. I have to be at my mother's in an hour. He sank into a chair, buried his head in his hands. I'll probably be dead in an hour. You will if I have anything to do with it. She leaned down, sniffed, reared back. You smell like the inside of a cheap bottle of bourbon. It was an expensive bottle of bourbon, and I'm not inside it. It's inside me. His stomach rolled uneasily for the moment. So... She slapped her hands on her hips. You were out getting drunk and tomcatting around half the night. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I'm not entirely sure. I think I started out that way. Because, she continued, furious at the interruption, that's how you can spend every Saturday night from now on as far as I'm concerned. Jealousy veered in and cut pride off at the pass. Who the hell was she? Who? He took a chance and let go of his head. He was vaguely disappointed when it didn't roll off his shoulders. Who was who? The little slut you think you can two-time me with and live? She picked up the closest thing at hand, a small lamp, yanked the cord free and heaved it. The resulting crash had howls coming from the bedroom and brought Wade unsteadily to his feet. 
You son of a bitch, is she still here? Who? What the hell's wrong with you? You broke my lamp. I'll break your neck before I'm done. She whirled, raced into the bedroom, intending to rake the eyes out of the woman who'd usurped her place. On the bed stood a small black puppy, barking wildly and cowering against the pillows. Where is she? Who? Wade threw up his hands. His hair was standing on end and there was a kickboxer working out behind each of his eyes. Where is who? What the hell are you talking about, Faith? The bitch you're sleeping with. The only bitch I've slept with recently besides you is that one. He gestured toward the bed. And she's only been here a couple of hours. Really, she means nothing to me. You think you can joke about this? Just where were you last night? I was out, goddammit. He stalked the bathroom, shoving bottles and tubes aside as he searched for aspirin in the medicine chest. You were out all right. I came by at nine and stayed till nearly one. Damn it. She hadn't meant to tell him she'd waited so long. You never showed up. Ready to whimper, he shook out four pills, swallowed them with tepid tap water. I don't recall us having plans for last night. You don't like to make plans. Ties you down. Takes the excitement out of things. He leaned back on the sink, stared at her balefully. Well, this is exciting. It was Saturday night. You had to know I'd come by. No, Faith, I don't have to know anything. You don't want me to know anything. She tossed her head. They were getting off the subject. I want to know where you were and who you were with. That's a lot of demands from someone who doesn't want any strings. His eyes might have throbbed like drums, but they could still go hard. Straight sex, fun and games, aren't those the ground rules? I don't cheat, she said with some dignity. When I'm with a man, I don't go off with another. I expect the same consideration. I wasn't with another woman. I was with Dwight. Oh, that's just a bullshit lie. Dwight Frazier's a married man, and he wasn't out half the night drinking and carousing with you. I don't know where he was after about ten. Home tucked in with Lissy, I expect. They went to the movies, and I tagged along. His voice had gone flat, his eyes cold and dull. They went home. I bought a bottle. I went for a drive. I got drunk. I came home. If I'd done anything else, with anyone else, I'd have been free to do so, same as you are. That's the way you wanted it. I never said that. You never said different. I'm saying different now. You can't have it all your way, Faith. You want to change things. You want it to be you and me. Then we start adding some of my rules. I didn't say anything about rules. He was twisting things, she thought, just like a man. I'm speaking a common courtesy. And that means I sit around here and wait till you're in the mood for my company? I don't think so. We both come and go as we please unless we're pleased to be together. Or we make this a relationship. No more sneaking in here or off to some motel. No more pretending we're not involved. We're either a couple or we're not. You're making ultimatums? Her voice snapped at the end, a whiplash of shock. You're making them to me after you kept me waiting here half the night? Frustrating, isn't it? The waiting pisses you off. He pushed away from the sink and walked toward her. Makes you feel used and sorry and hurt. I know. Stymied, she pushed a hand through her hair. You never said anything about that. You'd have taken off like a shot. That's your style, Faith. Sometime last night, while I was sitting down at the river with a bottle for company, it occurred to me that I didn't like that about you, and I didn't like it about myself that I let you be that way with me. So I'm telling you now. We try to make this work like people who give two dams about each other, or we walk away. You know I care about you, Wade. What do you take me for? It was more, he thought, what she took herself for. There was a time I'd have taken you no matter what. That time's over. I want more now, Faith. If you can't give it to me or won't, I'll live with it. But I'm not settling for crumbs anymore. I don't understand this. Shaken, she sat down on the edge of the bed. The puppy crawled toward her on her belly, sniffing. I don't see how you can turn this around on me. Not on you, on us. I want there to be an us, Faith. I'm in love with you. What, are you crazy? She leaped up again, panic in every pore. Don't say that. I've said it before, but you never listened. It didn't matter enough. This time it'll have to matter, or I won't say it again. I'm in love with you, he caught her shoulders. That's the way it is, whatever you do about it. What am I supposed to do about it? There was a loose and fluttery sensation in her stomach she recognized as pure panic. Oh, this is just a mess. Your usual response to me telling you I love you is to run off and marry somebody else. He lifted his brow as her mouth fell open. That's not... I don't... Oh, God, he was right. She did. 
We could try something new this time out. We could try dealing with this like normal people and see where it goes. We could spend time with each other, do more together than jump into bed. There's more between us than sex. She sniffled. How do you know? He laughed a little and brushed at her hair. All right, let's say I want to find out if there's more between us than sex. What if there isn't? What if there is? What if there isn't? He sighed. Then I guess we'll end up spending a lot of time in bed. If there's anything left of it, he added, and stepped over to tug away the pillow the puppy was trying to chew to bits. He was so solid, so smart and kind and handsome, and he loved her. But no one ever loved her for long. Lighten it up, Faith ordered herself, at least until her heart stopped jumping. I don't know about a relationship with a man who sleeps with little mongrel dogs. Miss Dottie dropped her off this morning on her way to church. I was too hungover to do anything but plop us both in bed. What's wrong with her? Who? Oh, the puppy? Nothing. He leaned over, ruffled fur, scratched ears. Bright-eyed and healthy, had all her shots and took them like a champ. Then what are you doing with her? Keeping her for you. For me? Faith took a full step back. I don't want a dog. Sure you do. He plucked the puppy from the bed and pushed her into Faith's arms. Look, she likes you. Puppies like everybody, Faith protested as she twisted her head to try to avoid the pup's cheerful tongue. Exactly. With the dimples flickering in his cheeks, Wade slipped his arms around Faith's waist, sandwiching the puppy between them. And everybody likes puppies. She'll depend on you, entertain you, keep you company, and love you no matter what. She'll pee on the rug. She'll chew my shoes. Some. She'll need discipline and training and patience. She'll need you. They'd known each other most of their lives. Just because they'd spent most of their time together between the sheets didn't mean she didn't have clues as to how his mind worked. Is this a dog or a life lesson you're giving me? Both. He leaned over to kiss Faith's cheek. Give it a try. If it doesn't work out, I'll take her back. The puppy was warm and trying desperately to snuggle in the curve of Faith's neck and shoulder. What was going on? It seemed everyone was hammering at her all at once. First Boots, then Cade, and now Wade. You've got my head spinning. I can't keep up with you today, and that's the only reason I'm agreeing to this. To us or to the puppy? A little bit of both. That's a good enough start for me. There's puppy food in the kitchen. Why don't you go feed her while I get a shower? I'm going to be late for dinner at my folks. Why don't you come with me? Thanks, but I'm not ready for family dinners quite yet. She remembered all too well the cool, clear gleam in his mother's eyes. Go on and shower. You stink worse than a litter of puppies. She frowned as she carried the puppy into the kitchen. She wasn't sure if she was ready for any of this, any of it at all. 18. Tori had barely unlocked the door on Monday morning when it chimed open. Morning. I'm Sherry Bellows. I tied my dog to your bench outside. Hope that's all right. Tori glanced out, saw a hairy mountain sitting docilely on the sidewalk. It's fine. He's big, isn't he? And beautiful. He's a doll, baby. We just got back from a morning run in the park, and I thought I'd stop in. I was here Saturday for a little while. You had quite a crowd. Yes, it kept me busy. Is there something I can show you, or would you like to just browse? Actually, I wondered if you were thinking of taking on any help. Sherry flipped back her ponytail, lifted her arms. I'm not exactly dressed for job hunting, she said with a smile, and tugged the damp T-shirt down over her running shorts, but I just followed impulse. I teach at the high school, will teach, summer classes starting middle of June, then full-time in the fall. Doesn't sound like you need a job. I've got the next couple of weeks, then Saturdays and half days through September. I'd enjoy working in a place like yours and the extra money a part-time job would bring in. I put myself through college working retail so I know the ropes. I can give you references and I don't have a problem working for minimum wage. To tell you the truth, Sherry, I haven't really thought about hiring, at least not until I see how the business goes for the first few weeks. Can't be easy to run the place solo. If there was one thing Sherry had learned while pursuing her teaching degree, it was persistence. No breaks, no time to do paperwork or check inventory or make your orders. Since you're open six days a week, that doesn't give you much opportunity to run errands, do your banking, your shopping. I imagine you ship, don't you? Well, yes, you'd have to close the shop every time you needed to scoot down to the post office or wait to ship orders until the next morning before you opened. That adds extra hours to your day. Anybody who can put together a business like this on her own knows her time is worth money. Tori took another good look. Sherry was young, pretty, damp from jogging, and very direct. And she had a point. 
Tori had been in the shop since eight, boxing orders for shipping, doing paperwork, rushing to the bank and the post office. Not that she didn't enjoy it, it gave her a lovely flush of satisfaction, but it would become more and more demanding as time went on. At the same time, she wasn't sure she wanted to share her shop with anyone, even part-time. There was a deep pleasure in having it all to herself, and that, she admitted, was indulgent and impractical. You've caught me off guard. Why don't you write down your address and phone number and those references? Tori walked behind the counter for her clipboard. Give me some time to think about it. Terrific. Sherry took the pen Tori offered, tapped it on the clipboard, and I come with a partner, a two-for-one deal. She nodded toward the window where two women had stopped to admire Mongo. He's so precious people can't help but want to give him a good pet. Since they're standing there, they'll just have to look at your display. I bet they come in. Clever. Tori lifted a brow. Maybe I should just buy a dog. Sherry laughed and began to write, Oh, you'd never find another like my Mongo, and as good as he is, he can't ring up sales. Good point. And good call, she added quietly when the two women stepped into the shop. Is that your dog? He's mine, Sherry turned beaming. I hope he didn't bother you. Why, he's the sweetest thing, just a great big ball of fur. Gentle as a lamb, Sherry assured them. We just had to stop in and see all the pretty things in here. Isn't this a wonderful place? Very nice. I don't recall seeing it before. We just opened Saturday, Tori told her. I haven't been down this part of town for quite a while. The woman glanced around. Her friend was already wandering. I do like those candle stands in the window. We've just moved into a new house and I'm doing some redecorating. I'll get them out for you. Tori glanced at Sherry. Excuse me. Oh, you go right on. Take your time. Sherry watched as Tori assisted the customers. Low-key, she noted. Well, she could do low-key, let the merchandise sell itself. But she didn't think it would hurt if she chatted. It was so hard for her not to, and she thought it might be a nice balance against Tori's quiet class. She'd get the job, Sherry determined, as she continued to write and keep one eye on the procedure. She was good at talking people into things, and she really could use the extra money. To gild the lily a bit, she enthused over the customer's choices, drew them into friendly conversation while Tori boxed and wrapped. They left happy and well loaded down. That was nice, but I think you could have talked Sally into those garden plaques. If she wants them, she'll be back. Amused, Tori filed the credit card receipts, and I'm banking on a friend talking her into it over lunch. You're good with people. Do you know anything about crafts? I'm a very fast learner. And since I admire your taste in merchandise, it'll be an easy lesson. I can start right away. Tori was on the point of agreeing. Something about Sherry hit all the right notes. Then the door opened, and her mind emptied of everything but terrorized shock. Hello there, Tori. Hannibal spread his lips in a wide, wide smile. Been a while. He shifted his eyes, spread that bright look over Sherry. That your dog out there, Missy? Yes, that's Mongo. I hope you didn't mind him. Oh, no, indeed. Looks to be as friendly as a Sunday social. Mighty big dog for a little thing like you. Saw you running with him in the park a while ago. Couldn't tell who was leading who. Sherry felt a quick ripple of unease, but managed to laugh. Oh, he lets me think I'm in charge. A good dog's a faithful friend. More faithful than people, mostly. Tori, aren't you going to introduce me to your friend here? Hannibal Bodine, he said before Tori could speak and held out the big hand he'd so often used to silence her. I'm Victoria's daddy. It's nice to meet you. Relaxed again, Sherry gave his hand a warm shake. You must be so proud of your daughter and what she's done here. Hardly a day goes by, I don't think of it. His eyes pinned Tori again. And her. Tori shoved at the edges of shock. If he was here, she had to deal with him, and deal with him alone. Sherry, I appreciate your coming in. I'll look this over and call you soon. I appreciate that. I'm trying to talk your daughter into hiring me. Maybe you could put in a good word. Nice to have met you, Mr. Bodine. I'll wait to hear from you, Tori. She walked out and crouched by the dog. Tori could hear her delighted laughter and the dog's welcoming bark through the closed door. Well, now. He put his hands on his hips and turned to study the shop. This is quite a place you've got here. Looks like you're doing pretty well for yourself. He hadn't changed. Why hadn't he changed? Did he look older? He didn't seem to. He hadn't lost his girth or his hair or that dark gleam in his eyes. Time didn't seem to touch him. And when he turned back, she felt herself shrinking. She felt the years and all the effort she'd put into remaking herself slipping away. What do you want? Real well for yourself. 
He stepped up to the counter, closing the distance, and she saw she'd been wrong, at least partially wrong. There was some age on his face, carved into deep lines around his mouth, sagging in his jowls, scored across his brow like whiplashes. You come back here to flaunt that in your old hometown? Pride goeth before a fall, Victoria. How did you know I was here? Did Mama tell you? A father's a father all of his life. I've kept my eye on you. Did you come back here to boast and shame me? I came back here for myself. It has nothing to do with you, she said, and thought lies, lies, lies. It was here you set the town talking, had them pointing fingers. It was here you defied me and the Lord for the first time. The shame of what you did and what you were drove me from here. Margaret Lavelle's money in your pocket drove you from here. A muscle jumped in his cheek, a warning. So, people are talking already. I don't care for that. A liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. They'll talk more if you spend any time around here, and those who are looking for you are bound to find you. I've been to see Mama. She's worried about you. Got no cause to. I'm ahead of my own house. A man comes and goes as he sees fit. Runs. You ran after you were caught and arrested and charged for assaulting that woman. You lit out and left Mama alone, and when they catch you this time, there won't be probation. They'll put you behind bars. You mind your mouth. His hand shot out. She was prepared for a blow, was braced for it, but he grabbed her shirt front and hauled her half over the counter. You show me respect. You owe me your life. It was my seed started you into this world, to my everlasting regret. She thought of the scissors under the counter, imagined them in her hand as he dragged her over another inch, and wondered as she looked into the terrible and familiar rage in his face if she was capable of using them. If you lay a hand on me, I swear I'll go straight to the police. You hit me and I'll tell them, and I'll tell them of all the times you left me bruised and battered. When I'm done, she gasped, fought not to cry out when he yanked her hair back with his free hand and the rough edge of his fingers scraped like a burn over the side of her throat. Tears of pain leaked out of her eyes and made her voice rasp. When I'm done, they'll put more bars around you. I swear it. Now you let me go and you walk out of here. I'll forget I ever saw you. You would dare to threaten me? It's not a threat. It's a fact. The fury and hate rolling out of him almost smothered her. She could feel her throat closing against it, her chest clogging. She wouldn't be able to hold out much longer. Let me go. She kept her eyes on his as she slid her hand under the counter, feeling for the scissors. Let me go before someone comes through and sees you. Emotions lit over his face. Fear added to the mix of violence pumping from him. Her fingers brushed the cool metal handles, and he jerked her to the side, all but rammed her into the cash register. I need money. You give me what you got in there. You owe me for every breath you've ever taken. There isn't much. It won't take you far. She opened the cash drawer, pulled out money with both hands, anything to get him out, anything to get him away. That lying whore back in Hartsville will burn in hell. He kept his hand on her hair as he stuffed the money in his pocket. And so will you. You'll already be there. She didn't know why she did it. She couldn't foresee future events. She couldn't predict. That was one small blessing. But she focused her eyes on his and spoke as if ripe with visions. You won't live out the year, and you'll die in pain and fear and fire. You'll die screaming for mercy, the mercy you never gave me. He went white and shoved her away from him so that her back hit the wall and supplies tumbled. He lifted an arm, pointing. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. You remember that. You tell anyone you saw me here today, I'll come back for you and do what should have been done the minute you were born, born with a cowl over your face. Devil's mark, you're already damned. He shoved out the door, ducked his head, and hurried away. Tori simply slid down to the floor. Already damned. She stared blankly at the scissors teetering on the edge of the under counter. She'd nearly had them in her hand, very nearly. One of them would have been in hell if she'd firmed her grip on them. She wasn't sure she would have cared which one of them. At least it would have been over. She brought her knees up, pressed her face into them, and curled into a ball as she'd done so often as a child. That's how Faith found her when she came in with a wriggling puppy under her arm. Jesus, Tori! With one glance, she took in the open and empty register, the scatter of supplies, and the woman trembling on the floor. God, are you hurt? She set the puppy down and, as it scampered joyfully away, rushed behind the counter. Let's have a look. Let me have a look at you. I'm all right. It's nothing. Getting robbed in broad daylight in this town is something. You're shaking all over. Did they have a gun, a knife? No. No, it's okay. 
I don't see any blood. Well, ouch, you're a little raw back here on the neck. I'll call the police. You want a doctor? No, no police, no doctor. No police? I just saw some big brute of a man skulking out of here. Walk in and see your cash register open, empty, and you sprawl behind the counter and you don't want the police? What do they do in the big city when they get robbed? Make cupcakes? I wasn't robbed. Exhausted, she let her head fall back and rest against the wall. I gave him the money. Under a hundred dollars. The money doesn't matter. Then you want to give me some while you're at it? Because if that's how you plan to run your business, you won't be here very long. I'm going to be here. I'm going to stay here. Nothing's going to make me run away again. Nothing. No one. Not ever again. Faith didn't have much experience with hysteria unless it was her own, but she thought she recognized it in the rise of Tori's voice, the sudden wildness in her eyes. That's the spirit. Why don't we just get up off the floor here? Go on in the back a minute. I said I'm all right. Then you're stupid or a liar. Either way, let's go. Tori tried to push her away, tried to stand on her own, but her legs wouldn't manage it. They buckled as Faith pulled her up and left her no choice but to lean. We'll just go on back. I'm going to leave the puppy out here. The what? Don't you worry about him. He's about half housebroken. You got anything back here to drink that's got a bite to it? No. That figures. Tidy Tori wouldn't have herself a bottle of Jim Beam in the drawer. Now sit down, catch your breath, then tell me why I'm not calling the police. It would just make it worse. Because? Because it was my father you saw leaving the store. I gave the money to him so he'd go away. He put that mark on you. When Tori simply stared, Faith drew a deep breath in and out. Guess it's not the first time. Oh, Hope didn't tell me. I imagine you swore her to secrecy, but I had eyes. I saw you with bruises and welts plenty of times. Always had a story about falling down or running into something, but the funny thing was I never noticed you being clumsy. As I recall, you had a number of those welts and bruises the morning you came to tell us about Hope. Faith walked over to the mini-fridge, found a bottle of water, opened it. Is that why you didn't meet her that night, because he'd walloped you? She held out the water, gauging Tori's silence. I guess I've been focusing my blame on what happened back then on the wrong person. Tori took the water, soothed her throat. The person to blame is the one who killed her. We don't know who that is. It's more of a comfort to put blame on a face and a name. You can pick up that phone, call the police, and bring charges. Chief Russell, go after him. I just want him gone. I don't expect you to understand. People never do, but surprise... Considering Tory Faith eased a hip onto the desk. My papa rarely raised a hand to me. I think I got a swat on the butt from time to time and shamed the devil less often than I deserved it. But he sure knew how to shout and how to strike terror in a young girl's heart. Oh, God, she missed him. It catapulted into her, the longing for her father. Not because I thought he'd take a strap to me, she said quietly now, but because he let me know every time I let him down. I was afraid to let him down. That's not the same thing as this, I know it, but I'm asking myself if he'd been a different kind of father, a different kind of man, and I spent my life being afraid, what would I do? You'd call the police and have him thrown in jail. Damn right, but that doesn't mean I don't understand why you aren't. When Papa was cheating with that woman, I never told my mother. For a while I actually believed she didn't know, but I didn't tell her. I thought maybe it would all go away. I was wrong, but thinking it gave me some peace of mind. Steadier, Tori set the bottle of water on the desk. Why are you being nice to me? I have no idea. Never did like you much, but that was mostly because Hope did, and I was contrary. Right now you're sleeping with my brother, and it occurs to me that he means more to me than I realized. It makes sense to get to know you so I can see how I feel about all that. So you're being nice to me because I'm having sex with Cade. The dry way it was phrased tickled Faith's humor. In a roundabout way, and I'll tell you this because it'll piss you off. I feel sorry for you. You're right. Tori got to her feet, grateful the trembling had stopped. It pisses me off. Figured, you don't like sympathy, but the fact is no one should be afraid of her own father, and no man has the right blood kin or not to leave bruises and scars on a child. Now I better go see what kind of trouble that puppy's gotten herself into out there. Puppy? Tori's eyes went wide. What puppy? My puppy. Haven't named her yet. Faith strolled out and let out a hoot of laughter. Isn't that the cutest thing? She's such a little darling. The little darling had found the tissue paper and was currently waging a war on it. Casualties were many and scattered like snow over the floor. 
She'd managed to find a roll of ribbon as well, and most of that was wound around her chubby torso. Oh, for God's sake. Don't take on so. Can't be more than five dollars worth of supplies. I'll pay for them. There's my baby. The pup barked joyfully, tripped over a tail of ribbon, and sprawled adoringly at Faith's feet. I swear I never thought a little bit of a thing like this could make me laugh so much. Look at you, Mama's baby doll, all wrapped up like Christmas. She lifted the puppy high and made cooing noises. You're acting like an idiot. I know, but isn't she sweet? She just loves me to death, too. Mama's got to clean up this mess now for the mean lady scolds my baby. Already on her hands and knees, Tori looked up. You set that shop wrecker down in here again, I'll bite your ankle. I've been teaching her to sit. She's smart as a new hat. Just watch. Despite the threat, Faith set the puppy down, kept one hand on its rump. Sit. Be a good girl now. Sit for Mama. The puppy leaped forward, slapped its tongue against Tori's face, then chased its own tail. Some new hat. Isn't she precious? Downright adorable, but she doesn't belong in here. Gathering up the bulk of the ruined supplies, Tori rose. Go take her for a walk or whatever. We were going to buy a nice pretty set of bowls for her food and water. Not my bowls. You are not buying handcrafted pottery bowls designed by artisans for puppy chow. What do you care what I use it for as long as I pay the price? Only more determined, Faith marched over, scooped up the pup, and picked out two matching bowls of royal blue with bold emerald swirls. We like these, don't we, darling? Don't we, sweetums? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. A sale's a sale, isn't it? Faith crossed to the counter, set the bowls down. Ring me up and don't forget to add the cost of the supplies. Forget the supplies. Behind the counter, Tori dumped the tissue in the wastebasket, then dealt with the transaction. That's $53.26 for puppy bowls. Fine, I'll pay cash. Here, hold her a minute. Faith pushed the pup at Tori so she could dig into her purse. Charmed despite herself, Tori gave the puppy a nuzzle. You're going to be eating like a queen, aren't you? A regular queen bee. Queen bee? Why, that's just perfect. Faith laid the money on the counter and snatched the puppy back. That's who you are, queen bee. I'm going to get you a fancy collar that sparkles. Tori shook her head as she made change. I'm seeing a whole new side of you, Faith. So am I. I kind of like it. Come on, B. We got places to go and people to see. She gathered up the shopping bag. I don't think I can get the door. I'll get it. Tori opened it and after a minute's hesitation touched Faith's arm. Faith, thank you. You're welcome. Your makeup could use a little freshening, she added, and left. She didn't intend to get involved. The way Faith looked at it, other people's personal lives were fascinating to speculate about, to gossip about, but all from a safe and smug distance. But she kept seeing the way Tori had looked, curled up behind the counter, with ribbon and tape and silver cords scattered around her. She kept seeing that ugly red mark on Tori's neck. There'd been marks on Hope. She hadn't seen them. No one had let her see them, but she'd known. She didn't hold with a man pushing a woman around. That's all there was to it. When it was Ken, you didn't run to the police, but there were other ways to make things right. She bent to kiss B's head, then walked straight to the bank to tell J.R. what had happened to his niece. He didn't waste time. J.R. canceled his next appointment, told his assistant manager he had to leave on personal business, and set out for Tory's shop at such a brisk pace his shirt was damp with sweat by the time he got there. She had customers, a young couple who were debating over a blue and white serving platter. Tori was giving them room, staying on the other side of the shop, replacing the candle stand she'd sold that morning. Uncle Jimmy, is it heating up out there? You're flushed. Can I get you something cold? No. Yes, he decided. It would give him time to compose himself. Whatever you've got handy, honey. I'll just be a minute. She went into the back, then leaned on the door and cursed. She'd seen it in his eyes. Faith must have made a beeline to the bank. So much for trust, Tori thought, wrenching open the refrigerator. So much for understanding. Then drawing a cleansing breath, she carried the can of ginger ale out to her uncle. Thanks, honey. He took a good long swig. Um, why don't I buy you lunch? It's not even noon, and I brought something from home. I don't want to close the shop in the middle of the day, but thanks. Gran and Cecil get off all right this morning? First thing. Boots tried to talk him into stay in a few days, but you know your grand. She likes to be in her own, always itchy when she's away from home. The young couple started out with the woman glancing back wistfully. We'll come back. I hope you do. Enjoy your day. All right now, let me see. The door had hardly closed when J.R. set down the ginger ale and took Tori's shoulders. He studied the raw skin on the side of her neck. Oh, sweetie, that bastard, why didn't you call me? 
because there was nothing you could do, because it was over, and because there wasn't a point in worrying you, which is all Faith's done by running down and telling you. Now you stop that. She did exactly what was right, and I'm beholden to her for it. You didn't want to call the police, and maybe, well, maybe it's easier on your mother if we don't, but I'm family. I know. She let him draw her into a hug. He's gone now. All he wanted was money. He's scared, running scared. They'll catch him before long. I just want it to be away from here and away from me. I can't help it. Of course you can't. I want a promise from you. Gently, J.R. held her out at arm's length. If you see him around again, even if he doesn't try to get near you, I want you to promise you'll tell me right off. All right, but don't worry. He got what he came for. He's miles away by now. She needed to believe it. 19. She believed it for the rest of the day. She covered herself with the thin, battle-scarred armor of that belief through the long afternoon. And though she knew it was foolish, she opened one of the candles wrapped and ribboned on display and set it on the counter. She hoped the light and scent of it would help dispel some of the ugly film her father's visit had smeared on the air. At six, she locked up, then caught herself scanning the street as she had done for weeks when she'd escaped to New York. It angered her that he could put that cautious anxiety back in her step, that jolt back in her heart. Had she really stood in the ruin of her mother's house and claimed she could and would face down her father and all that fear if he dared slither into her life again, where was her courage now? All she could do was promise herself she would find it again. But she locked the car doors the minute she was inside, and her pulse jittered as she constantly shifted her glance from the road ahead to the rearview mirror on the drive home. She passed cars, even stirred herself to wave at Piney as his pickup rumbled by with a quick toot of the horn. Field work would be done for the day, she thought. Hands would be heading home, and so would the boss. So it was with an irritating bump of disappointment that she turned into her lane and found it empty. She hadn't realized she'd been expecting Cade to be there, anticipating it. True, she hadn't greeted his statement that he was basically moving in with any real enthusiasm, but the more she thought of it, the easier it had been to accept, and once accepted, enjoyed. It had been a very long time since she'd wanted companionship, someone to share the day with, to talk over inconsequential things with, to find little things to laugh over, complain about to have someone there when the night seemed too full of sound and movement and memories. And what was she giving back? Resistance, arguments, irritable and unstated agreement. Just general bitchiness, she murmured as she climbed out of the car. That, at least, she could stop. She could do what women traditionally did to make up for petty crimes. She could fix him a nice dinner and seduce him. The idea lifted her mood. Wouldn't he be surprised when she made the moves for a change? She hoped she remembered how, because it was about time she took back a little control. By doing so, she'd take some of the responsibility for whatever was going on between them off his shoulders. She'd tried to please Jack that way, and then, no. She pushed that train of thought firmly away as she unlocked her front door. Cade wasn't Jack, and she wasn't the same woman she'd been in New York. Past and present didn't have to connect. When she entered, she knew that was just one more delusion. She knew he'd been there, inside what she'd tried to make her own home, her father. There'd been little for him to destroy, and she didn't think he'd put much effort into it. He hadn't come in to break her few pieces of furniture or punch holes in the walls, though he'd done some of both. Her chair was overturned, and he'd taken something sharp to the underside. The lamp she'd bought only days before was shattered. The table she'd hoped to refinish tossed into the corner with one of its legs snapped like a twig. She recognized the size and shape of the dents in the wallboard. It was his signature mark, left when, for whatever reason, he chose to use fists on inanimate objects instead of his daughter. She left the door open, an escape route in case her instincts were off and he was still in the house. But the bedroom was empty. He'd yanked off the bedclothes, ripped at the mattress. She supposed the iron bed frame had been more trouble to him than it was worth, as he'd left it be. The drawers of her dresser were pulled out, her clothes heaped in piles. No, he hadn't really wanted to destroy her things, she mused, or he'd have taken that sharp tool to her clothing as well. He'd done that before to teach her a lesson about dressing appropriately. He'd been looking for more money, or for things he could easily sell for cash. If he'd been drinking, it would have been worse. If he'd been drinking, he'd have waited for her. As it was... She bent down to pick up a rumpled blouse, then let out a cry of despair when she saw the small carved wooden box she used to hold her jewelry. 
She pounced on it, sinking down when she found it empty. Most of what she'd owned had been trinkets, really. Good trinkets, carefully selected, but easily replaced. But among them had been the garnet and gold earrings her grandmother had given her when she'd turned 21. Earrings that had been her own great-grandmother's. Her only heirloom. Priceless. Irreplaceable. Lost. Tori! The alarm in Kate's voice, the rush of footsteps, brought her quickly to her feet. I'm all right. I'm in here. He burst into the room, had her pinned against him before she could say another word. Tangled waves of fear and release pumped from him over and into her. I'm all right, she repeated. I just got here. Minutes ago. He was already gone. I saw your car, the living room. I thought... He tightened his grip, pressed his face into her hair. Just hold on a second. He knew what it was to have terror dig slick claws into his throat. He'd never thought he'd feel it again. Thank God you're all right. I meant to be here before you, but I got hung up. We'll call the police, then you're coming to Beau Rev. I should have taken you there this morning. Cade, there's no point in all that. It was my father. She drew away, set the box down on the dresser. He came to the shop this morning. We had words. This is just his way of letting me know he can still punish me. Did he hurt you? No. The denial was quick and automatic, but his gaze had already landed on the side of her neck. He said nothing. He didn't have to. His eyes went dark, narrowed into slits. As violent, she knew how to recognize violence, swam into them. Then he turned away and found the phone. Cade, wait, please. I don't want to call the police. His head snapped up and that same narrowed rage snapped out at her. You don't always get what you want. Sherry Bellows celebrated her potential job by opening a bottle of wine, turning up her Cheryl Crow CD as loud as her neighbors would tolerate, and dancing around her apartment. Everything was working out perfectly. She loved progress. It was exactly the sort of small, close-knit town she wanted to be a part of. The stars, she thought, had been well aligned when she'd followed instinct and applied for the position at Progress High. She liked the other teachers. Though Sherry didn't know all her associates very well as yet, that would all change in the fall when she started full-time. She was going to be a wonderful teacher, someone her students could come to with their problems and their questions. Her classes were going to be fun, and she'd inspire her students to read, to enjoy, to seek out books for pleasure, planting the seeds for a lifelong love affair with literature. Oh, she'd make them work and work hard, but she had so many ideas, so many fresh and wonderful notions on how to make the work interesting, even entertaining. Years from now, when her students looked back, they'd remember her fondly. Miss Bellows, they'd say. She made a difference in my life. It was all she'd ever wanted. Wanted it enough, she thought now, to study like a demon, to work long and hard to subsidize her scholarship. It had been worth every penny. She had the bills to prove it. But that was only money, and she'd found a way to deal with that. Working at Southern Comfort was going to be a delight. It would help ease the burden of those student loans, give her a little financial breathing room. But more, it would provide her with one more access to the community. She'd meet people, make friends, and before long she'd be a familiar face in progress. She was already widening her circle. Her neighbors in the building, Maxine at the vet's. And she planned to cement that connection by giving a party, a kind of potluck get-together sometime in June. A summer kickoff, she mused, that wouldn't conflict with anyone's plans. She'd invite Tori, too, of course, and Dr. Hunk, the dreamily dimpled vet. She'd definitely like to get to know him better, she decided, as she poured a second glass of wine. She'd ask the Moonies. Mr. Mooney at the bank had been so helpful when she'd set up her new accounts. Then there was Lissy at the Realtors. A tongue-wagger, Sherry admitted, but it was always good to have the town gossip in your camp. You found out such interesting things, and she was married to the mayor. Another looker, Sherry remembered with a great smile and a superior butt. A bit of a flirt, too. It was a good thing she'd found out he was married. She wondered if it would be presumptuous to invite the Lavelles. They were, after all, the VIPs of progress. Still, Kincaid Lavelle had been very nice, very friendly whenever they'd bumped into each other around town. And talk about gorgeous. She could make the invitation very casual. It couldn't do any harm. She wanted lots and lots of people. She'd keep the patio doors open as she always did, let guests spill outside. She loved her pretty little garden apartment, and she could buy another lounge chair to sit outside. The one she had looked lonely out there, and she didn't intend to be lonely. One day she'd meet the right man, and they'd fall in love over warm nights and marry in the spring, start a life together. She just wasn't meant to stay single. She wanted a family. 
Not that she'd give up teaching, of course. A teacher was what she was, but there was no reason she couldn't be a wife and mother, too. She wanted it all, and the sooner the better. Humming to the music, she stepped out onto the patio where Mongo was dozing. He stirred enough to thump his tail and rolled over in case she wanted to scratch his belly. Obliging, she crouched down, giving him a good rub as she sipped and glanced idly around. Her patio opened up to a nice grassy area that was bordered by the trees of the park on one side and a quiet residential avenue on the other. She'd chosen the apartment first because they allowed pets, and where she went, Mongo went. As a bonus, it was convenient for their morning runs in the park. The apartment was small, but she didn't need much room as long as Mongo had a place to exercise, and in a town like Progress, housing didn't cost an arm and two legs as it did in Charleston or Columbia. This is the right place for us, Mongo. This is home for us. Straightening, she wandered back inside into the small galley kitchen as she sang along with Cheryl about her favorite mistake. She'd continue her celebration by fixing herself a huge salad for dinner. Life, she thought as she chopped and diced, was good. Twilight was edging closer by the time she finished. Made too much again, she thought. That was one of the problems with living alone. Still, Mongo liked his carrots and celery, too, so she'd add them to his evening meal. They'd have it on the patio, and she'd treat herself to one more glass of wine, get a little tipsy. Then they'd take a nice long walk, she decided, as she squatted down to scoop Mongo's kibble out of the plastic bin, maybe get some ice cream. She lifted the bowl. A movement at the corner of her eye had her heart wheeling into her throat. The bowl flew out of her hands, and she managed one short scream. Then a hand clamped over her mouth. The knife she'd used to make her dinner pricked at her throat. Be quiet. Be very, very quiet, and I won't cut you. Understand? Her eyes were already circling wildly. Wings of fear beat in her belly, had her skin going hot and damp. But confusion rode over it. She couldn't see his face, but thought she recognized the voice. It made no sense, no sense at all. His hand slid slowly away from her mouth to grip her chin. Don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. Now, why would I do that? Her hair smelled sweet, a whore's blonde hair. Let's just go in the bedroom where we can be comfortable. Don't, she gasped as the edge of the knife teased along her throat, tipped up her chin. The scream was inside her, desperate to burst out, but the knife turned it into silent tears as he pushed her out of the kitchen. Her patio doors were closed now, the blinds shut. Mongo, what did you do with Mongo? You don't think I'd hurt a nice, friendly dog like that, do you? The power of the moment cruised through him, spread, made him hard and hot and invincible. He's just taking a quiet nap. Don't you worry about your dog, honey. Don't you worry about a thing. This is going to be good. This is going to be just what you want. He shoved her belly down on the bed, put his knee in the small of her back, and added weight. He'd brought precautions. A man had to be prepared even for a whore, especially for a whore. After a while, they screamed no matter what, and he didn't want to use the knife, not when he was so good with his hands. He took the bandana from his pocket, gagged her. When she began to stir, when she began to struggle, he was in heaven. She wasn't weak. She kept the body she liked to flaunt and tease men with in good shape. It only excited him to have her struggle. The first time he hit her, the thrill of it slammed into him like sex. He hit her again so they both understood who was in charge. He tied her hands behind her back. He couldn't afford those nails with their sluttish pink polish scraping any of his skin. Quietly, he walked over to shut the curtain and close them into the dark. She was moaning against the gag, dazed from the blows. The sound of it made him tremble so that he nicked her skin a little as he used the knife to cut her clothes away. She tried to roll, tried to buck, but when he put the point of the blade just under her eye, pressed, she went very still. This is what you want. He unzipped, then flipped her onto her back and straddled her. It's what you asked for, what you all ask for. When it was done, he wept. Tears of self-pity ran down his face. She wasn't the one, but what else could he do? She'd put herself in his path. She'd given him no choice. It wasn't perfect. He'd done everything he wanted, and still, it wasn't perfect. Her eyes were glazed and empty as he took off the gag, kissed her cheeks, he cut the cord from her wrist, stuffed it back in his pockets. He turned her music off and left the way he'd come in. I can't come to Beau Rev. Tori sat on the front porch in the soft night air. 
She couldn't face going back inside quite yet, wasn't yet prepared to deal with the mess left by her father and compounded by the police. Cade contemplated the cigar he'd lighted to ease his own nerves, wished fleetingly he had a whiskey to go with it. You're going to have to tell me why. Staying here the way things are doesn't make any sense, and you're a sensible woman. Most of the time, she agreed, being sensible cuts down on complications and saves energy. You were right about calling the police. I realize that now. I wasn't being sensible. It was pure, raw emotion. He frightens me and embarrasses me. By trying to keep it contained, as always, I thought I'd limit the fear and humiliation. It's hateful to be a victim, Cade. Makes you feel exposed and angry and somehow guilty at the same time. I won't argue with that, even though you're smart enough to know that guilt has no part in what you should be feeling. Smart enough to know it, but not clever enough to figure out how not to feel it. It'll be easier once I put the house back to rights and get rid of what he left behind in it. But I'll still remember the way Chief Russ sat writing in his little book and watching my face, how my father intimidated me today, how he's done so all my life. There's no cause for your pride to be wounded over this, Tory. Pride goeth before a fall. My father reminded me of that this morning. He does love to use the Bible to hammer his point home. They'll find him. There are police in two counties looking for him now. The world's a lot bigger than two counties. Hell, South Carolina's a lot bigger than two counties. Swamps and mountains and glades, lots and lots of places to hide. She rocked restlessly, needing movement. If he finds a way to contact my mother, she'll help him, out of love and out of duty. That being the case, it just makes my point about you coming with me to Beau Rev. I can't do that. Why? A number of reasons. First, your mother would object. My mother has nothing to say about it. Oh, don't say that, Cade. She pushed out of her chair, walked to the end of the porch. Was he out there, she wondered, watching, waiting? You don't mean it, or you shouldn't. That's her home, and she has a right in saying who comes into it. Why should she object, especially after I explain it to her? Explain what? She turned back. That you're installing your lover in her house because your lover's daddy is a crazy man? He drew on his cigar, took his time about it. I wouldn't choose those particular words, but more or less. And I'm sure she'll greet me with fresh flowers and a box of fine chocolates. Oh, don't be such a man about this, she said with a wave of her hand before he could speak. Whatever it says on the damn deed, Cade, the house belongs to the woman in it, and I will not intrude on your mother's home. She's a difficult woman at times, most of the time, he admitted, but she isn't heartless. No, and her heart will not accept the woman she holds responsible for a beloved daughter's death. Don't argue with me about that. Tori's voice shook, nearly broke. It hurts me. All right. He tossed the cigar aside with one violent gesture, but his hands were gentle enough as he laid them on Tori's shoulders. If you won't or can't come with me, then I'll take you to your uncle's. And there we come to the second part of the problem. She lifted her hands to his. Irrational, bullheaded, illogical. I'll admit all that now so you don't have to feel obliged to point it out to me. I have to make a stand here, Cade. This isn't a strategic hill on a battlefield. For me, it's very much like that. <laughs> I never thought about it quite that way, she said with a quiet laugh. But yes, this is very much my hill on my own personal battlefield. I've retreated so often. You once called me a coward to get my dander up, but the fact is I've been one most of my life. I've had small spurts of courage, and that makes it only worse when I see myself fall back yet again. I can't do it this time. How does staying here make you brave instead of stupid? Not brave, and yes, maybe stupid, but whole. I want so much to be whole again. I think I'd risk anything not to have this empty place in me. I can't let him run me out. She gazed toward the marsh that grew thicker, deeper, greener with encroaching summer. Mosquitoes whined in there, breeding in the dark water. Alligators slid through it, silent death. It was a place where snakes could slither and bogs could suck the shoe right off your foot. And it was a place, she thought, that went bright and beautiful with the twinkling of fireflies, where wildflowers thrived in the shade and the stingy light, where an eagle could soar like a king. There was no beauty without risk, no life without it. When I was a child, I lived scared in this house. It was a way of life, she said. And you got used to it the way you get used to certain smells, I suppose. 
When I came back, I made it mine, shaking out all those bad memories like dust from a rug, airing out that smell, Cade. Now he's tried to bring the fear back. I can't let him. I won't let him, she added, shifting until her eyes met his again. That's what I did this morning. Don't tell anyone. Keep it quiet. One more dirty little secret. If you hadn't pushed me, that's what I'd have done here, too. I'm staying. I'm cleaning him out of this place and staying. I hope he knows it. I wish I didn't admire you for it. He ran a hand down the sleek tail of her hair. Make it easier to bully you into doing things my way. You don't have much bully in you. Maybe it was relief. Maybe it was something else that made her stroke her hand over his cheek. You maneuver, you don't push. Well, it speaks well for the future of our relationship that you've figured that out and can live with it. He drew her in, laid his lips on the top of her head. You matter to me. No, don't go stiff on me. I'll just have to maneuver you. You matter, Tori, more than I'd planned for you to matter. When she remained silent, he let frustration lead. Sometimes it was the most honest way. Give me something back, damn it. He jerked her back, then up, crushing his mouth to hers. She tasted the demand, the heat, the little licks of rage he'd concealed so well, and it was that shot of pure, unfiltered emotion from him that turned another bolt inside her. God, she didn't want to be loved or needed, didn't want to have those same feelings stirred to life again inside her, but he was here and just by being made her feel again. I've already given you more than I thought I had. I, I don't know how much more there is. She held on to him, burrowed into him. There's so much happening inside me, I can't keep up with it. It all circles back to you. Isn't that enough? Yeah. He eased her back to kiss her again, softly this time. Yeah, that's enough for now, as long as you make room for more. He skimmed his thumbs over her cheeks. Had a hell of a day, haven't you? I can't say it's been one of my best so far. Let's finish it right, then. We'll get started. On what? He opened the screen door. You wanted to clean him out. Let's do it. They worked together for two hours. He turned on music. She wouldn't have thought of it, would have stayed focused on the details, kept her mind channeled down those strict lines. But the music drifted through the house into her head, just distracting enough to keep her from brooding. She wanted to burn the clothes he'd touched, could visualize carrying them outside, heaping them up, striking a match, but she couldn't afford the indulgence. Instead, she washed, folded, put away. They turned the damaged mattress over. It would have to be replaced, but it would do for now, and with fresh linens you hardly noticed. He talked about his work in a way that had his voice drifting pleasantly through her mind, like the music. They dealt with the wreckage of the kitchen, ate sandwiches, and she told him that she was considering hiring on help. It's a good idea. He helped himself to a beer, quietly pleased that she'd stocked some for him. You'll enjoy your business more if it doesn't strangle all your time. Sherry Bellows, that's the new high school teacher, isn't it? I met her and her dog a few weeks ago out at the Mini Mart. Seems like a bundle of energy. That was my impression, in a very attractive package. He grinned and sipped his beer when Tori merely lifted her brows. Just thinking of you, darling, an attractive clerk's a business asset. You think she'll wear those little shorts? No, Tori said firmly, I don't. Bound to draw a lot of male customers if you let that be her uniform. That's a girl with very nice pins. Pins, hmm. Well, she and her pins depend on how her references check out, but I imagine they will. Tori swept up the last of the debris, dumped it in the trash. That seems to be the best that can be done. Feel better? Yes. She crossed the room to put away the broom and dustpan, considerably, and I'm very grateful for the help. I'm always open to gratitude. She took the pitcher from the refrigerator, poured herself a glass of iced tea. The bedroom closet's not very big, but I made some room, and there's an empty drawer in the dresser. He said nothing, only drank his beer, waited. You wanted to be able to have some of your things here, didn't you? That's right. So? So? We're not living together, she set down her glass. I've never lived with anyone, and that's not what this is. All right, but if you're going to be spending so much time here, you might as well have a place for some of your things. Very practical. Oh, go to hell. But there wasn't any heat in the response. You're not supposed to smile when you say that. He set his beer aside, then slid his arms around her. What do you think you're doing? Dancing. I never took you dancing. It's something people who aren't really living together ought to do now and then. 
It was an old shuffling number with a boy asking a girl to stand by him when the land was dark. Are you trying to be charming? I don't have to try. It's just part of my makeup. He dipped her, made her laugh. Very smooth. All those miserable hours of cotillion had to pay off. Poor little rich boy. She rested her head on his shoulder and let herself enjoy the dance, the feel of him against her, the scent of him. Thanks. You're welcome. When I was driving home tonight, I was thinking of you. I like the sound of that. And I was thinking, so far he's made all the moves. I let him because I wasn't sure if I really wanted to make any of my own or counter any of his. It was sort of easy to be maneuvered, I suppose. And I was thinking, I just wonder how Kincaid Lavelle would react if I got home and I fixed us a nice supper. He'd have appreciated that. Yes, well, some other time. That part of the thought process didn't pan out. But there was the second part, which was... She lifted her head from his shoulder, met his eyes. How would Kincaid Lavelle react if, after that, once we were all relaxed and quiet, just what would he do if I set out to seduce him? Well, was all he could manage as she pressed closer, ran her hands intimately down his hips. The stirring in his blood was a not-so-quiet delight. I think the least I can do as a gentleman is let you find out. This time it was she who unfastened buttons, his shirt, then her own. She laid her lips over his heart on the warm skin and vibrant beat. I've had your taste with me since the first time you kissed me. While her lips played over him, she eased the shirt away. I can bring tastes back, and I've done that with yours so many times already. She trailed her hands over his chest, his belly, a quiver, up to his shoulders, such broad, tough shoulders. I like the feel of you, long, hard muscles that excites me, and your hands roughened from work, riding over me. She peeled her shirt open and let it fall to the floor to join his. Watching him, she unhooked her bra, let it slide away. Touch me now. He cupped her breasts in his hands, the warm, soft weight of them, skimmed the nipples with the edges of his thumbs. Yes, like that. Her head fell back as heat balled in her belly. Exactly like that. My insides go liquid when you touch me. Can you see it? Her eyes, long and dark, met his. I want... tell me. She moistened her lips, reached for the button of his jeans. His hands flexed on her one hard caress. I want to feel what you feel. I want what's inside you, inside me. I've never tried that with anyone else, never wanted to. Will you let me? He bent his head, rubbed his lips over hers. Take what you want. It was a risk. She would be open, gaping, so much more defenseless than he. But she wanted it, all of it, and that exquisite bond of trust. Once more she lay her lips on him and opened mind, heart, body. It was a bolt, a lightning strike, the power of those coupled needs, images. His desire layered and tangled inside her with her own. It slashed through her, dark, bright, swollen with energy. Her head snapped back from the punch of it, and she came in one long, erotic gush. God! God! Wait! No, he'd never experienced anything like it. The twisted bonds of unity only knotted tighter in a bold and beautiful mass of arousal. More! He set his teeth on her shoulder, craving flesh. Again! Now! She couldn't stop it. It lashed through her like a storm, full of fury and brilliance. It was she who dragged him to the floor, she who panted out pleas, demands, threats as they tore at clothes. She clawed at him, nipped as they rolled over on the floor. His pulse was inside her, a savage beat that crashed against her own. The taste of him, the taste of herself, brewed together to saturate her. When he plunged into her, she felt the urgent pumping of his blood, the desperate maze of his thoughts. Lost. She cried out, once, twice. They were both lost. She heard her name, his voice calling it inside her mind seconds before it burst from his lips. When he came inside her, dragged her with him, the glory of it made her weep. 20. Wade had his hands full, what was left of them after the ornery tabby, badly misnamed Fluffy, mangled them during her shots. Maxine was deep into finals, and he'd given her the day off, which meant he had only two hands to pit against four claws and a number of very sharp teeth. He'd concluded an hour before that he'd made a mistake of horrendous proportions by springing Maxine. 
He'd started the day with an emergency that required a house call and put him solidly behind. Add the minor war in the waiting area set off by a personality clash between a setter and a Bichon, the Olsen's baby goat who'd managed to eat the best part of Malibu Barbie until her arm became lodged in his throat, and Fluffy's vile temper, and he'd had a pisser of a morning. He was cursing, sweating, bleeding when Faith rushed in through the back. Wait, honey, can you take a look at B for me? I think she's feeling poorly. Take a number. It'll only take a minute. I haven't got a minute. Oh, now, goodness, what happened to your hands? Faith watched as Wade narrowly avoided another swipe and tucked the cat firmly under his arm. Did that mean old pussycat scratch you, darling? Kiss my ass, was his best response. Did she get you there, too? Faith called out as he marched into the waiting area. It's all right, baby, she nuzzled the puppy. Daddy's going to take good care of you in just a minute. He came back in to scrub up and dug out antiseptic. She's been whimpering and sort of moaning all morning, and her nose is a little warm. She doesn't want to play, just lies there, see? Faith set B down, and the pup squatted by Wade's feet, looked up at him pitifully, then proceeded to throw up on his shoes. Oh, oh, for goodness sake, must have been something she ate. Lila said I shouldn't give her all those cookies. Faith bit her lip but couldn't quite hold in the giggle. Wade simply stood staring at her, antiseptic in one hand, a thin trickle of blood on the other, and puppy vomit on his shoes. We're awfully sorry. B, don't you eat that. That's just nasty. She scooped up the puppy. I bet you feel so much better now, don't you, sweetheart? There, see that, Wade? She's wagging her tail again. I just knew if I brought her in to you, everything would be fine. Is that how it looks to you, like everything's fine? Well, B sicked up what was worrying her, and I don't imagine it's the first time you had a little doggy puke on you. I've got a waiting room full of patients, my hands are scratched to shit, and now my shoes are going to stink for the rest of the day. Well, go on up and change them then. She stepped back when he made one of his hands into a claw. She loved the light that came into his eyes when his dander was up. Now wait. He bunched the claw into a fist, then punched it lightly between his own eyes. I'm going to go ditch these shoes, and when I come back, I want you to clean this up. Clean it up? Myself? That's right. Put your dog back in surgery, get a mop and bucket, and deal with it. I don't have time for this. He reached down, pulled off the ruined shoes at the heels, and make it fast. I'm behind schedule. Daddy's a little cross this morning, she murmured to be as Wade strode out to the garbage. She looked at the floor and grimaced. Well, at least you got the best part of it on his shoes. It's not so bad. When he came back, she was dutifully, if inexpertly, mopping. There were suds gliding across the linoleum on little waves of water. It almost seemed to him they had a current, but he didn't have the heart to complain. Almost done here. Bee's in the back playing with her squeaky bone. She's bright-eyed and frisky again. Faith dumped the mop in the bucket, sloshed more water. I guess this needs to dry off some. As an alternative to screaming, he rubbed his hands over his face and laughed. Faith, you are unique. Of course I am. She stepped back as he picked up the bucket, emptied it, rinsed off the mop, then began to slop up suds and water. Oh, well, I suppose that works, too. Do me a favor. Go on out there and tell Miss Jenkins to bring Mitch on back. That's the beagle who's been howling the last half hour. And if you can find a way to maintain some sort of order out there for the next 20 minutes, I'll buy you a fancy dinner at your choice of restaurants. Champagne? A magnum. Let's just see what I can do. He got his 20 minutes barely when he heard the urgent cry, Wade, Wade, come quick! He bolted out, saw Piney Cobb staggering under the weight of Mongo. Ran out into the road right in front of me. God almighty, he's bleeding pretty bad. Bring him in the back. He moved fast. The dog's breathing was labored, his pupils fixed and dilated. His thick fur was matted with blood, and more was dripping on the floor. Here on the table. I hit the brakes, Piney muttered and stood back. Swerved, but I clipped him anyway. I was heading into the hardware for some parts, and he come barreling out of the park right into the street. Do you know if you ran over him? Don't think I did. With trembling hands, he pulled out a faded red bandana and wiped his sweaty face. Knocked him's what I think, but it happened fast. Okay, Wade grabbed toweling, and since Faith was standing beside him, he simply took her hands, pushed them onto the cloth. Press down, hard. I want that bleeding under control. He's in shock. He yanked open the drug cabinet, grabbed a bottle to prepare a hypo. You just hang in there, boy. Just hang on, he murmured as the dog began to stir and whimper. Keep the pressure firm, he ordered Faith. I'm giving him a sedative. I need to check for internal injuries. Her hands had shaken when he'd pressed them to the wound. She thought she'd seen straight down to the bone and the gash gaping down the dog's back leg, and her stomach had flipped over. 
She wanted to snatch her hands away from all that blood to rush out of the room. Why couldn't Piney do it? Why couldn't someone else be here? She started to say so, the words jumping into her throat. She could smell the blood, the antiseptic, and the sour stench of Piney's panic sweat. But her gaze landed on Wade's face. Cool, composed, strong. His eyes were flat with concentration, his mouth firmed into one determined line. She stared at him, breathing through her teeth. Watching him work, the quick efficiency of it, the focus, calmed her even as the dog went still again beneath her hands. No broken ribs. I don't think the wheel went over him. Might have a bruised kidney. We'll deal with that later. Head wound's pretty superficial. No blood in the ears. The leg's the worst of it. And that, he thought, was bad enough. Saving it and the dog was going to be tricky. I need to move him into surgery. He glanced back, saw that Piney had dropped into the chair and had his head on his knees. I need your hands, Faith. I'm going to lift and carry him. You have to stay with me. Keep the pressure firm. He's lost too much blood. Ready? Oh, but wait, I... Let's go. She did what she was told because he left her no choice. She jogged beside him, fumbling for the door with her free hand. B sent up a joyful bark and ran between her feet. Sit, Wade said so sharply, B's butt plopped obediently to the floor. The minute he'd laid the sedated dog down, he grabbed a thick apron, tossed it to Faith. Put that on. I've got to get pictures. Pictures? X-rays. Go to his head. Hold him steady as you can. The apron weighed like lead, but she dragged it on, did what she was told. Mongo's eyes were slitted, but it seemed to her he was watching her, pleading with her to help. It's going to be all right, baby. Wade's going to make everything all right. You'll see. The sound of her voice had B whining and scooting over to huddle by her feet. Get rid of the apron now. While he waited for the film to develop, Wade shot out orders. Come back here and apply pressure again. Keep talking to him. Just let him hear your voice. Okay. All right. Um... Swallowing what tasted like bile, she pressed the thick padding over the gash. Wade's going to fix you up just fine again. You you have to look both ways before you cross the street. You remember that next time. Oh, Wade, is he going to die? Not if I can help it. He slapped the x-rays onto a lighted panel, nodded grimly. Not if I can help it, he said again and started gathering instruments. Sharp silver tools glinted in the hard overhead light. Her head seemed to circle in time with her stomach. You're going to operate now just like that? I have to try to save the leg. Save it? You mean just do what I say and don't think? When he peeled back the compress, her stomach gave a nasty lurch, but he didn't give her time to be sick. You hold this. Press this button here when I tell you I need suction. You can do that one-handed. When I need an instrument, I'll describe it. Give it to me handle first. I'm going to knock him out now. He lowered the light, cleaned the field. All Faith could hear now was the slurping noises of her hose when he demanded suction, the click and clatter of tools. She averted her eyes, wanted to keep them that way, but he kept snapping out orders that required her to look. Before long, it was like a movie. Wade's head was bent, his eyes cool and calm, though she saw beads of sweat purling on his forehead. It seemed to her his hands were like magic, moving so delicately through blood, flesh, and bone. She didn't even blink when he slid the protruding bone back into place. None of it was real. She watched him suture impossibly tiny stitches inside the gash, the raw yellow of the sterile wash he'd used stained his hands, mixed with the blood until it was all the color of an aging bruise. I need you to check his heart rate manually. Just use your hand. Gauge his heartbeat for me. It's kind of slow, she said when she pressed down, but it seemed steady like bump, bump, bump. Good. Take a look at his eyes. Pupils are awfully big. Any blood in the whites? No, I don't think so. Okay. He needs some pins in this leg. Bone shattered more than broke. Once that's done, I'll close it, then we'll set the leg. Is he going to be all right? He's healthy. Wade used his forearm to wipe his brow. And he's young. He's got a good chance to keep this leg. He worried about bone chips. Had he gotten them all? There'd been muscle damage, some badly ripped tendons, but he felt confident he'd repaired the worst of it. All this ran through one part of his mind while the rest was focused on securing bone with steel. I'll know better in a day or two. I need gauze and tape, that cabinet there. Once he'd closed the wound, Wade bandaged and set the leg, then checked the dog's vitals himself. He treated the raw scrapes on the muzzle and behind the left ear. He held up, Wade murmured, then for the first time in over an hour looked directly at Faith. So did you. Yeah, well, I was a little queasy at first. Then she lifted her hands, started a gesture. They were streaked with blood, as was her blouse. Oh. 
Oh, my, was all she managed before her eyes rolled back. He caught her barely, then stretched her out on the floor. She was already coming around when he lifted her head and brought a paper cup of water to her lips. What happened? You fainted, gracefully, and at a convenient moment. He brushed his lips over her cheek. I'll take you upstairs. You can clean up and lie down for a bit. I'm all right. But when he helped her stand, her legs wobbled. Okay, maybe not. I might be better off flat out for a while longer. She dropped her head on his shoulder, half floating as he carried her up. I don't think I'm cut out to be a nurse. You did great. No, you did. I never thought, I never understood why you do what you do. I always figured it as giving out shots and cleaning up dog poop. Well, there's a lot of that. He carried her into the bathroom where he could brace her on the sink and run warm water in the bowl. Just put your hands in here. You'll feel better when they're clean. There's a lot more, Wade, to what you do, and to you. Her eyes met his in the mirror. I haven't been paying attention, haven't bothered to look close enough. You saved a life today. You're a hero. I did what I was trained to do. I know what I saw, and what I saw was heroic. She turned, kissed him. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to strip to the skin and get in the shower. You steady enough? Yeah, I'm fine. You go check on your patient. I love you, Faith. I think you do, she said quietly, and it's nicer than I expected. Go on now, my head's still light enough for me to say something I'll regret later. I'll be back up when I can. He checked on Mongo first, then cleaned up before stepping out into the examining room. Piney was still in the chair, and now B was curled sleeping in his lap. Wade had forgotten about both of them. That dog gonna make it? Looks good. Oh, Jesus, Wade, I'm just sick about it. I've been going over it in my head, and if I'd been paying more attention... I I was just driving along, my mind was wandering, and next thing I knew that dog jumped right out in the road. Could have been a kid. It wasn't your fault. Hit me a deer a time or two. Don't know why it didn't bother me like this. Mostly I'd just get pissed off. Deer can do a hell of a number on a truck. Some kid's going to come home from school looking for that dog. I know the owner. I'll give her a call. You getting him here fast made a big difference. That's what you ought to remember. Yeah, well. He sighed hugely. This little gal's right cute, he said, stroking Bee's head. She came out here looking for trouble, chewed on my bootlaces for a bit, then she conked right out. I appreciate you looking out for her. Wade reached down and picked her up. Bee yawned hugely, then licked at the cat scratches on his hand. Are you going to be all right? Yeah. Tell the God's truth, I'm going to go get me a drink. Cade's probably sent out the Marines for me by now, but that's just going to have to wait. He got to his feet. You let me know how that dog goes on now, will you? Sure. He slapped Piney's shoulder as they walked out. The waiting room was clear. Wade imagined most of his patients got tired of the delay and left. He could only be grateful for the quiet. He set B down with one of the dog treats Maxine kept in her desk drawer, then looked up Sherry Bellow's number in his files. The answering machine picked up, so he left a message. She'd be out looking for her dog, he supposed. More than likely, she'd run into someone who'd seen the accident. He left it at that and went back into Mongo. Minutes after Wade talked to Sherry's machine, Tori listened to the same cheery voice announcing she wasn't able to come to the phone. Sherry, this is Tori Bodine at Southern Comfort. I'd like you to call or come by when you get a chance. If you're still interested, you've got a job. The decision felt good, Tori thought, as she replaced the receiver. Not only had Sherry's references been glowing, but it might even be fun to have a bright face and willing hands around the shop for a few hours a week. Business was slow today, but she wasn't discouraged. It took time to establish herself, to become part of people's routines, and she'd had a handful of browsers that morning. She used the downtime to work out an affordable schedule for her new employee. She got out the forms she'd need to fill out for tax records and added the list of store policies she'd typed. She toyed with the wording for an ad in the Sunday paper that would include the linens she decided to carry. When her bells chimed, she looked up quickly with the same bump in the heart she'd experienced at the sound all day. But the sight of Abigail Lawrence made her set down her pen and smile. What a nice surprise. Told you I'd find my way here. Tori, this is just lovely. You have beautiful things. We have some very talented artists. And you know just how to display their work. Abigail held out a hand as Tori came around the counter. I'm going to have a wonderful time spending money here. Well, don't let me stop you. Can I get you anything? A cold drink? A cup of tea? No, not a thing. Oh, is that batik? Abigail crossed over to admire a framed portrait of a young woman standing on a garden path. She does wonderful work. I have a few of her scarves in stock as well. I'll have to take a look. I want to see everything. But I can tell you I want this batik. It's perfect for my husband to give me for our anniversary. 
Amused, Tori turned to lift it from the wall. And does he want it gift-wrapped? Naturally. How long have you been married? Abigail cocked her head as Tori carried the petite to the counter. In all the time she'd been Tori's lawyer, she never remembered her asking a personal question. Twenty-six years. So you were married at ten? Abigail beamed, examined a box of polished burl wood. Shopkeeping agrees with you. She carried the box to the counter herself. I think this town does, too. You're at home here. Yes, this is home. Abigail, did you really come up from Charleston to shop? That, and to see you. And to talk to you. Tori nodded. If you found out more about the girl who was murdered, you don't have to ease me into it. I didn't learn any more about her, but I did ask my friend to do that check on light crimes, crimes that had taken place during the last two weeks of August. There are others. You already knew. No, felt, feared. How many more? Three that fit the profile and time frame. A 12-year-old girl who went missing during a family trip to Hilton Head in August 1986. A 19-year-old co-ed taking summer classes at the university in Charleston in August 1993. And a 26-year-old woman who'd been camping with friends in Sumter National Forest, August 1999. So many, Tori whispered. All were sexual homicides, raped and strangled. There was no semen. There was some physical violence, particularly in the facial area. That escalates with each victim. Because their faces aren't right. Their faces aren't hers. Hopes. I don't understand. Tori wished she didn't, wished the sickness of it wasn't so horribly clear. They were all blondes, weren't they? Pretty slim builds? Yes. He keeps killing her. Once wasn't enough. Abigail shook her head a little concerned at the way Tori's eyes went vague and dark. It's possible they were killed by the same man, but they were killed by the same man. The length of time between the murders deviates from the typical serial killer profile. So many years between. Now, I'm not a criminal lawyer and I'm not a psychologist, but I have done some studying up on this subject in the last week or two. The ages of the victims don't fit the standard profile. This isn't standard, Abigail. Tori opened the burl box, closed it again. It isn't typical. There has to be a basis. Your friend and the 12-year-old indicate a pedophile. It appears to me a man who chooses children as victims doesn't switch to young women. But he's not switching anything. Their ages have everything to do with it. Everyone was the age Hope would have been if she'd lived. That's the pattern. Yes, I agree with you, though neither of us is experts in this area. I suppose I felt obligated to point out the flaws. There may be more. That's being investigated as well, though at this point my contact assures me none has been found. The FBI's looking into it. Abigail's pretty mouth firmed. Tori, my contact wanted to know why I was interested, how I'd learned of the hitchhiker. I didn't tell him. Thank you. You could help. I don't know that I can. Even if they'd let me, I don't know if I'm capable. It freezes me up inside. It was never easy, always wrenching, and now I don't want to face that again, to put myself through that again. I, I can't help them. This is for the police. If that's really how you feel, then why did you ask me to find out? I had to know. Tori, please don't. Please. I don't want to go back there again. I'm not sure I'd come out whole this time. To keep her hands busy, she began shifting items on a shelf. The police, the FBI, they are the experts here. This is their job, not mine. I don't want the faces of all those people in my head, what happened to them inside my head. I already have hope. Coward. The voice whispered the taunt in her ear throughout the rest of the day. She didn't ignore it. She accepted it, and she was going to learn how to live with it. She knew what she needed to know. Whoever had killed Hope was still killing, selectively, efficiently, and it was the job of the police or the FBI or some special task force to hunt him down and stop him. It was not up to her. And if her deepest and most personal fears were realized and that killer had her father's face, could she live with that? They would find Hannibal Bodine soon. Then she would decide. When she locked up for the day, she thought it might do her good to walk around town through the park. She could drop by Sherry's and speak with her instead of her answering machine. Take care of business, Tori reminded herself. Take care of yourself. Traffic was light. Most would already be home from work, sitting down to supper. 
Children had already been called in to wash up, and the evening, long and bright, would stretch out with television and porch sitting, homework, and dirty dishes. Normal, every day, precious for its simple monotony, and she wanted it for herself with a quiet desperation. She cut through the park. Roses were blooming, and pools of wax begonias spread in crimson and white. Trees cast long shadows in welcome shade, and a few people sat or stretched under them. Young people, Tori noted, not yet stone set in the tradition of 5.30 supper. They'd go out for pizza later or a burger, then flock somewhere with others like them to listen to music or their own voices. She'd done the same once, briefly, but it seemed like decades ago. It seemed like another woman entirely who had elbowed her way into a crowded club to dance, to laugh, to be young. She'd already lost all that once. She would not lose the new life she'd just begun. Deep in thought, she came out of a line of trees and started across the green slope that led to the apartment building. B shot across the lawn like a bullet, yapping insanely. You sure get around, don't you? Charmed, Tori crouched and let herself be attacked. She's been inside most of the day, Faith strolled up, pleased when her pup deserted Tori to leap on her. She's got a lot of energy. So I see. Tori glanced up, pursed her lips as she straightened. That's not your usual look, she commented, studying the overlarge T-shirt over Faith's linen slacks. Still works for me, doesn't it? I spilled something on my blouse earlier, borrowed this from Wade. I see. Yes, I suppose you do. You have a problem with that? Why should I? Wade's a big boy. I could say something crude about that, but I let it pass. Faith skimmed her sleek hair behind her ear, smiled broadly. Tired of the solitude of the marsh, going apartment hunting? No, I like my house. I'm just dropping by to see a potential employee, Sherry Bellows. Well, that's a coincidence. I'm here to see her myself. Wade's still tied up at his office, and he hadn't been able to reach her all day. Her dog was hit by a car late this morning. Oh, no. Instantly, the reserve fled. She'll be heartbroken. He's doing all right. Wade went right to work on him, saved his life. It was said with such pride, Tori could only stare. He's not sure how well the dog's leg will heal, but I'm betting it'll be right as rain. I'm glad to hear it. He's a beautiful dog, and she seems to love him so much. I can't believe she'd go off for the day and leave him running loose. Well, you just never know about people. Her apartment's there, Faith pointed. I was around front, but she didn't answer the knock, so I thought I'd poke back here. Her neighbor said she uses this door more than the front. Blinds are closed. Maybe the door's open. We can slip in and leave her a note anyway. Wade really wants to get a hold of her. She crossed the patio, reached for the handle of the sliding glass door. Don't! Tori gripped her shoulder and jerked her back. What the hell's wrong with you? It's not breaking and entering, for Christ's sake. I'm just going to poke my head in. Don't go in there. Don't go in. Tori's fingers dug into Faith's shoulder. She'd already seen. It had slapped in front of her face, jumped there almost gleefully, and the copper penny taste of blood and fear pooled in her mouth. It's too late. He's been here. What are you talking about? Faith gave her arm an impatient jerk. Would you please let me go? She's dead, Tori said flatly. We have to call the police. Noah. It takes two to speak the truth, one to speak and another to hear. Henry David Thoreau. 21. She couldn't go in. She couldn't make herself leave. The deputy who'd answered the call had been both skeptical and annoyed, but he hadn't been able to hold out against what he considered two overreacting females. He'd hitched at his belt, tugged on his cap, then had knocked loudly on the glass panel of the door. Tori could have told him Sherry was incapable of answering, but he wouldn't have listened or understood. But two minutes after he'd stepped inside, he was back out again, and the irritated smirk was no longer on his face. It didn't take long to get the wheels rolling. When Chief Russ arrived, the scene was closed off with yellow police tape, and those who moved in and out carried the tools of their trade and their badges. Tori sat on the ground and waited. I called Wade. Since there was nothing else to do, Faith sat down beside her. He has to wait until Maxine comes to look after Mongo, but he's coming. There's nothing for him to do. There's nothing for any of us to do. Faith stared at the tape, the door, the shadows of men moving around behind the blinds. How did you know she was dead? Sherry or Hope? Faith clutched the puppy to her breast, rubbed her cheek against warm fur for comfort. I've never seen anything like this. They wouldn't let me near where Hope was. I was too young. You saw it. 
Yes. You saw it all. Not quite all. She pressed her palms together, squeezed her hands between her knees as if they were very cold. I knew when we got to the door. There's a darkness about death, violent death especially, and he left something of himself behind, maybe just the madness of it. It's the same as before. He's the same. She closed her eyes. I thought he would come for me. I never considered, I never imagined this. And that was the guilt she would live with now. You're saying whoever did this to Sherry killed Hope after all these years? Tori started to speak, then shook her head. I can't be sure. I haven't been sure of anything in a long time. She glanced over as she heard Faith's name called. Wade ran across the grass toward them. It surprised her when Faith leaped up. It was rare to see Faith bother to move quickly. Then she watched them take each other, one long, hard embrace. He loves her, Tori realized. She's the center of things for him. How odd. You're all right? He put his hands on Faith's face, cupped it there. I don't know what I am. She had been all right. Everything had seemed to hold at a distance, far enough away not to touch her. Now her hands wanted to shake and her stomach jump, the same way she'd reacted after the surgery when there had been blood on her hands. I think I need to sit down again. Here. When she lowered to the grass, he knelt, his hand still clutching Faith's while he studied Tori's face. Too calm, he decided. Too controlled. It only meant when she broke, she'd shatter. Why don't y'all come back with me? You need to get away from here. I can't, but you should take Faith. So you can see it through and I can't? I don't think so, Faith said. It's not a competition. Between you and me, it's always been. There's Dwight. People had started to gather in small pockets of murmurs and curiosity. Word traveled lightning fast in progress, Tori thought dully. She watched Dwight move through the gatherings and head straight for Sherry's door. Maybe you can talk to him, Wade, Faith gestured in Dwight's direction. Maybe he'll be able to tell us something. I'll see. He touched Tori's knee before he rose. Cade's on his way. Why? Because I called him. Just wait here. There was no need for that, Tori said, frowning at Wade's back as he slipped through the crowd of onlookers. Oh, shut up. Annoyed, Faith dug in her purse for a chewy bone to keep Bee occupied. You're no more iron woman than I am. It doesn't make us less to lean on a man. I don't intend to lean on Cade. For Christ's sake, if he's good enough to sleep with, he's good enough to hold on to at a time like this. I swear you just hunt up things to be bitchy about. Why don't we all go out on a double date later? We can go dancing. Faith's smile was scalpel sharp. You're a real pain in the ass, Tori. I'm starting to like that about you. Well, shit, there's Billy Clampett and he spotted me. That just makes it perfect. I was nearly pissed off enough and drunk enough one night a thousand years ago to have sex with him. Fortunately, I came to my senses in time, but he's never stopped trying to finish things off. Tori watched Billy stroll toward them, thumbs tucked in his front pockets, fingers beating out a tune on either side of his zipper. There couldn't be enough liquor in the county for that. Finally, a point of agreement. Billy, ladies, he crouched down, heard there was some excitement round here. Some girl went and got herself killed. Careless of her, Faith didn't shift away, wouldn't give him the satisfaction, though she could smell his evening beer on his breath. Heard it was Sherry Bellas. She's the one who runs around town with that big shaggy dog, wears little shorts and low-cut tops, sort of advertising the wares. He took a cigarette out of the pack he'd rolled in the sleeve of his T-shirt. He thought the effect made him look like James Dean. Sold her some annuals a couple of weeks back. She was mighty friendly, if you catch my meaning. Tell me, Billy, do you practice being disgusting, or is it just a gift? It took him a minute, but his smile went sour as old milk as he struck a match and puffed his cigarette to life. Aren't you Miss High and Mighty all of a sudden? Nothing sudden about it. I've always been high and mighty. Isn't that right, Tori? I've never known you to be otherwise. It's a bit like a birthmark. Exactly. Delighted, Faith slapped a hand on Tori's thigh. She took out a cigarette of her own. We Lavelle, she began, lighting it and blowing smoke coolly into Billy's face, are destined to be superior. It's just stamped on our DNA. You weren't so superior that night behind Grogan's when I had your tits in my hands. Oh, Faith smiled, blew more smoke. Was that you? Ever since you grew tits, you've been a slut. You better watch yourself. He glanced deliberately at Sherry's door. Sluts end up getting just what they ask for. I remember you now, Tori said quietly. You used to tie firecrackers to cat's tails and light them, and then you'd go home and masturbate. 
Is that still how you spend your leisure time? He jerked back. There was no smile on his face now, and fear had replaced the sneer in his eyes. We don't need you around here. We don't need your kind. He might have left it at that. He was frightened enough to. But B decided his pant leg was more interesting than her bone. Billy sent her flying with the back of his hand. With a cry of outrage, Faith scrambled to her feet to scoop up the whining dog. You yellow-bellied, beer-soaked, half-peckered asshole. No wonder your wife's shopping for a new man. You can't get it up with your own fist. He started to lunge at Faith. Tori didn't know how it happened, and it seemed to be happening to someone else, but her fist popped out of her lap and connected with his eye. The force and shock of the blow knocked him on his ass. Dimly, she heard shouts and squeals and running feet, but as Billy leaped up, so did she. All of her rage rolled into one hot ball inside her. She could already taste the blood. Fucking bitch. When he charged, she planted her feet. She wanted violence, welcomed it. Even as he swung back, he went sprawling. Try me, Cade suggested, and hauled him to his feet. Stay out of it, he snapped as people rushed up to interfere. Come on, Billy. Let's see how you handle me instead of a woman half your size. You've had this coming for years. The sneer was back. He crouched, burning with the need to restore himself in front of the town, desperate to pound his bunched fists into the haughty face of one of the Lavelles. When I'm done with you, I'm going to have some fun with your whore sister and your cunt. He came in hard. Cade simply sidestepped. It only took two blows, an uppercut that snapped Billy's head back and a fast, vicious jab to the gut. Cade bent down and, pressing his thumb on Billy's windpipe, whispered in his ear, If you ever touch my sister or my woman, if you ever speak to them, ever look at them, I'll wrap your balls around your throat and choke you with them. He dropped Billy's head back to the ground and walked toward Tory without a backward glance. This isn't the place for you now. She couldn't find her voice. She'd never seen fury burst and retreat so easily, almost elegantly, she thought. He'd battered a man to the ground without breaking a sweat, and now he was speaking to her gently, and his eyes were cold as winter. Come on away with me now. I have to stay. No, you don't. Sorry to say she does. Carl D. walked up, turned his gaze down at Billy, rubbed his chin in a thoughtful manner. Have some trouble out here? Billy Clampett made insulting remarks. Instantly, soft tears swam into Faith's eyes and turned them the color of dew-drenched bluebells. He was, well, I can't even begin, but he was very offensive to me and to Tori. Then he, she sniffed delicately. Then he struck my poor little bee here, and when Tori tried to stop him, he, if it hadn't been for Cade, I don't know what might have happened. She turned to Tori, sobbing quietly. You could have taken him, she murmured, fat, puss-faced asshole. Carl D. tucked his tongue in his cheek. After what he'd seen inside, this little comedy was an entertaining relief. That about how it was, he asked Cade. More or less. I'll have him taken in so he can cool off some. He glanced around, making eye contact with faces in the crowd as he gently chewed his gum. Don't think anybody here wants to press charges. No, we'll let it lay. Good enough. I'm going to need to talk to Tori here, and Faith, too. We can be a little more private down at the station. Chief? Wade joined them, stepping so casually over the half-conscious Billy, Faith had to disguise a snort of laughter with a wet sniffle. My place is closer. I think it'd be more comfortable for the ladies. We might could do that for a start, anyway. I'm going to have one of my deputies take you on over. I'll be along directly. I'll take them, Wade said. You and Cade know most of these people. I'd appreciate it if you'd give me a hand getting them to go on home. One of my men will see to the ladies here. I need to get their statements, he said, before Cade could object. That's police business. We can get there by ourselves. Well, now, Miss Faith, I'll just send one of my men along with you. It's procedure. He signaled and set the wheels in motion. Jesus. How does something like this happen in the middle of town? Dwight rubbed at the tension in the back of his neck. They'd managed to nudge most of the curious away from the building. Now it was darkness that gathered as he stood with his two oldest friends on the quiet lawn outside the apartment where death wore the symbol of yellow police tape. How much do you know? Wade asked him. No more than anyone else, I expect. Carl D. didn't let me pass the edges, and I only got that far because I'm mayor. It looks like somebody broke into her place sometime yesterday. Maybe it was a robbery. He pinched the bridge of his nose and shook his head. Doesn't seem like it. Didn't look to me like she had a lot. How'd they get by the dog, Wade wondered. Dog? Dwight looked blank a moment, then nodded. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it was someone she knew. 
That makes more sense, doesn't it? Maybe it was someone she knew and they had an argument that got out of hand. She was in the bedroom, he added on a sigh. That much I know. The, well, the bits and pieces I heard said she was raped. How was she killed? Kate asked him. I don't know. Carl D. was keeping a tight lid on most of it. Jesus, Wade, we were just talking about her the other night. Remember, I ran into her coming out of your place. Yeah, I remember. He got a picture of her bubbling over, flirting, while he examined Mongo. There were some murmurs in there, Dwight jerked his head toward the sealed door, about Tory Bodine. Edgy talk, he added. I figured you'd want to know. He sighed again. This shouldn't happen in the middle of damn town. People ought to be safe in their own houses. This is going to worry Lissy sick. There'll be a run on the hardware store and gun shop tomorrow, Cade predicted. Locks and ammo. Oh, Christ. I best call a town meeting, see if I can calm people down. I hope to God Carl D. has something on this by tomorrow. I got to get back to Lissy. She'll be in a state by now. He shot one last look at the door. This shouldn't have happened here, he repeated and walked away. I only met her once, just yesterday. Tori sat on Wade's sofa with her hands neatly folded in her lap. She knew it was important to be calm and clear when talking to the police. They picked at emotion, used weaknesses as levers to pry out more than you wanted to say. Then they made you ridiculous. Then they betrayed you. You only met her the once. Carl D. nodded, made his notes. He'd asked Faith to wait downstairs. He wanted his interviews and the facts he gleaned from them on separate pages. Why'd you happen to go by her place today? She applied for a job at my store. That's so, he cocked a brow. I thought she had herself a job teaching at the high school. Yes, so she told me. Answer the questions exactly, she reminded herself. Don't add, don't elaborate. Not full time until fall, though, and she wanted something part time to supplement her income and to keep her busy, I think. She seemed to have a lot of energy. Uh huh. So you went on and hired her. No, not immediately. She gave me references. Wrote them down, she remembered, along with her address on the clipboard. The clipboard that she'd left on the counter when her father had come in. Oh, God. Oh, God. Well, that's a sensible thing. Didn't know you were hiring at your place. I hadn't really thought about it until she came in. She was persuasive. I took some time to go over my budget and decided I could afford light part-time help. I checked her references this morning, then I called her. I got her machine and left a message. Uh-huh. He'd already heard her message and the ones from Wade's office. The one from her upstairs neighbor, the one from Lissy Frazier. Sherry Bellows had been a popular lady. Then you decided to go on over in person. After I closed for the day, I wanted a walk. I decided I'd take one through the park and drop by her apartment. That way, if she was in, I could discuss the job with her. You went over there with Faith Lavelle? No, I went over alone. I ran into Faith outside the building, the back of the building. She said Sherry's dog had been injured earlier in the day. He'd been hit by a car and Wade had treated him. She'd come over as a favor to Wade as they'd been unable to reach her. So he got there at the same time. Yes, more or less. That would have been around 6.30 as I closed up and left the shop about 6.10 or 6.15. And when Miss Bellis didn't answer, you went on in looking for her. No, neither of us went inside. But you saw something that worried you. He looked up from his pad. She sat perfectly still, kept her eyes on his, and said nothing. You were worried enough to call the police. She didn't return my call, though she appeared to be very eager for the job. She didn't return Wade's, though it was obvious to me from our one and only meeting that she adored her dog. Her blinds were shut. The door was closed. I called the police. Neither Faith nor I went inside. Neither of us saw anything, so I can't tell you anything. He sat back, gnawed on his pencil. Did you try the door? No. It wasn't locked. He let the silence hang, filled the time by getting out his pack of gum, offering it to Tori. When she shook her head, he took out a stick, unwrapped it, carefully folded the wrapper. Tori's heart began to dance in her chest. So, Carl D. folded the gum as carefully as he had its wrapper, slipped it into his mouth. You two had gone over. Now... Knowing Faith Lavelle, I'd say she'd have poked her head in, curiosity if nothing else. What's this new teacher got in her place, that kind of thing? She didn't. You knocked, called out. No, we... She broke off, fell silent. You just stopped there at the door and decided to call the police. He let out a sigh. You're going to make me pull some teeth here. Now, I'm a simple man, I got simple ways, and I've been a cop more than 20 years. 
Cops got instincts, gets hunches in the gut. Can't always explain them, they just are. Could be you got like a hunch today outside the door of Sherry Bella's apartment. It's possible. Some people tend toward hunches. You might say you had one 18 years ago when you led us to Hope Lavelle. You, you had more of them up in New York. A lot of people were glad you did. His voice was kind, a soft roll of words, but his eyes, she noted, were watchful. What happened in New York has nothing to do with this. It has to do with you. Six kids got back home because you had hunches. And one didn't. Six did, Carl D. repeated. I can't tell you any more than I've told you. Maybe you can't. Strikes me as more that you won't. I was there 18 years ago when you led us to that little girl. I'm a simple man with simple ways, but I was there. And I was there today looking down at that young woman and what had been done to her. It took me back. I was at both those places and saw both those things. And so did you. I didn't go in, but you saw. No, she surged to her feet. I didn't. I felt. I didn't see and I didn't look. There was nothing I could do. She was dead and there was nothing I could do for her or for Hope or any of them. I don't want that inside me again. I've told you everything I know exactly as it happened. Why isn't that enough? All right, now. All right, Miss Tory, why don't you sit down there, try to relax while I go down and talk to Faith. I'd like to go home now. You just sit down and catch your breath a little. We'll see you get home soon enough. He chewed over his thoughts on her and her reaction to his questions as he walked downstairs. The girl, he decided, was a basket of troubles. He could be sorry for it, but that wouldn't stop him from using her if it suited his purposes. He had a murder in his town. It wasn't the first, but it was damn near the ugliest in a good many years. And he was a man who had hunches. His gut told him Tory Bodine was the key. He found Cade pacing at the bottom of the stairs. You can go on up to her. I expect she could use a shoulder. Your sister around? She's in the back with Wade. He's checking on the dog. Too bad that dog can't talk. Was well, Piney clipped him, wasn't it? So I'm told. Yeah, too bad that dog can't talk. He patted his notebook pocket and wandered into the back. Cade found Tori still sitting on the sofa. I should have just walked away. Or better, smarter, I should have let Faith go in the way she wanted to. Faith would have found her, we'd have called the police, and there'd have been no questions. He moved over to sit beside her. Why didn't you? I didn't want her to see what was in there. I didn't want to see it either. And now Chief Russ expects me to go into a trance and give him the name of the killer. It was Professor Plum in the conservatory with the candlestick. I'm not a goddamn board game. He took her hand. You've every right to be angry with him, with the situation. Why are you angry with yourself? I'm not. Why would I be? She looked down at their joined hands. You bruised your knuckles. Hurts like a son of a bitch. Really? It didn't seem like it when you hit him. It didn't seem like you felt anything but mild annoyance. I really must swat this pesky fly and get back to my book. He grinned at that, brought her hand to his lips. As a Lavelle, one must maintain one's dignity. Bull. I said that's what it seemed like, but that wasn't the reality of it. Rage and disgust were the reality, and you enjoyed flattening him. I know, she said with a sigh, because that's what I was feeling. He's an ugly man, and he'll try to find another way to hurt you now. But he'll come at your back, because he's afraid of you. And no, that's just good sense and a reasonable understanding of human nature, not my fabulous psychic powers. Clamp it doesn't worry me. He rubbed his bruised knuckles over her cheek. Don't let him worry you. I wish I could. She got to her feet. I wish I could worry about him so it would occupy my mind. Why should I feel guilty? I don't know, Tori. Why should you? I barely knew Sherry Bellows. I spent less than an hour with her, no more than a brush on my life. I'm sorry for what happened to her, but does that mean I have to get involved? No. It won't change what happened to her. Nothing I do will change what happened, so what's the point? Even if Chief Russ pretends he's open to whatever I could do, in the end he'll be just like the others. Why should I put myself in the middle of it only to be laughed at and dismissed? She rounded on him. Don't you have anything to say? I'm waiting for you to come around to it. You think you're smart, don't you? You think you know me so well. You don't know me at all. I didn't come back here to right wrongs or avenge a dead friend. I came back here to live my life and run my business. All right. Don't say all right to me in that patient tone when your eyes are telling me I'm a liar. 
Because her breath was starting to hitch, he rose and went to her. I'll go with you. She stared at him another moment, then just went into his arms. God, oh God. We'll go on down and tell the chief. I'll stay with you. She nodded, held on another minute, and she accepted that after she was done in Sherry's apartment, he might never want to hold her again. 22. You need anything before we go in? Tori was still fighting to calm her nerves, but met Carl D.'s gaze levelly. What, like a crystal ball, a pack of tarot cards? He'd gone in the front, as she'd requested, and unlocked the patio door from the inside, cut the seal, and stepped out where she waited with Cade. There was less chance of being seen going in through the rear. The killer had known that, too. Now Carl D. pushed back his hat to scratch his wide brow. Yes, you're a mite put out with me. You pushed where I don't like to be pushed. This isn't going to be pleasant for me and could very well be useless to you. Miss Tory, I got a young woman about your age lying on a table down at the funeral parlor. County M.E.'s got his job to do on her. Her family's coming down tomorrow morning. Wouldn't call any of that pleasant for anybody. He'd wanted her to have that picture in her head. Tori acknowledged it with a nod. You're a harder man than I remember. You're a harder woman. I guess we both got reason. Don't talk to me. She opened the door herself, stepped inside. She'd braced herself and concentrated on the light first, the light in the room as he'd flicked the switch. The light sherry had permeated through the air. It was a long time before she spoke, a long time while what was left in the room slid inside her. She liked music. She liked noise. Being alone just wasn't natural to her. She liked to have people over, voices, movement. They're all so fascinating to her. She loved to talk. There was fingerprint dust on the phone. She didn't notice that it smeared her own fingers as she trailed them over it. Who was Sherry Bellows? That had to come first. Conversations were like food to her. She'd have starved to death without them. She liked to find out about people, to listen to them talk about themselves. She was very happy here. She paused, letting her fingers brush over picture frames, the arms of a chair. Most people don't really want to hear what people say, but she did. Her questions weren't a ploy to wheedle an opening to talk about herself. She had such plans. Teaching was an adventure to her, all those minds to feed. She walked past Cade and Carl D. Though she was aware of them, they were becoming less important to her, their presence less real. She loved to read. Tori spoke quietly as she wandered toward a cheap brass-plated shelf filled with books. Images floated through her mind of a pretty young woman tucking books on the shelf, taking them out, curled up with them on the chair on the patio with a big shaggy dog snoring at her feet. It was easy to blend into those images, to open to them, become part of them. She tasted salt, potato chips on her tongue and felt a lovely wave of contentment. But that's just another way to be with people. You slide into the book, you become a character, your favorite character. You experience. The dog gets up on the sofa with you or in the bed. He leaves hair everywhere. You swear you could make a coat out of the hair he sheds, but he's such a sweetheart. So you run the vacuum most every day. Turn the music up so you can hear it over the motor. Music pulsed inside her head, loud, cheerfully loud. Her foot tapped to it. Mr. Rice next door, he complained about that. But you bake him some cookies and bring him around. Everyone's so nice in this town. It's just where you wanted to be. She turned from the bookshelf. Her eyes were blurry, blank, but she was smiling. Cade's heart skipped a beat as her smoky gaze passed over him, passed through him. Jerry, the little boy from upstairs, he's just crazy about Mongo. Jerry's just as cute as a bug and twice as pesky. One day you want a little boy just like him, all eyes and grins and sticky fingers. She turned in a circle, her lips curved, her eyes blind. Sometimes in the afternoon after school they'll go out and run around together, or he'll throw Mongo tennis balls, fuzzy yellow balls that get all wet and messy. It's fun to sit on the patio and watch them. Jerry has to go in. His mother called him in to do his chores before supper. Mongo's just plain worn out, so he'll sleep out on the patio. You want the music on, loud as you can, without bothering Mr. Rice, because you're feeling so happy, so hopeful. A glass of wine, white wine. 
Not really good wine, but you can't afford better. Still, it's nice enough, and you can sip and listen to the music and plan. She walked to the patio doors, looked out. Instead of dark, she saw early twilight. The big dog spread out on the concrete like a shaggy welcome mat and snoring lightly. Lots to think about, so many plans, so much to do. You feel so good about things and just can't wait to get started. You want to have a party, have the rooms crowded with people and flirt with that gorgeous vet and that slick-looking Cade Lavelle. My, my, they sure grow them handsome in progress. But now you should make a meal. You have to feed the dog. Maybe another glass of wine while you're putting it together. She strolled into the kitchen, humming the tune she heard in her head, Cheryl Crow. A salad, a nice big salad with extra carrots because Mongo likes them. You'll mix them in with his kibble. She reached down, brushed her fingers over the handle of the cupboard, then let out a gasp, stumbled back. Instinctively, Cade moved toward her, but Carl D. gripped his arm. Don't. He spoke in a whisper as though in church. Let her be. He was there. Just there. Tori's breathing came in quick, short bursts now. She had both hands fisted at her throat. You didn't hear him. You can't see him. There's a knife. He has a knife. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. His hands over your mouth, squeezing. The knife's at your throat. You're so scared. So scared. You won't scream. You won't. You'll do anything if he doesn't hurt you. His voice is at your ear, soft, quiet. What did he do with Mongo? Did he hurt him? It's all tumbling in your head. It's not real. It can't be real. But the knife's so sharp. He pushes you and you're afraid you'll stumble and the knife... She shuffled out of the kitchen, braced a hand on the wall when she swayed. The blinds are drawn. No one can see. No one can help. He wants you in the bedroom, and you know what he's going to do. If you could only get away, away from the knife. Tori froze at the door to the bedroom. Nausea rolled into her in short, choppy waves. I can't. I can't. She turned her face to the wall, struggling to find herself through all the fear and violence. I don't want to see this. He killed her here. Why do I have to see it? That's enough, Cade shoved away Carl D.'s restraining hand. God damn it, that's enough. But when he reached for Tori, she stumbled away. It's in my head. I'll never get it out of my head. Don't talk to me. Don't touch me. She pressed her hands to her face, trapping her own breath, and let it claw back inside her. Oh, oh, he pushes you on the bed, face down, and he's on top of you. He's already hard, and, and feeling him, feeling him pressing against you, you struggle. The fear's wild inside you, huge, choking. There's a heat to it. Fear burns. She moaned, went down to her knees beside the bed. He hits you, hard, the back of the neck. The pain's so sharp it rushes through you, stuns you. He hits you again. The side of your face explodes with it. You taste blood, your own blood. Blood tastes the same as terror, the same. He yanks your arms behind your back, and the pain of that's just another layer. Tentacles of that pain slithered and groped inside her, tangled with a horror so huge it seemed the mass of it all would burst out of her brain. She pressed her face to the side of the mattress, dug her fingers into it. It's dark. The room's dark and the music's playing, and you can't think over the pain. You're crying. You try to plead with him, but he's tied a cloth over your mouth. He hits you again, and you start sliding away somewhere. Half conscious, you hardly feel it when he cuts your clothes away. The knife nicks you, but it's worse, so much worse when he uses his hands on you. Tori doubled over, wrapped her arms around her belly, and began to rock. It hurts. It hurts. You can't even cry when he's raping you. Just let it be over. But he keeps beating himself into you, and you have to go away. You have to be somewhere else. You have to go away. Exhausted, Tori laid her head on the side of the bed, closed her eyes, it was like being smothered, she thought dimly, like being buried alive. So the blood rings in your ears like a thousand bells, and the sweat that coats your body is cold, so viciously cold. She had to fight her way back into the air, back into self. When he was finished with her, he strangled her with his hands. She couldn't fight any more. She cried, or he did, I can't tell. But he cut the rope from around her wrists. He took it with him. He didn't want to leave any of himself behind, but he did, like an ice rime on glass. I can't stay here. Please get me out of here. Please get me away from here. It's all right. Cade bent down to gather her into his arms. Her skin was cold, slicked with sweat. It's all right, baby. I'm sick. I can't breathe in here. 
She lay her head on his shoulder and let herself drop away. He drove her home. She didn't speak, didn't move throughout the drive. She sat like a ghost, pale and silent, while the wind through the open windows of the truck blew over her face and hair. There was an anger in him that had lashed out at Carl D. when the chief said he would follow them back. But she'd said to let him come. That was the last thing she'd said. So his anger had no target or release and built steadily inside him. His silence was like a bruise gathering dark and full of violence. He pulled up to the Marsh house and she was out of the truck before he could come around to help her. You don't have to talk to him. His voice was clipped, his eyes brutally cold. Yes, I do. You can't see what I see, then not do whatever you can. She shifted her exhausted eyes toward the police cruiser. He knew that and used it. There's no need for you to stay. Don't be stupid, he snapped, and turned to wait for Carl D. as she walked to the door. You watch your step. Cade faced the chief the minute he was out of his cruiser. You be very, very careful with her, or I'll use whatever comes to hand to make you pay for it. I expect you're upset. Upset? Cade took a fistful of Carl D.'s shirt. He felt he could break the man in half one quick snap. You put her through that, and so did I, he said, dropping his hand in disgust. And for what? I don't know. Not yet. Fact is, I'm a bit shaken by this, but I gotta use whatever comes to hand, too. And right now, that's Tory. I'm feeling my way here, Cade. There was regret in his voice, in his eyes, a veneer over duty. I don't want to hurt that girl. If it makes you feel any better, I'm going to be careful, as careful as I know how. And I'm going to remember probably the rest of my life the way she looked back there. So will I, Cade said, and turned away. She was making tea, an herbal blend she hoped would soothe her stomach and stop her hands from trembling. She said nothing when the two men walked in, but got out a bottle of bourbon, set it on the counter, then sat. I could use a shot of that. I ain't supposed to on duty, but we got extenuating circumstances. Cade got out two glasses and poured doubles. He came in through the back, Tory began. You know that. You'll already know a great deal that I can tell you. I appreciate it. Carl D. scraped back a chair. You just tell me how it feels best to you and take your time. She was alone in the apartment. She had a couple of glasses of wine. She felt good, excited, hopeful. She had music playing. She was in the kitchen when he came in, fixing a salad for dinner, getting ready to feed the dog. He took her from behind, used the knife she'd set aside when she pulled out the dog food. Tori's voice was flat, dull, her face expressionless. She lifted her tea, sipped, set it down. She didn't see him. He kept behind her, kept the knife to her throat. He'd closed the blinds to the patio. I think he locked the door, but it doesn't matter. She didn't try to run. She was too afraid of the knife. Absently, she lifted her hand to her throat, skimmed her fingers along her windpipe as if nursing a sting. I don't know what he said to her. Everything she felt was so much stronger than what he felt. He didn't particularly want her. What was left of him there was rage and confusion and a kind of horrible pride. She was a substitute, a handy outlet for a a need he doesn't understand. He took her into the bedroom, kept her face down on the bed. He struck her several times, the back of the neck, the face. He tied her hands behind her back, good strong rope. He closed the curtains so that they could be private, so that it would be dark. He didn't want her to see his face, but more, I think more, he didn't want to see hers. He sees another face when he rapes her. He uses the knife to cut off her clothes. He's very careful but he still nicks her on the back and up by her shoulder. Carl D. nodded, took a long drink. That's right, she had two shallow cuts and there were ligature marks on her wrists, but we didn't find any rope. He took it with him. He's never done this inside before, it's always been out of doors, and there's something exciting about doing these things to her in bed. When he hits her, it gives him pleasure. He likes to hurt women. But more than pleasure, it provides him with a kind of relief for this pent-up hunger in him this need to prove himself a man. He's a man when he makes a woman bend to his will. While he rapes her, he's happier, someone stronger inside himself than he is at any other time. He celebrates his manhood this way, in a way he can't in any other. Trying to see him, to crawl inside him, hurt her head. She rubbed at her temple, pushed harder. It is sexual for him, and he believes she was meant to be taken, to be dominated. He's convinced himself of that, and still, he's careful. He uses a condom. 
How does he know who she's fucked? She's a whore like the others. A man has to look out for himself. You said he didn't want to leave any of himself behind. Yes, he won't leave his seat inside her. She doesn't deserve it. I... This isn't what I feel from him. I feel almost nothing from him. Her fingers drilled at her throbbing temple. There are blanks and dead ends. Turns in him. I, I don't know how to tell you. That's fine, Carl D. told her. Go ahead. This isn't an act of procreation, but of punishment for her and ego for him. During the process, she ceases to exist for him. She's nothing, so it's easy to kill her. When it's over, he's proud, but he's angry, too. It's never exactly what he hoped it would be. It never completely purges him. Her fault, of course. The next time will be better. He cuts the rope, he turns off her music, and he leaves her in the dark. Who is he? I don't see his face. I can see some of his thoughts, some of the more desperate of his emotions, but I don't see him. He knew her. He'd seen her, I think. He's spoken to her. He knew enough to know about the dog. Tori closed her eyes a moment, tried to focus. He drugged the dog. I think he drugged the dog. Burger laced with something. Risky. This was all very risky, and that added to the excitement. Someone might have seen him. All the other times, there was no one to see. What other times? The first was hope. Her voice broke. She lifted her tea again, calmed herself. There were four others that I know of. I had a friend look into it. She found out there have been five over the last 18 years, all of them killed in late August, all of them young blondes. Each one was the age Hope would have been if she'd lived. I think Sherry was younger, but she wasn't the one he wanted. A serial killer over 18 years? You can verify it with the FBI. She looked at Cade then for the first time since they'd sat down. He's still killing Hope. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. She rose and her cup clattered in the saucer as she carried it to the counter. I'm afraid it could be my father. Why? Cade kept his eyes on her face. Why would you believe that? He has... When he hurt me, it aroused him. The shame of it sliced through or shards of glass jagged and edged with bitter heat. He never touched me sexually, but it aroused him to hurt me. I think, looking back, I can't be sure he didn't know of my plans to meet Hope that night. When he came in for supper, he was in a good mood, a rare one. It was as if he was waiting for me to make a mistake, to open the door so that he could pounce. When I did, when I told my mother she could find the canning wax up in the top of the cupboard, such a stupid mistake. He had me. He didn't always beat me that bad, but that night, when he finished, he could be sure I wasn't going anywhere. She came back to the table. Sherry was in the store when he came in yesterday. He asked her about her dog, and she'd just filled out an application for a job. I had the paper on the counter, her name, her address, her phone number. He would have been certain of me, certain I'd be too afraid to tell anyone I'd seen him. He wouldn't have expected me to go to the police, but he couldn't have been sure of her. You believe Hannibal Bodine killed Sherry Bellas because she'd seen him? It would have been his excuse, his justification for what he wanted to do. I only know he's capable of it. I can't tell you anymore. I'm sorry. I'm not feeling well. She walked away from the table and closed herself in the bathroom. She couldn't fight off the sickness anymore and let it come, let it empty her out. Afterward, she lay on the floor on the cool tiles and waited for the weakness to abate. The quiet seemed to echo in her ears along with her own heartbeat. When she could, she got to her feet and turned the shower to blistering hot. She was chilled to the bone. It seemed nothing could warm her, but the water helped her imagine all the ugliness, the smear of it being washed off her skin, if not out of her mind. Steadier, she wrapped herself in a towel, dosed herself with three aspirin, and stepped out, prepared to curl into bed and lose herself in sleep. Cade was standing by the window, looking out over the moon-washed dark. He'd left the lights off so that silvered glow silhouetted in there. She could hear the flutter of night beyond the screen, the wings and whines that were the music of the marsh. Her heart ached for everything she couldn't stop herself from loving. I thought you'd gone. She walked to the closet for her robe. He didn't turn. Are you feeling any better? Yes, I'm fine. Hardly that. I just want to know if you're any better. Yes. Decisively, she belted the robe. I'm better. Thank you. You're under no obligation here, Kate. I know what to do for myself. 
Good. He turned, but his face remained in shadows. She couldn't read it, refused to try to see anything else. Tell me what to do for you. Nothing. I'm grateful you went with me and that you brought me home. It's more than you had to do, more than can be expected of anyone. Now back off, or is that just what you expect? For me to go, to leave you alone, to take myself off to a nice, comfortable distance? Comfortable for whom, you or me? Both, I imagine. You don't think any more of me than that, any more of us? I'm awfully tired. Her voice wavered, shaming her. I'm sure you are, too. It couldn't have been pleasant for you. He stepped toward her then, and she saw what she'd known she would see, anger, black waves of it, so she shut her eyes. For God's sake, Tori, his hand brushed over her cheek, back into the wet tangle of her hair. Has everyone always let you down? She didn't speak, couldn't. A tear slid down her cheek and lay glistening on his thumb. She went, biddable as a child, as he led her to the bed, lifted her onto his lap. Just rest, he murmured. I'm not going anywhere. She pressed her face into his shoulder. Here was comfort and strength, and above all the solidity no one had ever offered her. He asked no questions, so neither would she. Instead, she curled into him, lifted her mouth to his. Touch me, please. I need to feel. Gently, so gently, he ran his hands over her. He could give her the comfort of his body, take his own in hers. Trembling, she reached for him, her lips parting under his and going warm. Slowly, so slowly, he loosened the tie of the robe, slipped it from her, laid his hand on her heart. It beat frantically, and her breathing still caught on sobs she fought back. Think of me, he murmured, and lay her on the bed. Look at me. He touched his lips to her throat, her shoulders, skimming his hands through her hair when she reached up to unbutton his shirt. I need to feel, she repeated. I need to feel you. She put her palms against his chest. You're warm. You're real. Make me real, Cade. She sank into him when his mouth came back to hers, sank deep into the tenderness of it, the kindness that erased the horror she'd seen. The calm came first, the understanding that this brush and slide of flesh, this meeting of bodies, had nothing to do with pain or fear. His mouth on her breast, feeding, arousing, sped the beat of her blood. His hand, strong, patient, washed her mind clear of everything but the need to join. She sighed out his name as she danced over the first peak. She was fluid and open, rising toward him, sliding against him. When she rolled, he found her mouth again, then let her set the pace. She rose over him, her hair like wet ropes gleaming over her shoulders. Her face was flushed with life, damp with tears. She took him into her, bowing back, her breath catching, releasing, her fingers locking with his as she began to move. There was nothing in his world now but her, the heat of her surrounding him, the steady rise and fall of her hips as she rode him. The dark smoke of her eyes stayed wide and fixed on his even as her breath began to tear. He saw her come, watched the force of it ripple through her. God, she brought their joined hands to her breasts. More, again, touch me, touch me, touch me. He took her breasts in his hands, reared up and took them into his mouth so that she arched back. When she gripped his hair, he drove deeper, filling her, taking her, taking himself. They stayed wrapped around each other. Even when he shifted to lie with her, they remained tangled and close. She breathed him in. You should sleep now, he murmured. I'm afraid to sleep. I'll be right here. I thought you would go. I know. You were so angry. I thought... No. She needed another minute. Courage didn't come without effort. Would you get me some water? All right. He shifted and rising, pulled on his jeans before he went out into the kitchen. She heard him open a cupboard for a glass, close it again, and when he came back she was sitting on the side of the bed in her robe. Thank you. Tori, are you always sick afterward? No. Her hand tightened on the glass. I've never done anything like... I can't talk about that yet, but I need to talk. I need to tell you about something else, about when I was in New York. I know what happened. It wasn't your fault. You only know parts and pieces, what you heard in the news. I need to explain. Because she'd tightened up again, he combed his fingers through her hair. You wore your hair differently there. You'd lightened it, cut it shorter. She managed to laugh. <laughs> my attempt at a new me. I like it better this way. I changed a lot more than my hair when I went there. 
escaped there. I was only 18, terrified but exhilarated. They couldn't make me go back, and even if he came after me, he couldn't make me go back. I was free. I'd saved some money. I've always been good at saving money, and Gran gave me $2,000. I suppose it saved my life. I was able to afford a little apartment, well, a room. It was on the west side, this cramped little space. I loved it. It was all mine. She could remember, could bring it back inside her, the sheer joy of standing in that empty box of a room, of hugging herself as she stared out the window at the dour brick face of the next building. She could hear the riot of noise from the street below as New York shoved its way toward the business of the day. She could remember the absolute bliss of being free. I got a job at a souvenir shop, sold a lot of Empire State Building paperweights and T-shirts. After a couple of months, I found a better job at a classy gift shop. It was a longer commute, but the pay was a little better, and it was so nice to be around all those lovely things. I was good at it. I don't doubt it. The first year, I was so happy. I was promoted to assistant manager, and I made some friends. Dated. It was so blessedly normal. I'd forget for long periods that I hadn't always lived there. Then someone would comment on my accent, and it would bring me back here. But that was all right. I'd gotten away. I was exactly where I wanted to be, who I wanted to be. She looked at him then. I didn't think of hope. I didn't let myself think of her. You had a right to your own life, Tori. That's what I told myself. God knows that's what I wanted more than anything else in the world. My own. I'd gone back to see my parents during that period, partly out of obligation, partly, too, because things never seem as bad as they were when you're away from them. I suppose I thought that since I felt so normal that I could have a normal relationship with them. She paused and shut her eyes. But mostly, I went back because I wanted to show them what I'd made of myself, despite them. Look at me. I have nice clothes, a good job, a happy life, so there. She gave a weak laugh. I failed on all three levels. No, they did. Doesn't matter. I guess I was a little off balance because of the visit, even after I got back to New York. Then one day after work, not long after that, I went by the market, picked up a few things I don't even remember exactly, but I took my bag home and started to put everything away. She looked down at her water, clear water in a clear glass. Then I was standing there in that tiny kitchen with the refrigerator open and a carton of milk in my hand. A carton of milk, she repeated, her voice hardly a whisper, with a picture of a little girl on the side, Karen Ann Wilcox, age four, missing. But I wasn't seeing the picture. I was seeing her, little Karen only she didn't have blonde hair like in the picture. It was brown and cut nearly short as a boy's. She was sitting in a room by herself playing with dolls. It was February, but I could see the sky out her window, pretty blue sky, and I could hear the water, the sea. Why, Karen Ann's in Florida, I thought. She's at the beach. And when I came back to myself, the milk carton was on the floor with the milk spilling out of it. She drank again, then set the glass aside. I was so angry. What business was it of mine? I didn't know this girl or her parents. I didn't want to know them. How dare they interfere with my life that way? Why should I have to be involved? Then I thought of hope. She rose and walked to the window. I couldn't stop thinking about her, about the little girl. I went to the police. They thought I was just one more lunatic, passed me off, rolled their eyes while they spoke very slowly as if I were stupid as well as crazy. I was embarrassed and angry, but I couldn't get the child out of my head. While two of the detectives were interviewing me, I lost my temper. I said something to one of them about how if he weren't so damned closed-minded, he'd listen instead of worrying how much the mechanic was going to hose him for over the transmission job. That got their attention. Turned out the older one, Detective Michaels, had his car in the shop. They still didn't believe me, but now I worried them. The interview turned into more of a grilling. They kept pushing and pushing, and my nerves were fraying. The younger one, I guess he was playing good cop, he went out and got me a Coke. He brought back this plastic bag, evidence bag. Inside were mittens, bright red mittens. They'd found them on the floor of Macy's where she'd been snatched while her mother was shopping at Christmas. She'd been missing since December. He tossed them on the table like a dare. She remembered his eyes, Jack's eyes, the hardness and the beautiful green brilliance of Jack's eyes. I wasn't going to pick them up. I was so angry and ashamed, but I couldn't help it. 
I picked up the bag and I saw her so clear in her little red coat. All the people crowded in trying to buy presents, the noise. Her mama was right there at the counter working on picking out a sweater, but she wasn't paying attention and the little girl wandered off, just a few feet. Then the woman came and scooped her right up. She bundled her clothes so close and tight and pushed through people and right out the door. No one paid any attention. Everyone was busy. She told Karen to be very quiet because she was taking her to see Santa Claus, and she walked very fast down the avenue, very fast, and there was a car waiting, a white Chevrolet with a dented right fender and New York plates. She let out a sigh, shook her head. <laughs> I even had the plate number. God, it was all so clear. I could feel the bite of the wind as it whipped down the street. I told them all that, told them what the woman looked like after she took off the black wig. She had light brown hair and pale blue eyes, and she was slim. She'd worn a big bulky coat with padding under it. Tori glanced over her shoulder. Cade sat on the bed, watching, listening. She'd planned this for weeks. She wanted a little girl, a pretty little girl, and she'd picked Karen out when she'd seen her mama walk her to daycare. So she took her, that's all. And she and her husband drove straight through to Florida. They cut her hair and dyed it and didn't let her go outside. They said she was a little boy named Robbie. She blinked and turned back. They found her. It took a while because I couldn't see just where, but they worked with the police in Florida, and within a couple of weeks they found her in a trailer park in Fort Lauderdale. The people who had her didn't hurt her. They bought her toys and fed her. They were sure she'd just forget. People think children forget, but they don't. She sighed. Outside, an owl began to hoot in a long bass note that echoed through the marsh and into the room where she stood. So, Karen was the first for me. Her parents came to see me after to thank me. They cried, both of them. I thought, maybe this is a gift. Maybe I'm meant to help people like this. I began to open myself to it, to explore it, even celebrate it. I read everything I could. I submitted to tests, and I began to see Jack. Detective Jack Krentz, the younger of the two cops who'd investigated the kidnapping. I fell in love with him. She came back for the water, drained the glass. There were others after Karen. I thought I'd found the reason I was what I was. I thought I had everything. I was wildly in love with the man I believed loved me and considered me a kind of partner. Now and again, he'd bring something home, ask me to hold it. I was thrilled to be able to help in his work. We did it quietly. I didn't want any credit or any notoriety. But my work with missing children leaked, so I began to get both in that area. And with it, the letters, the calls, the pleas that haunt you night and day. Still, I wanted so much to help. She set the empty glass aside, wandered away toward the window. I didn't notice the way Jack was starting to watch me. That cool-eyed stare of his, I thought it was just his way. He was the first man I'd been with, and we were together, we were lovers, for over a year when it started to fall apart. He was seeing someone else. She was there in his mind, her smell in his senses when he came to me. I was betrayed and furious, and I confronted him. Well, he was more betrayed, more furious, and much better at it. I had spied on his thoughts. I was worse than a freak. How could he have a relationship with a woman who couldn't respect his privacy, who invaded his mind? He managed to turn that one around on you. He cheats and you're wrong. Cade shook his head. You didn't buy that. I wasn't quite 22 years old. He was my first and only lover. More, I loved him. And I had, however unintentionally, spied on his thoughts. So I took the blame, but it wasn't enough. He began to berate me, to accuse me of trying to take credit for the good hard work he put into cases. Whatever he'd felt for me in the beginning had turned into something else, and it hurt both of us. And as things were falling apart between us, there was Jonah, Jonah Mansfield. She pressed a hand to her chest, squeezed her eyes shut a minute. Oh, it still breaks my heart. He was eight and had been kidnapped by his parents' former housekeeper. The police knew that. There was a ransom demand of $2 million. Jack was assigned to the team working the case. He didn't bring it to me. The Mansfields did. They asked me for help. I told them what I could. The boy was being held in some sort of basement. I didn't know if it was a home or a building, but it was across the river. Jack was furious I'd gone around him behind his back. He wouldn't listen to me. They hadn't hurt the boy, and they were prepared to give him back if the ransom was paid and if it was delivered exactly as they'd outlined. 
Was I willing to risk a child's life so I could prove what a wonder I was? That's what he asked me, and he had so eroded my confidence that I wasn't sure. She let out a shaky breath. I'm still not really sure what the answer to that question is, but I could see the boy and I could see the woman. She was going to let him go. It was only money to her and petty revenge against the Mansfields for firing her. I told them he was being treated well. He was scared, but he was all right. I told them to pay the ransom to do what she said and get their son back safe, really no more or less than what the police wanted them to do. But what I didn't see, what I didn't see because I was so devastated by Jack, was that the men working with her weren't as cool-headed as she. Her voice cracked. Oh, yes, she thought. It still breaks the heart. I told Jack there were two men, but the investigation indicated there was only one, the woman and one accomplice. I was muddying the waters, getting in the way. When the money was paid, they did what they'd planned to do, what I hadn't seen all along. They killed Jonah and the woman. She took a deep breath. I didn't know about it till I heard it on the news, until the reporters started calling me. I'd pulled back, curled up in my own little ball of misery because Jack had turned away from me. I don't know how they expected to get away. They had a van, and it seemed they planned to just drive off. But they hadn't really planned anything. It was the woman who'd laid it all out, who'd calculated the steps. But in the end, they didn't want to share the money with her. They figured they'd just drive west. But the police had trailed the money and were waiting for them. Two police officers were shot, and one of the kidnappers was fatally wounded. I hadn't seen any of that. What I'd persuaded the parents to do resulted in the death of their child. No, the kidnapping resulted in the death of their child. Circumstances, greed, fear. I couldn't have saved him. I've learned to live with that, the same way I've learned to live with not saving hope. But it left me broken. I spent weeks in the hospital, years in therapy, but I never really got it all back. Not all. Some of the blame was mine, Kay, because I was so distracted, so distraught about Jack that I didn't focus. I didn't pay enough attention. My life was falling apart, and I was desperate to keep him part of it, part of me. Even when he denounced me, helped smear me in the press, I didn't blame him. For a long, long time, I didn't blame him. Part of me still doesn't. He was more concerned about his ego than you, more concerned about his ego than that child. I don't know that. It was a difficult time. He was unhappy in our relationship and wary of me. So he left you twisting in the wind on a rope he helped make. Is that what you expect from me, Tori? It's what I expected, she said calmly. At this point, I don't know what to expect from you. I just want you to know I understand what it's like for you. No, I don't think you understand anything. He wasn't in love with you. I am. She made a sound, part gasp, part sob but stayed exactly where she was. So, he got to his feet. What are you going to do about it? I... Her throat closed. Not fear, she realized as she stared at him. It wasn't fear filling her. It was hope. Flying on it, she leaped into his arms. 23. As horrible as murder was, it was still interesting. A night's distance from it made it more like a movie than real life. Faith wasn't about to stay cooped up at Beau Rev when she could poke around in town and be in the center of the reel. Lila had seen through her, of course, and loaded her down with errands. If she was going to gossip, Lila told her when she handed over her list, she might as well be productive, too. And she shouldn't forget to report all the details when she got home again. There was plenty of gossip to be found. At the drugstore, odds were in favor of an old boyfriend who'd come to town to convince Sherry to mend things and then had gone crazy when she'd refused. After all, she'd only been in town a few weeks. A young pretty girl like that was bound to have left a boyfriend or two back home. At the post office, there was little doubt the killer had been Sherry's secret lover and the sex had gotten out of hand. No one named any likely candidates for the secret lover position, but it was a consensus over the stamp buying and certified letter sending that she'd had one. A woman who looked like that was bound to have a lover, and it was a sure bet he was married, else why had nobody known about him. This led to the theory that Sherry had threatened to go to his wife, and the ensuing argument had led to violence. The smart money picked up this theory and ran with it, putting every married man in the area between 20 and 60 on the list of suspects, with the odds favoring a teacher or administrator from Progress High. But Faith remembered what Tory had said while they sat on the grass outside Sherry's apartment and she remembered hope. 
It wouldn't hurt to stop by Southern Comfort and see what Tori had to say about things today. She stopped by the market first and soberly contemplated the bananas. A few feet away, Maxine loaded a bag with apples and sniffled. Faith edged a little closer and picked a bunch of bananas at random. Well, hi there, Maxine. You all right, honey? Maxine shook her head, blinked back fresh tears that swam into her eyes. I just can't seem to function. Wade gave me the day off because I was feeling so sad, but I couldn't stay home. Maxine, sweetie! Faith cursed her faulty internal radar when Boots Mooney guided her shopping cart into produce. She wasn't in the mood to tangle with Wade's mother again. The three carts bumped each other face to face. Boots made cooing noises and handed Maxine a hanky. It just keeps hitting me over and over, Maxine dabbed at her eyes. I told Ma I'd do the grocery shopping, and now I can't think. Boots nodded. I guess we're all upset about poor Sherry Bellas. I just don't know how it could happen. I don't understand it. It's not supposed to happen here. I know. You shouldn't be scared. Sympathetic faith rubbed Maxine's shoulder. Most people think it was a boyfriend who went crazy. She didn't have a boyfriend. Maxine fumbled in her pocket, pulled out a tattered tissue. She wasn't seeing anybody at all, but she had a little thing for Wade. Wade? Faith's hand froze, as did the expression of compassion on her face. Over Maxine's bent head, her eyes locked with boots. She liked to come in and flirt with him, started out pumping me for information about him. Not obnoxious like, Maxine added with another sniffle, but friendly, interested, you know, was he married, was he seeing someone, that kind of thing. Faith dropped her comforting hand. I see. He's so good looking, you know, I had a crush on him myself a while back, so I couldn't blame her. Remembering herself, Maxine flushed and peeked above the hanky toward Boots. Beg your pardon, Miss Boots. Wade, he never... Of course not. Boots gave Maxine's back a quick pat. Well, I'd think there was something wrong with a young woman if she didn't get herself a crush on my Wade. Her gaze drifted to Faith again, narrowed. He's a wonderful man. Yes, and he is, so you couldn't blame Sherry for having an eye for him. Really, Faith thought. Couldn't you really? And we got to be friends, Sherry and me. Maxine went on, comforted by the two sympathetic pairs of ears. She helped me study sometimes, and we were going to go out and celebrate when the semester was over. Drive down to Charleston, we thought, and go to some clubs. Said she was man-deprived just now, didn't mind so much while she'd been getting her degree and starting a career, but she was looking to start dating again. Maxine wiped her eyes again. She wanted to get married one day and have a family. We talked about it. I'm sorry, Boots answered. I didn't know you were close. She was just so nice, and she was smart, and we had a lot of things in common. She'd worked through college just like I am. We could talk about clothes and guys and just anything. We both love dogs. I don't know what's going to happen to her poor dog now. I'd take him, but I just can't. She began to weep then, as much for the dog as for her lost friend. Don't take on so, Maxine. Face radar was working now well enough for her to sense the other shoppers nudging closer to try to catch a few words. Wade will find him a good home, and the chief will figure all this out. I feel so sick inside. Just yesterday she was laughing and excited. We had lunch together in the park. She was going to go to work for Tori Bodine at the new shop, at least she hoped to. She was making all these plans. It's just that she was so alive one minute and the next. I'm just so sad and confused about it. I understand. Faith knew very well what it was like to be left behind after death. Honey, you should just go on home. Want me to take you? No, thanks. No, I think I'll just walk. I keep expecting to see her coming down the street with Mongo. I just keep expecting that, Maxine murmured, and scrubbing at tears walked toward the exit. I know, Faith said quietly and turned blindly away. She couldn't explain how much worse it was when you did see the dead every time you looked in the mirror. Here, Boots held out a second hanky. You're prepared. Annoyed with herself, Faith took it long enough to stop any damage to her mascara. I'm heartsick about that girl, and I barely knew her. To give Faith a moment to recover, Boots began to select apples. I came out myself today because I couldn't think about anything else at home. Poor little Maxine, how much harder is it on her? It was kind of you to offer to take her home. Would have gotten me out of market in duty. Boots laid a hand on Faith's arm until Faith looked at her. It was kind of you, she repeated. It's a comfort to me to see kindness in the woman my son is in love with, just as it was to see that little flash of jealousy. All in all, I'm glad I decided to give myself and J.R. a break from our diet and make apple cobbler tonight. You give my best to your mother and Lila, won't you? 
Boots glided away with her apples, leaving Faith frowning after her. Pretty sharp, aren't you, Miss Boots, for all your fluttering, Faith mumbled. Pretty goddamn sharp. Irritated, Faith pushed her cart through produce, plucking up Lila's items and wishing she'd skip the damn market altogether. She had been jealous, damn it. Had Wade flirted back? She scowled at the boxes of butter and dairy. Of course he had. He was a man. Very likely he'd considered doing more than flirting. The bastard. How many times had he imagined Sherry naked, fantasized about getting her that way, and then... Good Christ, what was she doing, working herself up into a mad on weight over a dead woman? How petty, how shallow, how horrible could she be? Faith, what? She snapped it out, whirled with a box of Land O'Lakes in her hand and a killing glare on her face. Dwight held up a hand for peace. Whoa, sorry. No, I'm sorry, my mind was on something. Making the effort, she put a bright smile on her face and bent down to the toddler riding in the basket seat. And aren't you the handsome thing? You and Daddy doing the marketing today? Luke held up an open box of Oreos. Got cookies, he announced, and as his face was already smeared with black, he'd been enjoying them. So I see. His mama's going to scout me if I don't clean him up before she sees him. Faces wash, but Faith moved strategically out of the reach of chocolate-gunked fingers. Lucy got you doing the shopping today? She's not feeling well, got herself in a state about what happened yesterday. She says she's afraid to set foot outside the house and had me checking locks six times last night. And wasn't it just like Lissy Frazier to make it all about her, Faith thought, but nodded sympathetically. I guess it makes us all a little edgy. She's a bundle of nerves right now. I'm that worried about her, Faith, seeing as she's got another month or so before the baby comes. Her mother's over there, staying with her a while. I figured the champ and me... He paused to ruffle Luke's hair. We'd take ourselves off for a while, give her some peace and quiet. Aren't you the good daddy? Have you heard any more about where things stand? Carl D's investigating, and he isn't sharing a lot. I guess it's too soon for that. I guess they'll get the autopsy results soon. Carl D's a good man, don't mean to say otherwise, but this sort of thing. He trailed off, shook his head. It's not what he's used to dealing with. None of us is. It's not the first time it's happened. He glanced back, looking blank for a minute, then his eyes clouded. I'm sorry, Faith, I wasn't thinking. This must bring back bad memories for you. The memories are always there. I just hope they catch this one, catch him and hang him by the toes and cut off his, uh, lips twisted into a pained smile. Dwight squeezed her arm and rolled his eyes toward its son. Little ears. Sorry, she said, as Luke decorated his dandelion puff hair with the best part of an Oreo. Honey, Lissy's going to stomp you into the ground till your ears bleed if you bring her boy home in that shape. I ought to get points for bringing home groceries. You get minor points for that. We're talking major here, for major tri jewelry. Well, you'd know, Dwight scratched his head. Actually, I was thinking of hunting her up a present and take her mind off her worries. Thought I'd stop by the drugstore and find some perfume. They haven't got anything special in there. Old lady scents, mostly. You go by Tori's place and you'll find what you're looking for. Put a smile back on Lissy's face. Dwight took a good look at Luke, who was now happily coating the red plastic handle of the cart with black Oreo goo. You think I'm taking this bull calf in that china shop? You got a point there. The plan that formulated in her mind pleased her very much. I'll tell you what we'll do, Dwight. You give me the money, and I'll go on in and find something that'll make you a hero. When you're done marketing and scrape a few layers of cookie off your Luke, you just come by and I'll run it out to you. Really? You wouldn't mind? I was going by anyway. Besides, what are friends for? She held out her hand, palm up. Good thing I just went to the bank. I got cash. Delighted, he took out his wallet, counted bills into her hand. When he stopped, she simply stared balefully at him. Cough it up, Dwight. You can't be a hero for under two hundred. Two hundred? Jesus, Faith. You'll take all but my last dollar here. Looks like you'll have to go to the bank again. She snatched the bills out of his wallet while he winced. That'll give me more time to find just the right thing. What about your groceries here? He called after her. Oh, she waved dismissively. I'll come back later on. Dwight blew out a breath, put his nearly empty wallet back in his pocket. I think, he told his son, we've just been hosed. It was perfect, Faith decided. She could go in, pick Tori's brain, and do a good deed. Then it was only a hop and skip down to Wade's office. She'd have time to decide whether to punish him for making her imagine him imagining sex with Sherry Bellows. Couldn't have worked out better. 
This time she took B out of the car, snuggling, cooing. Now you're going to be a good girl, aren't you, so mean old Tori won't complain. You sit like a sweetheart and I'll give you a nice chewy bone. That's Mama's baby. Don't you bring that dog in here again. Instantly, Tori was out from behind the counter, ready to block Faith as she came in. Oh, stop being so pissy. She's going to sit right here like a doll, baby, aren't you, Bee, honey? She lifted one of the puppy's paws, waved it while they both stared at Tori with equally innocent expressions. Damn it, Faith. She's just as good as gold. You watch. She dug out the bone first as insurance, then set Bee down, pressing her rump until it hit the floor. Besides, what kind of welcome is that when I have a mission and cash, she said, pulling out the water bills. If that dog pees on my floor, she's got too much dignity for that. I'm doing Dwight a little favor. Lissy's feeling poorly, and he wants to cheer her up with a nice present. Tori blew out of breath, but she calculated the number of bills Faith was cheerfully waving. House or body decoration? Body. Let's have a look. Good thing Dwight ran into me. Men don't have a clue about such things most of the time, and Lissy's taste is all in her mouth, and it's not so keen there. Faith paused at the display case, lifted her eyebrows. Was that a snicker? I have too much dignity for that. You ask me, you got too much dignity for your own good. Let's see that necklace there, the one with the pink topaz and moonstones. You know your rocks. Bet your ass a woman wants to know if some man's trying to pass off a peridot for an emerald. This is nice. She held it up, let the light play over it. But I think it's too much metal for her, really more my style. Is this how you accomplish a mission? I can do more than one thing at a time. Let's just put this aside here so I can think about it. She wandered down the case. You doing all right? Yes. Well, don't actually try to have a conversation and spoil your record. Tori opened her mouth, shut it again, blew out a breath. I'm all right. A little shaky inside, I guess, but all right. How about you? Faith glanced up, smiled thinly. See, your tongue didn't turn black and fall out or anything. I'm well enough. Been gathering the gossip as I go. And don't bother to look down your nose. You're as interested in what people are saying as I am. I've heard what they're saying. I've had considerable traffic in here today. People love to come in and get a look at me, then flap about it all. It's different for you, Faith. You're one of them. I'm not. I don't know why I thought I ever could be. I can't understand why you'd want to be. But if you do, you just have to stick with it. People get used to you around here. They'd get used to a one-eyed midget with a limp if he lived here long enough. Well, that's comforting. Let's see this bracelet. Cade seems to have gotten used to you mighty fast. Pink and blue topaz in silver, lobster claw clasp. Very nice, very lissy. Those earrings there, she'd want them to match. She doesn't have the imagination for otherwise. Seems odd you taking the time to pick out gifts for her when you don't appear to like her. Oh, I don't dislike her. Faith pursed her lips and considered the earrings. She's too silly for me to work up the energy to dislike. Always was. She makes Dwight happy, and I like him. Box these up and wrap them up pretty. Dwight'll owe me big. I think I'll take this necklace for myself. Cheer up my mood. You're turning into my best customer. Tori carried the jewelry to her counter. Hard to figure. You have things I admire in here. B had fallen asleep with the bone in her mouth. Faith stopped long enough to beam at her in adoration. Plus, you seem to be making Cade happy, and I like him even more than I like Dwight. She leaned on the counter while Tori boxed Lissy's gifts. Fact is, you're sleeping with my brother, I'm sleeping with your cousin. Well, <laughs> that practically makes us lovers. Faith blinked, snorted, then threw back her head and laughed. Christ, that's a frightening thought, and here I was wondering if I should consider us being friends. Another frightening thought, isn't it? Still, it occurred to me yesterday when we were sitting out there that you and I were probably feeling the same thing, thinking the same thing, remembering the same thing. That's a powerful connection. Tori tied the cord very carefully, very precisely. It was very considerate of you to stay with me. I tell myself often that it's better to be alone, but it's difficult. Sometimes it's very difficult. I hate to be alone more than anything else in the world. I am so often irritated by my own company. She caught herself and laughed. Well, listen to us having almost an intimate conversation. I'm going to give you Dwight's nice fresh cash for Lissy's, but I'll charge mine. Before she could reach into her purse, Tori reached out, laid a hand on hers. Odd how it had become easier to touch, to be touched, since she'd come back to progress. In my life, I never had another friend like Hope. I don't know as any of us ever have friends the way we do as children. But I could use a friend. 
flustered face stared at her. I don't know that I make a particularly good one. I know I haven't, not since Hope, so that starts us on level ground. I think I'm in love with your brother. She let out a long, shaky breath, moved her hand to keep it busy. If it turns out I am, I think it would be nice for everyone if you and I could be friends. I know I love my brother, though he's a regular pain in my ass. Life has some awfully screwy angles. Faith laid Dwight's money down, took out her credit card. You close up at six, don't you? That's right. Why don't you meet me after work? We'll have us a drink. All right, where? Faith's eyes glittered. Oh, I think Hope Memorial would be appropriate. I'm sorry. In the swamp. You know where. For God's sake, Faith. Haven't been there yet, have you? Well, it's time, I'd say, and it strikes me as a good spot to see if you and I turn a corner. Got the belly for it? Tori snapped up the credit card. I do if you do. She hauled groceries home and met Lila's complaint about her late arrival with just enough bitchiness at being given the chore in the first place to satisfy them both. And don't start yapping that the tomatoes are too soft or the bananas too green or next time I won't be your errand girl. You eat, don't you? Don't do another damn thing around here I can see so you can haul the food in once in a blue moon. The moon turns blue around here more than it used to. Faith got out the iced tea, two glasses, then settled down to relay the gossip. So, Lila sat down, shifted comfortably. What are they saying? All manner of things, most of which are as far-fetched as a liberal Republican. A lot of people are saying it must have been an old boyfriend or a lover, a new married lover. But I ran into Maxine in produce, and it turns out she was friends with Sherry, and she says Sherry didn't have a boyfriend just now. Don't mean some idiot man didn't think he should be. Lila took out her lipstick, twirling the tube up and down. I heard she let him in, though, because her dog didn't send up a racket and there wasn't no break-in like people thought at first. Letting a man into your house doesn't mean you want him to rape you. Didn't say so. Lila colored her lips, rubbed them together. Just saying a woman's got to be careful. You open a door for a man, you better be ready to boot his ass right back out again. You're such a romantic, Lila. I got plenty of romance in me, Miss Faith. I just balance it with good hard sense. Something you're missing when it comes to men. Maybe that poor girl was missing it, too. I've been sensible enough to kick plenty of them out on their ass. Had to go and marry two of them first, though, didn't you? Faith took out a cigarette, smiled blandly. I could have married more than two, at least I'm not a spinster. Lila met the smile equably. Marriage was all it's cracked up to be it last longer. That girl, she didn't have an ex-husband, did she? No, I don't think so. Faith? Margaret stood in the doorway, her face rigid. I need to speak with you in the parlor. All right. Faith rolled her eyes at Lila, crushed out her cigarette. I should have found more to do in town. You show your mama some respect. It would certainly be a shock to the system if she did the same for me. She took her time wandering to the parlor, stopped once to check her manicure, another to smooth her hair in the hall mirror. When she walked in, her mother was sitting stiff as dry plaster. I don't approve of you gossiping with the servants. I wasn't. I was gossiping with Lila. Don't take that tone with me. Lila may be a valued member of this household, but it's inappropriate for you to sit in the kitchen and gossip. Is it appropriate for you to eavesdrop? Faith slumped into a chair. I'm 26 years old, Mama. It's a long time since it would do you a lick of good to lecture me on behavior. It never did any good. I'm told that you were with Victoria Bodine yesterday, that you were together and were responsible for contacting the police. That's right. It's distressing enough that you have any connection with a situation as unseemly as this, but it's intolerable that you are now linked with that woman. That woman being Tory rather than the one who was raped and murdered? Faith's spine stiffened, but she remained lazily slumped. I will not have it. I will not have you associating with Victoria Bodine. Or? Faith waited a beat. You see... There aren't any oars at this point in our lives, Mama. I come and go when I please, and with whom? I always did, but now you really have nothing to say about it. I would think out of respect for your sister, you would sever any connection, however tenuous it is, with the person I hold responsible for her death. Maybe it's out of respect for my sister that I've made this connection. You never could stand her, Faith said conversationally. I took your lead there, I suppose. You would have forbidden Hope to associate with her, but you could never really bring yourself to forbid Hope in anything. 
and if you did, she got around you. She was infinitely more clever than I in that area. Don't speak of my daughter in that manner. Yes, your daughter. Now the brittle tone reflected in her eyes, something I have never quite managed to be. Here's something you may never have considered. Tori isn't responsible for what happened to Hope, but she may very well be the key to it. It might bring you comfort to remember Hope as a bright light, as a life cut off before it really lived. It would bring me more comfort to finally know why and know who. You won't find your comfort or your answers with that woman. You'll only find lies. Her whole life is a lie. Well then, with a bright smile, Faith got to her feet. Just gives us one more thing in common, doesn't it? She walked away, putting a swagger in her step. Margaret got immediately to her feet, walked quickly out and into the library with its towers of books and ornately plastered ceiling. She made the call first, tugging on the strings of friendship to request that Gerald Purcell come to her as soon as possible. Assured he would make the trip within the hour, she walked to the safe secreted behind an oil painting of Beau Rev and took out two folders. She would use the hour to study the paperwork and prepare. Shortly, she ordered tea to be served on the South Terrace along with scones and the frosted cake she knew Gerald had a weakness for. She enjoyed the ritual in the afternoons when she was at home, the china, the silver, the precisely cut wedges of lemon, the mix of brown and white sugar cubes in the bowl. As long as she was mistress of this house, she thought it was a ritual that would be preserved. Beaurev and all it stood for would be preserved. It was warm for tea al fresco, but the white umbrella offered shade, and the gardens provided what Margaret considered the appropriate backdrop. The tree roses that flanked the brick in their giant white pots were heavy with bloom, and her hibiscus added an exotic touch with their crimson trumpets. She sat at the rippled glass table, hands folded, and looked out over what was hers. She had worked for it, nurtured it, and now, as always, she would protect it. She glanced over as Gerald came through the terrace doors. He'd roast in the suit and tie, she thought idly, as she lifted a hand to his. I appreciate your coming so quickly. You'll have some tea? That would be lovely. You sounded troubled, Margaret. I am troubled. But her hand was rock steady as she lifted the Wedgwood teapot and poured. It concerns my children and Beau Rev itself. You were Jasper's attorney, so you understand the disposition of the farm, the properties, the interest of this family, as well as any of us, perhaps better. Of course. He sat beside her, pleased that she remembered he preferred lemon to milk. Controlling interest in the farm was passed to Kincaid, 70%. That holds true for the factories, the mill as well. I hold 20% and Faith 10. That's correct. The profits are divided and dispersed annually. I'm aware of that. The properties, such as our interest in the apartment buildings, the houses that are rented, including the Marsh House, are in all three names equally. Is that also correct? Yes. And, in your opinion, what impact would it have on Cade's changes to the farm, his new operating system, if I withdrew my support, used my 20% and my influence with the board to sway them back toward more traditional methods? It would cause him considerable difficulty, Margaret, but his weight is heavier than yours and the profits add to his end of the scale. The board has no say in the farm in any case, just the mill and the factories. She nodded. And the mill, the factories help keep the farm running. If I were able to persuade Faith to add her interest to mine, that would give you more ammunition, certainly. He sipped his tea, pondered. Might I ask, as your friend and your lawyer, if you're dissatisfied with Cade's performance at Beau Rev? I am dissatisfied with my son, and I believe he needs to put his mind and energies back into his inheritance without having it diverted into less worthy channels. Simply, she said as she buttered a scone. I want Victoria Bodine out of the Marsh House, out of progress. At the moment, Faith is being difficult, but she will come around. She's always been a creature of the moment. I believe I can persuade her to sell me her interest in the properties. That would give me a two-thirds control. I would assume that the Bodine girl has a year's lease on the house and on the building on market. I want those leases broken. Margaret, he patted her hand. You would be wise to let this lay. I will not tolerate her association with my son. I will do whatever is necessary to end it. I want you to draw up a new will for me, cutting both Cade and Faith off. He thought of the scandal, the legal tangles, the vicious amount of work. Margaret, please don't be rash. I won't implement the will unless I have no choice. 
but I will use it to show Faith just how serious I am. Margaret's mouth thinned. I have no doubt that when she realizes she stands to lose such a large sum of money, she will become very cooperative. I want my house back in order, Gerald. It would be a great favor to me if you looked over those leases and found the simplest way to break them. You risk turning your son against you. Better that than watching him drag down the family name. 24. I have not since childhood kept a diary or a journal, or written down my secret thoughts. It seems appropriate, since my childhood is so on my mind, to do so now, and to do so here where Hope lost her life, her childhood. My papa, our papa, made this place for her with its pretty statue and its sweet-smelling flowers. It is more hers than the grave where he buried her on that steamy and sick-skied summer morning. I never shared this place with her. I chose not to, out of spite, certainly, but it gave me great satisfaction at the time. What did I want with her silly games and her odd and unkempt friend? I wanted them so desperately I refused to take them when they were offered. I am a difficult person. Sometimes I like myself that way. In any case, it is my nature to be contrary, so I of all people must live with it. It might have been very different for me, for all of us, if that night had never happened. If, when I'd woken in the morning, hope had been in the next room. I would still have been sulking over my disgrace the night before. That had been a minor combat over peas, which I despised then and despise now. I would have sulked because I found some pleasure in that activity, particularly when someone put in the effort to win me out of my pouts. I enjoyed the attention, most any kind of attention I could manage. I knew even then that in the pecking order of siblings I came in a lowly third out of three. Cade was the heir apparent. He, after all, possessed a penis, and I did not. This, I suppose, was no fault of his, but I did indeed envy him that member for a short time in my youth, until, of course, I learned that it was more than possible for a woman to possess as many of those interesting appendages as she liked, and in such a pleasant variety of ways. I discovered sex early and have enjoyed it without apology. In any case, at eight, the sexual connotations of men and women were still a foggy area for me. I only knew that Cade was the master in training of Beau Rev because he was a boy, and this did not sit well with me. He was afforded privileges I was denied, again because of his gender, and I supposed to be fair because of the four-year difference in our ages. My father looked on him with such pride. Certainly he demanded quite a bit from Cade, but the look in Papa's eyes, the tone of his voice, the very posture of his body was a study in pride. Father for son. I could never be his son. Nor could I be, as Hope was, his angel. He adored her. He had love for me, and he was a fair man, but it was painfully obvious that it was Hope who held his heart, even as Cade held, well, his hopes. I was a kind of bonus, I imagine, the twin who came in tow with his angel. With my mother, Cade was also, I think, a source of pride. She had produced the son, as was expected of her. The Lavelle name would carry on because she had conceived and birthed a male. She was happy enough to give the dealing with him over to my father for the most part. What did she know of boys, after all? I wonder if Cade felt this smooth and easy distance. I imagine he did, but somehow he became a whole and an admirable man despite it. Because of it. Naturally, Mama schooled him in manners, saw to his cleanliness, but his education, his time, his lot in life were my father's bailiwick. I don't remember ever hearing her question Papa about Cade. Hope was her reward for a job well done, the daughter she could polish and mold, the child she would see from babyhood through to a proper marriage. She loved Hope for her sweetness and her quiet acquiescence, and she never saw, never, the rebel inside. Had Hope lived, I believe she would have done precisely what she pleased and somehow have convinced Mama it was Mama's own idea. She got around her with Tory. She could get around her with anything. God, I miss her. I miss that half of me that was bright and fun and eager. I miss her outrageously. Myself, I was a trial to Mama. How often I have heard her say so, therefore it must be true. I had none of Hope's sweetness nor her quiet acquiescence. I questioned, and I fought bitterly over things I didn't even care about. Notice me, damn you all, notice me. How sad and pitiful. Hope became friends with Tori a year before that summer. They were simply drawn together as some souls are. 
Even I could see the recognition between them, that click of connection. And they were, almost from the first, inseparable, more twins than my sister and I had ever been. For that reason alone, I disliked Victoria Bodine intensely. I turned my nose up at her and her dirty feet and poor grammar, at her big watchful eyes and white trash parents, but it was her closeness with hope that was at the root of it. I made fun of her as often as I possibly could and ignored her the rest of the time, pretended to ignore her. In fact, I watched her and hope with hawk-like concentration, looking for a fissure, for some crack in their bond that I could pry wider so that their affection for each other shattered. They played together on the day she died at our house, as Hope was strictly forbidden to go to Tories. She did go, of course, in secret, but they spent most of their time together in and around Beau Rev, or in the swamp. Mama didn't know about the swamp. She would not have approved. But we all wandered there, played there. Papa knew it, and only asked that we not go in after dark. Before supper, Hope played jacks on the veranda. I was punishing her by not playing with her. When this didn't appear to spoil her pleasure in the game, I went to my room to sulk and didn't come down until I was called to supper. I wasn't hungry, and I was still in a vile mood over Hope's blithe acceptance of my anger with her. I took it out on myself by making an issue of the peas, though I continued to contend I had a right there, then ended up sassing my mother and being sent from the table. I hated being sent from the table. Not that I cared over much about the food, but it was banishment. I imagine a therapist would say that this tactic proved to me that I was not a part of the family as my brother and sister were. I was the outsider who on one hand reveled in my independence of them and on the other wanted desperately to be part of the picture. I went to my room as if that's where I wanted to be in the first place. I was determined they would think so and not suspect that I was as mortified as I was angry. A small hill of peas was more important than I was. I laid on the bed, stared at the ceiling, and surrounded myself with resentment. One day, I thought, one day I would be free to do as I liked, when I liked. No one would stop me, least of all the family who so easily dismissed me. I would be rich and famous and beautiful. I had no clear idea how I would accomplish these things, but they were my goal. I saw money and glory and beauty as a kind of prize I would win, while the rest of them stayed steeped in the traditions and the restrictions of Beau Rev. I considered running away, perhaps landing on my Aunt Rosie's doorstep. That, I knew, would hit my mother where she lived as she considered her sister Rosie nothing more than an embarrassment, somewhat like me. But I didn't want to leave. I wanted them to love me, and that urgent and frustrated desire was my prison. Later on, I heard my mother's music. She would have been in her sitting room writing letters, answering invitations, planning the next day's menus, schedules, and whatever else she did as mistress of the house— my father would have been in his tower office seeing to the business of the farm and having a quiet glass of bourbon. Lila snuck me in some supper, minus the peas. She didn't coax and cuddle, but simply by that one small act stroked me. Bless her, she's always been there, steady as a rock and warm as toast. I ate because she'd brought it to me and because it was a rebellion both of us shared in secret. After I lay there as the room grew dark, I imagined Mama brushing Hope's hair as she did every night after bath time. She would have brushed mine as well, to be fair, but I wouldn't sit still for it. She would have gone up to Papa after, Hope would, to say good night. And all the while she was doing what was expected of her, she was planning her own secret rebellion. I heard her walk down the hallway and pause at my room. I wish, it does no good to wish, but I wish I had gotten up, opened the door, and browbeat her into coming in to keep me company. It might have made a difference. She would have felt sorry for me, and she might have told me what she was going to do. In my state of mind, I might have gone along with her just to thumb my nose at Mama. She wouldn't have been alone. But I stayed grimly stubborn in my bed and listened to her walk away. I didn't know she left the house. I might have looked out my window any time and seen her, but I didn't. Instead, I scowled into the dark until I slept. And while I slept, she died. I didn't feel, as it's often said twins do, a break in the thread between us. I didn't experience a premonition or dream of disaster. I didn't feel her pain or her fear. I slept on, as I expect most children do, deeply and carelessly, while the person who shared womb and birth with me died alone. It was Tori who felt that break, that pain and fear. I didn't believe it then, didn't choose to. Hope was my sister, not hers, and how dare she claim to have been such an intimate part of what was mine. I preferred to believe, as many others did, that Tori had indeed been in the swamp that night and had run away and left hope to face terror. 
I believed this even though I saw her the next morning. She came limping down our lane early in the morning. She walked like an old woman as if each step was an effort of courage. It was Kate who opened the door for her, but I had tiptoed out to the top of the stairs. Her face was pale as death itself, her eyes huge. She said, Hope's in the swamp. She couldn't get away, and he hurt her. You have to help. I think he asked her in politely, but she wouldn't come across the threshold. So he left her there, and as I raced back to my own room, he went to look into Hope's. It all happened quickly then, Kate running back down, calling for Papa. Mama ran down. Everyone was talking at once and paid no mind to me. Mama took Tori's shoulder, shook her, shouted at her. All the while, Tori just stood, a rag doll well used to, I suppose, being kicked. It was Papa who pulled Mama off, who told her to call the police right away. It was he who questioned Tori in a voice that wasn't quite steady. She told him of their plans the night before and how she hadn't gone because she'd fallen and hurt herself. But Hope had gone, and someone had come after her. She said all this in a dull and calm voice, an adult's voice, and she kept her eyes on Papa's face the whole time and told him she could take him to Hope. I learned later that's exactly what she did, led Papa and Cade, then the police who followed, through the swamp to Hope. Life was forever altered for all of us. Faith lowered the pad, leaned back on the bench. She could hear the twitter of birds now and smell the perfume of dark earth and ripe flowers. Slivers of sunlight shimmered through the tangled canopy of branches and moss to dapple on the ground in pretty patterns and turn the green light into something that just hinted of gold. The marble statue stayed silent, forever smiling, forever young. It was so like Papa, she thought, to cover the hideous with the lovely. A pretense, perhaps, but a statement as well. Hope had lived, she imagined him thinking, and she was mine. Had he brought his woman here, she wondered. Had the woman he'd turned to when he'd turned from his family sat here with him while he reminisced and remembered and grieved? Why her instead of me? Why had it never been me? Faith set the notepad aside, took out a cigarette. The tears came as a complete surprise. She had no idea they were in there, burning to be shed. Shed for hope, for her father, for herself, for the waste of lives and dreams, for the waste of love. Tori stopped at the edge of a bank of impatience. The quiet, flower-strewn park was enough of a shock. Her mind slid the image of how it had been, green and wild and dark, over the one in front of her eyes. They tangled, refused to merge, so she blinked the memory away. There was hope, trapped forever in stone. And there was faith, weeping. Her stomach muscles danced uneasily, but she made herself walk forward, shivering as images of what had happened there eighteen years before fought to take over. She sat. She waited. I don't come here. Faith dug a tissue out of her purse, blew her nose. I suppose this is why. I don't know if this is a horrible place or a beautiful one. I can never make up my mind. It takes courage to take something ugly and make it peaceful. Courage? Faith stuffed the tissue back in her purse, then lighted her cigarette in one sharp motion. You think this was brave? I do. Braver than I could be. Your father was a good man. He was always very kind to me, even after... She pressed her lips together. Even after, he was nothing but kind to me. It couldn't have been easy to be kind. He deserted us emotionally, the psychologist would say, I expect. He abandoned us for his dead daughter. I don't know what to say to you. Neither of us has ever dealt with the loss of a child. We can't know how we would cope with it or what we would do to survive that loss. I lost a sister. So did I, Tori said quietly. I resent your saying that. I resent more knowing it's true. Do you expect me to blame you for that? I don't know what I expect from you. On a sigh, she reached down for the cooler she'd set beside the bench. What I have here is a nice big jug of margaritas, a good drink on a warm evening. She poured the lime green liquid into two plastic cups, offered one. I did say we'd have a drink. So you did. To hope, then. Faith touched her glass to Tori's. It seems appropriate. It has more bite than the lemonade we'd usually drink here. She liked her lemonade. Lila would make it for her fresh, plenty of pulp and sugar. She had a bottle of Coke that night, gone warm in her adventure kit, and she... Tori trailed off and shivered again. Do you see it, that clear still? Yes. I'd appreciate it if you didn't ask me. 
I didn't come here in all the weeks I've been back. I haven't come. I haven't had the courage for it. As much as I dislike being a coward, I have to survive, too. People put too much emphasis, too many demands on courage, and they all put their own standards on it anyway. I wouldn't call you a coward, but I do keep my personal standards low. <laughs> Tori let out half a laugh and drank again. Why? Well, then I can meet them, can't I, without undue effort? Take my marriage as though God knows I wish I hadn't. She gestured grandly with her cup. Some would say I'd failed in them, but I say I triumphed by getting out of them as unscathed as I did. Were you in love? Which time? Either, both. Neither. I was in heavy lust the first time around. God Almighty, that boy could fuck like a rabbit. As sex has been for some time a priority pleasure for me, he certainly fulfilled that part of the bargain. He was dangerously handsome, full of charm and fast talk, and a complete asshole. She toasted him absently, almost affectionately. However, he fit the bill of being exactly what my mother despised. How could I not marry him? You could have just had sex. I did, but then marriage was a real slap in her face. Take this, Mama. Faith tipped her head back and laughed. Christ, what an idiot. Now the second time it was more impulse. Well, and there was that sex angle again. It was still perfectly inappropriate as he was much too old for me and married when we began our affair. I suppose that one was a little shot at my father. You enjoyed adultery, well, so can I. Now, an illicit affair is one thing, but marriage to a philanderer is another. I believe he was faithful enough for the first little while, but my God, I was bored. And then I suppose he was just as bored and thought he'd follow his song lyrics by cheating on me, drinking himself blind. He'd made a bit of a mark in the music scene. The first time he decided to take a swing at me, I swung harder. Then I walked. I got a nice chunk of money out of the divorce and earned every penny. She and Hope had sat here, Tori thought, and talked about things they'd done, wanted to do. Simpler things, childhood things, but no less vital, no less intimate than what Faith spoke of now. Why Wade? I don't know. Faith let out a breath, sipped from her plastic glass. That's the puzzle and the worry. It's not for gain or spite. He's pretty to look at, and we do have amazing sex, but the town vet? That was never in my plans. Now he has to complicate everything by being in love with me. I'll ruin his life. She chugged the margarita, poured a second. I'm bound to. That would be his problem. Struck, Faith turned her head and stared. Now that is the last thing I expected you to say. He's a grown man who knows his own mind and his own heart. It appears to me he's always done what he wanted and gotten what he wanted. Could be he knows you better than you think. Then again, I don't understand men. Oh, that's easy, she topped off Tori's glass. Half the time they think with their dicks and the other half they're thinking of their toys. That's not very kind from a woman with a brother and a lover. Nothing unkind about it. I love men. Some would say I've loved entirely too many. There was a wicked gleam of humor in her eyes and no apology whatsoever. Tori found herself enjoying it and envying it. I've always preferred men for company, Faith added. Women are so much more sly than men and tend to view other women as rivals. Men look at other men as competitors, which is entirely different. You, however, are not sly. It's taken too much effort, I realize, to dislike and resent you. And that's the basis for this moratorium? You have a better one? Faith lifted a shoulder, then picked up the notepad. I had an urge to write some things down, and I rarely ignore my urges. Why don't you read this? All right. Faith pushed to her feet, wandered with her drink and her smoke. She imagined she'd done more serious thinking that day than she had in a very long time, honest and serious thinking. She hadn't solved anything, but she felt stronger for it. Wouldn't it be odd if Tori's coming back to progress had started her on the road to finding contentment in her own life? She paused by the statue of her sister, looked at the face they had once shared. Wouldn't it be, she mused, the ultimate irony, if she found herself now, just when she realized she'd been looking all along? She glanced back at Tori, so cool, she thought, so calm on the surface with all those violent ripples and jolts underneath. It was admirable, really, the way Tori maintained that shield and didn't turn brittle behind it. Spooky, Faith thought with a little smile, but not brittle. Brittle, she thought, was what her own mother had become, and brittle was what she herself had been on the edge of becoming. How strange and somehow apt that it was Tori who'd given her just enough of a jolt to break her stride before she'd rushed headlong into being what she'd fought against all her life, a warped mirror image of her own mother. 
She crushed her cigarette out, toted under pine needles. Maybe I should take up right, and Faith said lightly as she strolled back. You appear to be riveted. She'd been caught up, sliding into the rhythm of Faith's words and the images they had running through her mind. She'd been both amused and sad. Then the pressure had come, the weight on her chest that caused her heart to beat too fast and hard. The place, she'd thought, the memories that pounded fists on the white wall of her defense. She wouldn't answer them, wouldn't heed them. She would stay in the here and the now. But the cold skinned over her and the dark crept toward the edges of her vision. The notebook slipped from her fingers, fell on the ground at her feet where a tiny breeze toyed with the pages. She was going under, being dragged under. Someone's watching. Hmm? Honey, you've only had two glasses of this stuff, haven't you? That's a mighty cheap drunk. Someone's watching. She took Faith's hand and her grip was like iron. Run. You have to run. Oh, shit. Out of her depth, Faith bent over, tapped her hand on Tori's cheek. Come on back now. Get hold of yourself. He's watching, in the trees. He's waiting for you. You have to run. There's nobody here but us. But a chill worked through her. I'm Faith. I'm not Hope. Faith. Tori struggled to keep the pictures clear, to hold yesterday and today separate. He's back in the trees. I can feel him. He's watching. Run. Alarm rushed into her eyes, turning them big and bright. She could hear it now, just the faintest rustle from the brush beyond the clearing. Panic wanted to seize her. The cold fingertips of it scraped her skin. There are two of us, goddammit, she hissed it out as she snatched up her purse, and we're not eight years old and helpless. Run my ass. She pulled her pretty pearl-handled twenty-two out of her bag and hauled Tori to her feet. Oh, my God. You snap out of it, Faith ordered. We're going after him. Are you crazy? Now that's a pot call in the kettle. Come on out, you limp dick son of a bitch. She heard the snap of a twig, the swish of leaves, and charged forward. He's running, bastard. Faith, don't. But she was already racing into the trees. Left with no choice, Tori rushed after her. The path narrowed, all but died out in a tangle of underbrush. Birds shot toward the sky like bullets, screaming in protest. Moss dripped down, caught in Tori's hair. She batted at it as she sprinted to catch up to Faith. I think he went toward the river. We might not catch him, but we'll scare his sorry ass. She pointed the gun toward the sky and pulled the trigger. Gunshots blasted, echoed, and seemed to vibrate through Tori down to the toes. Birds exploded out of trees and rushed the clouds. At the sound of splashing, Faith grinned like a lunatic. Maybe he'll end up gator bait. Come on! Tori could smell the river, the warm ripeness of it. The ground went soggy under her feet, had Faith sliding like a skater. For God's sake, be careful, you shoot yourself. I can handle a damn piss ant gun like this. But her breath was heaving as much from the flood of emotion as the run. You know the swamp better than I do. You take the lead. Put the safety on that thing. I don't care to get shot in the back. Tori caught her own breath, pushed the tangled hair out of her face. We can cut this way, toward the river, save time. Watch for snakes. God, I knew there was a reason I hated this place. The first rush of adrenaline was gone, and in its place was an innate disgust for anything that crawled or skittered. But Tori was pushing ahead, and pride left her no choice but to follow through. What was it about this place that appealed to you and Hope? It's beautiful and wild. She heard footsteps, heavy, deliberate, and threw up a hand. Someone's coming from the river. Double back, Diddy. Faith planted her feet and lifted the gun. I'm ready for him. Show yourself, you son of a bitch. I got a gun, and I'll use it. There was a thump as if something had fallen or been dropped. Christ Jesus, don't shoot. You step out and you show yourself. Right now. Don't go taking pot shots. Holy God, Miss Faith, is that you? Miss Faith, it's just Piney, Piney Cobb. He eased out from the trees with his back to the curve of the river where cypress knees speared the surface. His hand shook as he held them high. What the hell were you doing sneaking around in here watching us? I wasn't. I swear to God. Didn't know you were hereabouts till I heard the shots. Scared me down to the skin. Didn't know whether to run or hide. I've just been frogging, that's all. Been frogging the last hour or so. The boss, he don't mind if I do some frogging in here. Then where are the frogs? Got the bag right over there. Dropped it when you called out. You scared ten years off me, Miss Faith. Tori saw nothing in his face but fear. Felt nothing from him but panic. He smelled of sweat and whiskey. Let's see the bag. Okay, all right. It's right back here. Licking his lips, he pointed with one finger. You be real careful how you step, Piney. I'm awful nervous right now and my finger's liable to shake.
She kept the gun aimed while Tori moved forward. See here, see? Been frogging with this old burlap sack. Tori crouched down, looked inside. Perhaps half a dozen unhappy frogs looked back at her. This is a pretty pitiful haul for an hour's work. Lost most of them when I dropped the bag. Dropped it twice, he added, as a flush worked up his neck. Tell you true, I damn near shit a brick when that gun went off. Thought I heard somebody running off that away. Barely had time to wonder on it when the gunfire started. I figured I'd best get myself out of harm's way, nice and quiet. Maybe somebody's target shooting like Mr. Cade and his friends used to, and I could catch a stray bullet if I wasn't careful. I do some frogging every couple of weeks. You can ask Mr. Cade if that ain't so. What do you think? Faith asked Tori. I don't know. He has frogs, such as they are. He wasn't a young man, she thought, but he knew this swamp, and his muscles were tough from field work. Still, nothing could be proved. I'm sorry we frightened you, but someone was sneaking around near the clearing. Wasn't me. His eyes jumped from Tory to the gun, then back. I heard somebody running, like I said, lots of ways in and out of here. She nodded and stepped back. Piney cleared his throat, reached down for the bag. I guess I'll go on then. Yeah, you go on, Faith told him. If I were you, I'd make sure Cade knows when you plan to do some frogging. I'll see to that for sure, you bet your life. I'm just going to go on now. He backed up, watching Faith's face until he could slide into the shadows of the trees. 25. For close on to 35 years, J.R. and Carl D. fished on Sunday afternoons. It hadn't started as a tradition, and even now both men would have been annoyed and embarrassed to have called it one. It was simply a way to relax and pass the time. After J.R.'s father died and his mother went to work, it had been Carl D.'s mother Iris had paid to watch Sarah Beth after school and on Saturdays, and it had been an unspoken agreement between the women that she would run hurt on J.R. as well. Fanny Russ cooked like an angel and had a will of steel. Both were a matter of pride. J.R. learned to call her ma'am in a quick hurry, and during his growing up years in the 50s when the clans still burned their hate through the South in shapes of crosses and no colors were allowed to sit at the counter in the diner on Market Street, the young white boy and young black boy quietly became friends. Neither made an issue out of it, and Sunday after Sunday, with a rare miss for holidays or illness, both men sat side by side with rod and reel on the bank of the river, just as they had as boys. They each had less hair and more girth than they'd had when they'd started, but the rhythm of the afternoon stayed essentially true. For a time, during J.R.'s courtship and through the early months of his marriage to Boots, she'd prepared fancy little lunches in a wicker basket for them. It had taken J.R. some little doing to discourage this without hurting her feelings. Picnic baskets filled with chicken salad sandwiches and neatly sliced vegetables made it all too female. All the men needed was a cooler of beer and a fistful of night crawlers and if they were lucky, a couple of wedges of Ma Russ's sweet potato or pecan pie. All that had remained constant for years. There were little changes by the river. The old peach tree had died three winters before, but it had sent out a half dozen volunteers that had grown like weeds until the town council had elected to nurture the best pair of them and cut down the rest. Now the fruit, still underripe, hung on the branches and waited for children to come along to devour those hard green orbs and give themselves belly aches. The water flowed slow and quiet, as always, with the grand old willow bent over it to dip its lacy green fronds. And now and again, if you were patient enough, fish stirred themselves to bite. If they didn't, a man was no worse off than he'd been when he dropped his line. Years had forged the men into solid citizens, pillars of responsibility, family men with mortgages and paperwork. The few hours a week they spent drowning worms was a statement that each of them was still as much his own man as he'd always been. Sometimes they argued politics, and as J.R. was a staunch Republican and Carl D. an equally hidebound Democrat, these debates tended toward the explosive and effusive. Both of them enjoyed the conflict enormously. On other Sundays, and depending on the season, it was sports. A high school football game could keep them both entertained and passionate for two hours. But more often than not, as their lives intersected, it was family, friends, and the town itself that dominated their meandering discussions as the water lapped the bank and the sun filtered through the trees. What each knew was that he could depend on the other for a sounding board, and that what was said between them by the river stayed by the river. Still, there were times when loyalties had to blur. Knowing this, Carl D. chose his words and approach carefully. Adam A.'s birthday's coming up here shortly. 
Carl D. spoke of his wife while he popped the top on his second beer and studied the calm surface of the water. That electric fry pan I bought her last year is still somewhat of a sore point between us. Told you. J.R. took a fistful of the barbecue potato chips from the bag ripped open between them. Yeah, yeah. You buy a woman something that plugs in, you're asking for grief. She wanted a new one. Complained every time I turned around about how the old one had hot spots. Don't matter. A woman doesn't want a kitchen appliance all wrapped up in a bow. What she wants is something useless. Well, I'm having a hell of a time thinking what's useless enough to suit her. I thought I might go by your niece's place and have her figure it out for me. Can't go wrong there. Tori's got a good sense of things. Done her shop up nice, a lot of work there. She's always been a good worker. And a serious girl with a good head on her shoulders. It's hard to believe she came out of what she did. It was the opening Carl D. had wanted, and still he maneuvered carefully. He got out a fresh stick of gum, went through his little ritual of unwrapping and folding. She had it hard growing up. I remember her hardly having a word to say for herself, just looking, just watching things with those big eyes. Your brother-in-law had a heavy hand. I know it. Jayard's mouth tightened. I wish I'd known more back then. Don't know as it would have made much difference, but I wish I'd known how it was. Well, you know now. We're looking for him, J.R., on that business back in Hartsville. I'd like to see you find him, too, give him some of what he's got coming. My sister, well, her life's gone to hell either way, but putting him behind bars might give Tori a better night's sleep. I'm some relieved to hear you say so, J.R., and... The fact is, I got, I got worse than that going on here, the kind of worse that might spill over on you some. What are you talking about? What happened to Sherry Bellows? Christ, that was bad business, bad business, J.R. repeated with a solemn shake of his head. City business, not what we get here in town. Pretty young woman like that. He trailed off, his shoulders straightening, stiffening as he turned his head to stare into Carl D.'s face. God Almighty, you don't think Hannibal had part in that. I shouldn't be talking to you about it. Fact is, I spent most of the night worrying it over in my head. Officially, I should keep this to myself, but I'm not going to. Can't. Right now, J.R., your brother-in-law isn't just top of the list of suspects on this. He's the only suspect. J.R. pushed to his feet. He paced along the edge of the river, looked across its narrow curve. It was quiet, with just the absent chattering of a few busy birds. He had to listen hard to catch even the murmur of traffic from town. He had to want to hear it to make the connection between this solitary spot with its tall, wet grass and lazy water and the lives and business of progress. I can't get my mind around that, Carl D. Hannibal, He's a bully and a bastard. I can't think of one good thing to say about him, but killing that girl, for God's sake, killing her. No, I can't get my mind around that. He's got a history of roughing up women. I know that. I know it. I'm not making excuses here, but there's a wide road between rough handling and murder. The road narrows after a while, especially if there's cause. What cause would he have had? J.R. strode back, crouched down until their eyes were level. He didn't even know that girl. Met her in Eunice's shop the day she was killed. Met her, spoke with her, and as far as he knew, she and Tori were the only ones knew he was around. There's more, he said when J.R. shook his head. You're not going to like it. I'm sorrier than I can say your family's brought into this, but I got a duty and I can't let being sorry stop me. I wouldn't ask you, but I think you're looking in the wrong direction, that's all. He sat again. I have to think that. I can't say I wasn't glancing that way to start, but it was Tori who turned me straight on to him. Tori? I took her back to the scene with me. The scene? J.R.'s eyes went blank, then filled with shock. The murder scene? Jesus, Carl D. Jesus Christ, why'd you do that? Why would you put her through something like that? I got a girl about the same age as my own Ella who went through something a hell of a lot worse. I got a duty to her, J.R., and I'll use whatever I can to see that through. Tori's not a part of this. You're wrong. She's hitched into it tight. Now you just listen a damn minute before you go kicking at me. I took her back there, and I'm sorry for how it was hard on her, but I'd do it again. She knew things she couldn't have known. 
saw how it had been like she'd been right there while it was going on. I've heard about things like that, wondered on them, but never seen it before. It's not something I'll ever forget. She ought to be left alone. You had no business using her that way. You didn't see that girl, J.R. I hope to God you never see anything like what was done to her. But if you did, you wouldn't tell me I had no business using anything that put that right again. It's the second time I've seen that kind of thing done. If we'd paid attention to Tori the first time, it might not have happened again. What the hell are you talking about? We've never had a woman raped and murdered in progress. No. First time it was a child. He saw J.R.'s eyes widen and the blood drained from his face. First time it wasn't in town. But Tori was there, just like she was here now, and when she tells me the same person killed Sherry Bellas who killed little Hope Lavelle, I'm going to believe her. The spit dried up in J.R.'s mouth. Some vagrant killed Hope Lavelle. That's what the report said. That's what everyone wanted to believe. That's what Chief Tate believed, and I can't say he was wrong to. But I'm not going to say the same, and I can't believe the same anymore. I'm not going to try to hang this one on some passerby. There have been others, too. Tori knows about them. The FBI knows about them, and they're coming here. They'll go after him, J.R., and they're going to talk to Tori, to her mama, to your sister, and to you. Hannibal Bodine. J.R. laid his head in his hands. This will kill Sarah Beth. It'll kill her. He dropped his hands. He'll go back there. That's where he'll go. Holy God, Carl D., he'll go to Sari, and I've talked to the sheriff up there. He's got a man watching the place, keeping an eye on your sister. i got to go up there myself, make her come back here. I expect if it was my sister, I'd do the same. I'll go along with you, help smooth it out with the cops there. I can handle it. I reckon you can. Carl D. nodded as he began packing up. He heard the anger, the resentment. He'd expected both, just as he expected what he'd done and what he would do was bound to do some damage to a lifelong friendship. There was nothing to do but wait and see how much could be mended again. I reckon you can, J.R., he said again, but I'm going just the same. I need to talk to your sister and I'd like to do it before the federal boys get here and snatch the whole goddamn business away from me. Are you going as a cop or as a friend of mine? I'm both. Been your friend a lot longer, but I'm both. He shouldered his rod and met J.R.'s eyes. Plan to keep being both. If it's all the same to you, we'll take my car and make better time. It was a struggle, but J.R. bit back words he knew would hang ugly between them. He managed a thin, humorless smile. We'll make better yet if you put on the siren and drive like a man instead of an old lady. Relief eased some of the weight from Carl D.'s heart. I might could do that, part of the way. Cade was working hard to control his own temper, to watch his own words. Every time he thought about what a foolish, reckless risk his sister and Tori had taken the evening before, fury stormed inside him. Lectures, threats, recriminations would have released some of his tension and would have gotten him nowhere. He wasn't a man who indulged himself in idle directions. He knew exactly where he wanted to go and simply had to choose the best route for getting there. Speed wasn't a priority, so he bided his time. He hadn't indulged in a lazy Sunday morning for quite a while. The best way to begin one, in his opinion, was to keep Tori in bed as long as possible. That was a simple matter of pinning her down and nibbling however, wherever he liked until she got into the spirit of the thing, and had the added benefit of smoothing out some of his own raw edges. He fixed breakfast because he was hungry, and he'd come to the conclusion Tori considered the morning meal well met if she had a second cup of coffee. He steered conversation into casual lines, books, movies, art. They were fortunate to share tastes. It wasn't something Cade deemed essential, but rather a nice, comfortable bonus. He imagined she didn't think he noticed how often her eyes skimmed over to a window and searched. There was nothing he didn't notice. The nervous hand she tried to keep busy, the way she would stop, go still, as if straining to hear some change in the rhythm of sound outside. The way she jumped when he let the screen door bang when he came out to join her as she tended her flowers. How many times in his life had he come across his mother working in her garden, he wondered. He was just as unable to judge the direction of her thoughts as she weeded and plucked. How tidy, he mused, how precise both women were about the chore kneeling, wearing hat and gloves as they worked the bed, filling a basket with ruthlessly pulled weeds and spent blossoms, and how furious both would be if he voiced the comparison. 
Throughout the morning, Tori's voice, her face, stayed utterly calm, and that alone infuriated him. She wouldn't share her nerves with him, still kept part of herself closed off and separate. His mother, he thought again as he loitered on the porch and studied Tori's bent head, had kept part of herself closed off and separate. He could do nothing, had never been able to do anything to reach his mother. He would damn well reach Tori. Come on, take a ride with me. A ride? He pulled her to her feet. I've got some things I need to see to. Come along with me. Her first reaction was quiet relief. She would be alone. She could lie down, shut her eyes, and try to sort through the turmoil swirling inside her head. A few hours of solitude shore up the wall and chase away the shakes. I have a dozen things to do, too. You just go ahead. It's Sunday. I'm aware of the day of the week, and tomorrow, oddly enough, is Monday. I'm expecting some new shipments, including one from Lavelle Cotton. I have paperwork, which can wait till Monday. He stripped off her garden gloves as he spoke. There's something I want to show you. Kate, I'm not fit to go anywhere. I don't have my purse. You won't need it, he said as he pulled her to the car. That's a statement only a man could make. She snarled as he all but dumped her in the car. Well, let me go brush my hair at least. He plucked off her hat, tossed it in the back seat. It looks fine. He slid behind the wheel before she could make another excuse. Gets a little wind blown. It'll just be sexier. He picked up his sunglasses from the dash, put them on, then shoved the car in reverse. And yeah, that's another statement only a man could make. He turned onto the road, punched the gas. You look pretty when you're annoyed. Then I must be gorgeous right now. That you are, darling. But then I like the look of you no matter what your mood. That's handy, isn't it? How long have we known each other, Tori? She held her hair back with one hand. Altogether? About twenty years, I suppose. No, we've known each other about two and a half months. Before that, we knew of each other. We walked around the edges of each other. Maybe we occasionally thought about or wondered about each other. But for around about two months, we've known each other. Do you want to know what I've learned about you in that space of time? She couldn't quite judge this mood. His tone was light, his face relaxed, but there was something. I'm not sure I do. That's one of the things I've learned right there. Victoria Bodine's a cautious woman. She rarely leaps before she looks, and then she'll do a comprehensive study. She doesn't trust easily, not even herself. If you leap before you look, you lower your chances of landing on the other side in one piece. There's another thing. Logic. A cautious and logical woman. Now, that might seem like a fairly ordinary, even uninteresting combination to some people, but those wouldn't have taken the entire package into account. They wouldn't have added in the determination, the brain, the wit, or the kindness. Most of all, they would have missed the warmth that's all the more precious for being so rarely shared. And all of this is wrapped, sometimes too tightly, in a very appealing package. He turned onto a narrow dirt road and slowed. That's quite an analysis. It barely scratches the surface. You're a complex and fascinating woman, complicated and difficult, demanding simply because you refuse to demand, hard on a man's ego because you never ask for a damn thing. She said nothing, but her hands had linked together a sure sign of tension. She'd heard the anger now, just the rougher edge of it in his voice. We'll walk from here. He stopped the car and climbed out. On either side, the field spread with row after row of cotton marching like soldiers, she could smell earth and manure and heat, all ripe and sweet and strong. They must have cultivated recently, she mused, turned the weeds into the earth. Puzzled, unsure what needed to be done here or why they had come, she followed him down the rows while the young plants brushed her legs and reminded her of childhood. We haven't had a lot of rain, Cade said. Enough, but not a lot. We don't need as much irrigation as the other farms. The soil holds more water when it isn't full of chemicals. Treat it like a natural thing and it thrives like one. Insist on changing it, force it to live up to your expectations, and it needs more and more just to get by. A couple of months, the bowls will open. He crouched down, removing his sunglasses and hooking them on his shirt before he lifted a tightly closed bowl with a fingertip. My father would have used a regulator to slow the growth, a defoliant to kill the leaves. That's what he knew. That's how it was done. You do things different, people don't like it much. You have to prove yourself to them. You have to want to. He straightened and met her eyes. How much do I have to prove to you, Tori? I don't know what you mean. The way I figure, most people treated you a certain way. That's what you knew. That's how it was done. I'd say I've done things different. 
you're angry with me. Oh, yeah, I'm angry with you. We'll get to that. But right now I'm asking what you want from me, just exactly what you want. I don't want anything, Cade. God damn it, that's the wrong answer. When he strode away, she hurried after him. Why is it wrong? Why should I have to want things from you or want you to be something, do something, when I've been happier with you just as you are than I've ever been? He stopped and turned back to her. The sun beat mercilessly down on the fields. He felt the heat roll over him, roll inside him. That's a first. You telling me I make you happy. But I'll tell you what's wrong with it. I want things from you, and it's not going to work between us if it's all one-sided. Neither one of us is going to stay happy for long that way. The ache punched into her stomach and up toward her heart. You want to end it. I, I don't... Her breath caught, breaking her voice. Tears swam into her eyes and burned there. You can't... Fumbling for words, she backed away. I'm sorry. You should be for thinking that. He didn't fuss with her tears, but narrowed his own eyes, calculated. I told you I love you. Do you think I can just switch that off because you're a lot of work? I brought you here to show you I finish what I start, that what belongs to me gets everything I've got. You belong to me. He gripped her arms, brought her up to her toes. I'm getting tired of waiting for you to figure that out. I care for what's mine, Tori, but I expect something back. I told you I love you. Give me something back. I'm afraid of what I feel for you. Can you understand? I might if you tell me what you feel for me. Too much. She shut her eyes. So much, I can't imagine my life without you in it. I don't want to need you. And of course, it's easy for everyone else to need, for me to need you. He gave her a little shake that had her eyes snapping open. I love you, Victoria, and it's given me some very bad moments. He pressed his lips to her brow. I wouldn't change it even if I could. I want to be calm about it. She laid her cheek against his chest, smiling a little when he pulled the sunglasses free and tossed them on the ground. I just want to be normal about it. Why would you think it's normal to be calm about love? I don't feel calm. He stroked a hand down her hair. Do you love me, Tori? She tightened her grip, anchoring herself. Yes, I think, just yes. He tugged her hair until her face lifted. Let's leave it at yes, he murmured, and covered her mouth with his. Say it a few times so we both get used to it. Do you love me? Yes. She let out a shaky breath, wrapped her arms around his neck. Better already. Do you love me, Tori? This time she laughed. Yes. <laughs> Nearly perfect. He rubbed his lips over hers, felt hers soften. Will you marry me, Tori? Yes. Her eyes fluttered open. She jerked back. What? I'll take the first response. He swung her off her feet, kept her mouth busy with his until she was breathless and dizzy. No, put me down. Let me think. Sorry, I'm afraid you leaked before you looked. Now you have to live with it. You know very well that was a trick. A maneuver, he corrected as he carried her back toward the car, and a damn good one if I do say so myself. Cade, marriage is nothing to joke about, and it's something I haven't begun to think of. You'll have to think fast, then. If you want a big wedding, we can wait till fall after harvest. He dropped her into the car. But if you'd like small and intimate, my preference next weekend suits me. Stop it. Just stop. I haven't agreed to marriage. Yes, you did. He hopped in beside her. You can backtrack, bluster, circle around, but the fact is I love you. You love me. Marriage is where we're heading. That's the kind of people we are, Tori. I want a life with you. I want a family with you. Family. The thought of it ran cold in her blood. Don't you see that's why? Oh, God, Cade. He took her face in his hands. Our family, Tori, the one we'll make together, will be ours. You know nothing's that simple. There's nothing simple about it. Right doesn't always mean simple. This isn't the time, Cade. There's too much happening around us. That's why it's the perfect time. We'll talk rationally about this, she told him when he drove down the dirt road, when my head's not spinning. Fine, we'll talk all you want. When the work road split, he took the left fork. Instantly, Tori shot up in the seat, her stomach pitching. Where are you going? Bo Rev, there's something I need to get. I'm not going there. I can't go there. Of course you can. He laid a hand on hers. It's a house, Tori, just a house, and it's mine. Her chest hurt and her palms went damp. I'm not ready, and your mother won't like it. It's your mother's home, Cade. It's my home, he corrected coolly, and it'll be our home. My mother will have to deal with that. And so, he thought, would Tori. 26. 
It was, Tory thought, the most wonderful house. Not grand and elegant like the lovely old homes in Charleston with their fluidity and feminine grace, but vibrant and unique and powerful. As a child, she'd thought of it as a castle, a place of dreams and beauty and great strength. On the few occasions she had dared to step inside, she had gawked and spoken in whispers like a pagan entering a cathedral. She had gone in rarely, too shy and afraid to risk the tight-lipped disapproval of Margaret Lavelle, and as yet too young to protect herself against the sharp arrows of Margaret's thoughts. But she had seen and smelled and touched every room through hope. She knew the view out of each window, the feel of the tile and wood floors. Under her feet she smelled the scent that hung in the tower office, the mix of leather and bourbon and tobacco that meant man. Papa. She couldn't allow herself to see it through Hope's eyes now, to be drawn to it, into it, that way. She had to see it through her own, through the now. It was as stunning as it had been the first time she'd seen it, she realized, stunning and proud against the sky with towers defiantly rising. Beau Rev. Yes, it was exactly that, beautiful dreams with flowers spread at its feet like an offering and grand old trees guarding its flanks. For a few precious moments, Tori forgot that the last time she'd seen it, she'd limped up the lane with horror in her eyes and death in her heart. It doesn't change, she murmured. Hmm? No matter what goes on around it, even inside it, it stays. There's wonder in that. It meant something to him to hear the pleasure in her voice when she spoke of his home. My ancestors had ego and humor. Both are strong traits for building. He stopped the car, turned off the engine. Come inside, Victoria. Her smile, one she hadn't known, curved her lips, vanished. You're asking for trouble. He got out of the car, walked around to her door, and opened it. I'm asking the woman I love into my home. He took her hand and drew her out. She was reminded that however genteel he might be, he was equally stubborn. If there's trouble, we'll deal with it. It's easier for you. You stand on a foundation like the house. I've always teetered on boggy ground, so I have to watch my step. She looked up at him. Is it so important to you that I take this one? Yes, it is. Well, remember that if I end up sinking. They walked up the steps onto the veranda. She remembered sitting there with Hope playing jacks or studying one of their pirate mats, long tall glasses of lemonade beaded with damp, frosted cookies, the scent of roses and lavender. The image of it slipped in and out of her mind, two young girls, arms and legs browned from the sun, their heads bent close, whispering secrets though there was no one to hear. Adventure, Tori said quietly. That was our password. We were going to have so many adventures. Now we will. He lifted her hand to kiss it. She'd like that, wouldn't she? Yes, I suppose she would, though she didn't care much for boys. Tori managed to smile as he opened the door. You're so tedious and silly. Her heart beat too fast, and the grand foyer with its lovely green tiles stretched in front of her like a pit. Cade, trust me, he said, and drew her inside. The air was cool. It was always cool and fresh and fragrant. She remembered the magic of that, of how sharply it contrasted with the stuffy heat of her house, how the smells of last night's dinner never smeared the air here. And she remembered standing there with Cade before, nearly there. You were tall for a boy. She fought to keep her voice steady. It seemed to me you were tall and so pretty, the prince of the castle. You still are. So little has changed here. Tradition is a religion to the Lavelles. We're schooled in it from birth. It's both comfort and trap. Come into the parlor. I'll get you something cool to drink. She wasn't allowed in the parlor. Nearly said so before she caught herself. She could sit in the kitchen if she went in the back. Lila would give her iced tea or Coca-Cola, a cookie or some small treat. And if she helped with the sweeping, a quarter to tuck in her mason jar under the bed. But she wasn't allowed in the family rooms. With an effort, she blocked out the old images that wanted to intrude and concentrated on the now. The early lilies were in bloom, and there was a vase bright with them on a gorgeous table spread beneath the curve of the stairs. The scent of them was utterly female. Beside them were tall white tapers in bold blue stands. No one had lighted them, so they stood pure, untouched, and perfect. Like a photograph, she thought. 
every piece, every placement, absolute as if it had remained just exactly so for decades. And now she was walking into the picture. Even as she stepped toward the doorway, Margaret appeared at the top of the sweep of the stairs. Kincaid? Her voice was sharp, stinging. Her hand wanted to tremble as it held the banister, but she wouldn't permit it. Head lifted, she came halfway down. I would like to speak with you. Of course. He knew the tone, the stance, and didn't bother to mask his response with a polite smile. I'm about to show Tori into the parlor. Why don't you join us? I prefer to speak with you privately. Please come upstairs. She started to turn, assured he would follow. I'm afraid that'll have to wait, he said pleasantly. I have a guest. She jerked to a halt, her head whipping around just as Cade led Tori into the parlor. Cade, don't do this. Already the tension, the stabs of animosity were pricking her. There's no point. There's an essential point. What would you like? I'm sure Lila has iced tea in the kitchen or there's sparkling water behind the bar. I don't need anything. Don't use me as a weapon. It's not fair. Darling, he bent down to kiss her forehead. I'm not. How dare you? Margaret stood in the doorway, her face pale and set, her eyes swirling with temper. How dare you defy me in this way and with this woman? I made my wishes perfectly clear. I will not have her in this house. Perhaps I didn't make my wishes perfectly clear. Cade shifted, laid his hand on Tori's shoulder. Tori is with me and welcome here, and I expect anyone I bring into my home to be treated with courtesy. Since you insist on having this conversation with her present, I see no reason to bother with the pretense of courtesy or manners. The picture changed again as Margaret entered. The stage, Tori thought, was perfectly dressed. Only the characters revolved. You are free to sleep with whomever you choose. I can't stop you from spending your time with that woman or generating gossip about yourself and this family, but you will not bring your slut under my roof. Be careful, Mother. Cade's voice had gone soft, dangerously soft. You're speaking about the woman I'm going to marry. As if he'd struck her, Margaret took a staggering step back. Color flooded her face now, staining her cheeks. Have you lost your mind? Where are my lines, Tori wondered. Surely I must have some in this odd little play. Why can't I remember them? I'm not asking you to approve. While I regret this upsets you, you'll have to adjust. Cade? Tori found her voice already rusty with disuse. I'm sure your mother would prefer to speak to you in private. Don't put words in my mouth, Margaret snapped at her. I see I might have waited too long. If you persist on this path with this woman, you risk Beau Rev. I'll use my influence to persuade the board of Lavelle Cotton to remove you as chairman. You can try, he said equably. You won't succeed. I'll fight you every step of the way, and I have the advantage. And even if you could undermine my position at the plant, which I doubt, you'll never touch the farm. This is your gratitude. It's her doing. Margaret's heels clicked on the hardwood as she rushed forward. Cade merely stepped to the side, putting himself between Tori and his mother. No, it's my doing. Deal with me. Oh, good, a party. With B racing at her heels, Faith strolled in. Her eyes were bright with anticipation, her smile wicked. Hello, Tori, don't you look pretty? How about some wine? That's an excellent idea, Faith. Pour Tori some wine. Deal with me, he repeated to Margaret. You're disgracing your family and your sister's memory. No, but you are. It's a disgrace to blame one child for the death of another. A disgrace to treat a blameless woman with such contempt and viciousness out of your own guilt and grief. I'm sorry you could never see beyond them to the children you had left, to the life you might have made outside of that bubble you surrounded yourself with. You would speak to me this way? I've tried every other way. If you did what you had to do for yourself, I won't blame you for it. If you continue to live as you have these last 18 years, it's your choice. But Faith and I have lives of our own, and mine is going to be with Tori. Well, congratulations. Faith lifted the glass of wine she'd just poured, then drank it herself. I suppose this should be champagne. Tori, let me be the first to welcome you into our happy family. Be quiet, Margaret hissed, and got no more than a shrug from her daughter. 
Do you think I don't know why you're doing this, she said to Kay, to spite me, to punish me for some imagined wrongs. I'm your mother, and as such I've done my best by you since the day you were born. I know that. Depressing, isn't it? Faith murmured. Cade merely glanced at her, shook his head. I've nothing to spite or to punish you for. I'm not doing this to you, Mama. I'm doing it for me. I've had a miracle in my life. Tori came back into it. He took her hand again, found it icy, drew her up beside him. And I found out I'm capable of more than I imagined. I'm capable of loving someone and of wanting to do my best by her. I'm getting the best of the bargain here. She doesn't think so, won't even after this. But I know it, and I intend to treasure it. By tomorrow, Judge Purcell will have my new will drawn up. I will cut you both off without a penny. She aimed her furious gaze at Faith. Not a cent, do you understand, unless you stand with me now. You have no personal stake in this woman, she said to Faith. I will see to it that you receive your share and Cade's, beginning with the fair market value of your interest in the Marsh House and the Market Street property. Faith contemplated her wine. Hmm. Now what would that fair market value be? In the vicinity of a hundred thousand, Cade told her. I can't speak for what my share of our mother's estate might be, but I would assume it edges quite a bit closer to seven figures. Ooh, Faith pursed her lips. Imagine that. So all that will be mine if I just toss Cade to the wolves, so to speak, and do what you want me to do? She waited to be. Now when, I wonder, have I ever done what you wanted, Mama? It would be wise to think this through. Second question. When have I ever been wise? Do you want wine, Kate, or would you rather a beer? I will not make this offer a second time, Margaret said coldly. If you insist on going through with this farce, I will leave this house, and you and I will have nothing more to say to each other. I'll be sorry for that. Kate's voice remained calm. I hope you'll change your mind, given time. You would choose her over your own family, your own blood, without a moment's hesitation. I'm sorry you've never felt that way about anyone. If you had, you wouldn't question it. She'll ruin you. Gathering herself, Margaret looked at Tori. You think you were clever to hold out. You believe you've won, but you're wrong. In the end, he'll see you for what you are, and you'll have nothing. The words were there, just there, making her understand she'd only been waiting to say them. He sees me for what I am. That's my miracle, Mrs. Lavelle. Please don't make him choose between us. Don't make all of us live with that. I had another child who chose you, and she paid a high price for it. Now you'll take a second. I'll make arrangements to leave immediately, she said to Cade. Have the decency to keep her away from me until they're complete. Well, well, Faith poured a second glass as her mother walked away. That was pleasant. Faith, oh, don't give me that look, she said, brushing Cade off. I don't imagine either of you were particularly entertained, but I was enormously. God knows she had it coming. Here, she pushed the wine into Tori's hand. You look like you could use this. Go talk to her, Cade. You can't leave it like this. If he tries, I'll lose all this new respect and admiration I have for him. Rising to her toes, Faith kissed his cheek. Looks like she didn't ruin both of us after all. He took her hand and held it. Thank you. Oh, darling, it was my pleasure. Holding her glass aloft, she dropped into a chair, grinning when Bee leaped into her lap. I, for one, plan to celebrate. What? Cade's announcement that he intends to marry me or your mother's unhappiness? Faith tilted her head as she studied Tori. I can do both, but apparently you can't. You have too much sensibility and kindness. Oh, she'd hate that. One more thing to celebrate, she decided, and sipped her wine. That's unattractive, Faith. Cade murmured. Oh, let me crow for a minute, will you? Not everyone's as high-minded as the two of you. Good Lord, you really suit each other. Who'd have thought it? I'm happy for you. Imagine that. I'm sincerely happy for you. I believe I feel a little mushy inside. Try to control this embarrassing display of sentiment. Impatient with her, Cade turned to Tori, ran his hands up her arms, down again to her wrists. I need to get something out of my office, then we'll go. Will you be all right? Kay, talk to your mother. No. He kissed her lightly. I won't be long. Drink your wine, Faith suggested when they were alone. It'll put some color back in your cheeks. I don't want any wine. 
Tori set the glass aside, then walked to the window. She wanted to be outside again where she could breathe. If you insist on looking unhappy, you'll only spoil this for Cade. He did this because he loves you. And why did you? Interesting question. A year ago, oh hell, likely a month ago, I might have taken her up on it. That's a powerful chunk of money, and I do like what money can buy. No, you wouldn't have done it, not ever, and I'll tell you why. Tori glanced back. First, it would have been to throw it back in her face, but second and more than the first, it would have been for Cade, because you love him. Yes, I do. And love doesn't come easy to either of us. My mother saw to that. Would you blame her for everything? No, just what she's entitled to. I screwed up my life plenty all on my own, but he didn't. He never did damage to himself or anyone else. I love him tremendously. Surprised, Tori glanced over. Faith's eyes were still bright, but there were tears in them. He didn't say what he did to her to hurt her, but because it was truth, I would have said it to hurt her. Feel sorry for her if you must, but don't expect it of me. He has a chance with you, and I want to see him take it. Why didn't you tell him that? I'm telling you. I see what he feels for you, and I wish I could feel it for someone not to make myself a better person. I like myself the way I am. Still, if someone matters that much. Contemplatively, she studied the wine in her glass, the light that shined through it from the window. If someone matters that much, it's bound to take something out of you. She shifted her gaze to Tori. Isn't it? Yes, but I'm beginning to think it's something you don't need anymore, not if someone loves you back. Interesting, that's a nut to chew on. She looked over as Cade came in. I suppose you want to be alone now. Yes. Then B and I will just take ourselves off, won't we? She nuzzled the dog, then nudged her onto the floor. In fact, I think we'll go out and stay out till the air clears. She touched Cade's cheek as she walked by. I'd suggest you do the same. Not quite yet. He waited until he heard the door close behind his sister, then held out a hand for Tori. I want to do this here. We can consider it closing a circle. Cade, that was difficult for you, for all of you. I... No, it wasn't. And it's done. You and I were just beginning. He took a box from his pocket and opened it. The diamond caught the sunlight, exploded with it. This was my grandmother's, and it came to me. Panic choked her. Don't. She tugged at her hand, but he held her fingers firm in his. It came to me, he repeated, with the hope that one day I'd give it to the woman I wanted to marry. I didn't give it to Deborah. It never occurred to me to give it to her. I suppose I knew I was keeping it for someone else, that I was waiting for someone else. Look at me, Tori. It's all so fast. You should take more time. Twenty years or two months. Time's never been the point for us. If you can't believe and trust what I say, if it isn't enough to steady you, look at what I feel. He lifted her hand to his heart. Look in me, Tori. She couldn't refuse or resist, and the heat of it slid into her, warmth and strength and hope. His heart beat steady under her palm. His eyes never wavered from hers. Trust, she thought. He was trusting her with all that he was. The next step was hers. I wish you could look in me because I don't know how to tell you what I feel. Scared because there's so much of it. I never wanted to be in love with anyone again. But I didn't know it could be different. I didn't know it could be you. You're so steady, Cade. Smiling now, she lifted a hand to toy with his hair. You steady me. Marry me. Oh, God. She took a deep breath. Had to take a second. Yes. She looked down as he slipped the ring on her finger. It's beautiful. I get dizzy looking at it. It's a little big. He ran a thumb around the gold band. You have delicate hands. We'll have it sized. Not right away. I want to get used to it first. She closed her hand into a fist, let out a sigh. She loved him. Her eyes swam as she lifted them again. Your grandmother. She loved him. Her name was Laura, and she was happy. So will we be, he promised. She let herself believe him. Carl D. kept the siren on and the speedometer at 80 straight up I-95. It wasn't called for, of course, but it did give him a nice little kick, and God knew it entertained J.R. He shut it down as they approached their turnoff. Maybe we ought to be doing this on Sundays instead of fishing. 
Gets the blood moving, J.R. agreed. Hard to feel like an old fart when you're highballing down the road. Who are you calling an old fart? Tell you what I'll do, J.R., if you think it'll make it smoother for you. I'll drop you off at your sister's place, then I'll go and check in with Sheriff. Give you time to talk to her and for her to get her things together. I appreciate that. J.R.'s mood plummeted, but he did his best to bolster it. She's not going to want to budge, so it'll take a little doing. I figure I'll tell her we're pretty sure Han's still around progress, so she'll be closer to him if she comes on along with me. Well, it may just be the truth. And that being the case, I'm going to put extra patrols on your street. I want you to start using that fancy alarm system Boots talked you into a couple of years back. Been using it since you found the Bellas girl. Boots says she doesn't get a minute's rest unless we got it on. He thought of his town, the streets he could walk with his eyes shut, the people he knew by name, and all who knew him. That's not the way it's supposed to be. No, sometimes that's the way it is. You and me, J.R., we grew up one way. We've seen the changes come into progress, and most of them's good. We bend to them, maybe lose a little something when they plant houses in a field where we used to play ball or put up another jiffy mart and talk about goddamn strip malls outside of town, but we bend. Some changes you have to meet another way altogether. J.R. smiled a little. What the hell does that mean? Damned if I know. Is this a turn for her place? Yeah, road's rough. You're going to want to mind your oil pan. I'm ashamed for you to see how she's living, Carl D. Put that aside. We've been friends too long for that kind of shit. The cruiser bumped, scraped. Wincing, Carl D. slowed to a crawl. Then peering ahead, his eyes narrowed. What the hell's this? God damn it, there's trouble. God damn it, he repeated and hit the gas so they took the rest of the rutted road in wild bumps. Two cruisers sat nose to nose outside the house. Yellow police tape was stretched around the scruffy yard. Even as he hit the brakes, the uniform standing on the sagging porch stepped down. Chief Ross, out of progress, he fumbled out his ID, held it up for the uniform to scan. What happened here? We had an incident, Chief Ross. The officer's face was pale and coldly set, his eyes concealed behind dark glasses. I'll have to ask you to stay here. The sheriff's inside. He'll need to clear you. This is my sister's place, J.R. snatched at the cop's sleeve. My sister lives here. Where's my sister? You'll have to speak with the sheriff. Please stay behind the line, he ordered and strode into the house. Something's happened to Sarah Beth. I have to... Hold on. Carl D. grabbed his arm before J.R. could rush forward. Just hold on. There's nothing you can do. Let's just hold on. He'd already spotted the dark stain on the dirt outside the chicken coop and a second smearing near the overgrown grass. Sheriff Bridger was a hefty man with a face seamed by years and weather. His eyes were faded blue and set in by lines that looked burned into the skin by the sun. He scanned the area as he stepped out, took a moment to wipe beads of sweat from his brow, then walked toward the waiting men. Chief Russ? That's right, Sheriff. I brought Mr. Mooney here up to fetch his sister, Sarah Beth Bodine. What happened here? Bridger shifted his pale eyes to J.R. You brother to Sarah Beth Bodine? Yes, where's my sister? I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Mooney. We had trouble here sometime early this morning. Your sister's dead. Dead? What are you talking about? That can't be. I talked to her not two days ago, not two days back. Carl D., you said they had police here, right here, looking out for her. That's right, we did. And I lost a man this morning, too. A good man with a family. I'm sorry for your loss, Mr. Mooney, and I'm sorry for theirs. J.R., you just sit down now. I want you to sit till you get your legs under you. Carl D. opened the car door, nudged his friend down on the seat. J.R.'s face was alarmingly red, and his big frame had started to shake. You mind having somebody bring him some water, Sheriff? With a nod, Bridger turned to signal the uniform. Purdy, bring Mr. Mooney here a glass of water. You sit here now. Carl D.'s knees popped like firecrackers when he crouched down. You sit here and catch your breath. Let me do what I can do. I just talked to her, J.R. repeated. Friday evening, I talked to her. I know it. Just you sit here until I get back. He stepped away from the car, moving until he was out of J.R.'s hearing. Can you tell me what happened here? We've been putting it together for the last few hours. Flint, he caught the two to ten shift. We didn't know there was trouble until his relief showed up and found him over there. Bridger gestured toward the coop. They'd taken his man off to the morgue, zipped in a black bag. He was not going to forget it. He caught around in the back, took him down. He was young, strong. He tried getting back to his unit here, crawled over 15 feet with that round in him, had his weapon out. 
had his weapon in his hand. Somebody put a gun in his ear and pulled the trigger. He was 33 years old, Chief Russ. Got a 10-year-old boy and an 8-year-old girl at home. I take responsibility there without a father now. I sent him over here. We knew Bodine was dangerous, but we didn't know he was armed. Never used a firearm in any of his other doings. A motherfucker shot my man in the back. Carl D. wiped the back of his hand over his mouth. And Miss Bodine? Sarah Beth. Sari Mooney, who'd sat on his mom's front porch, ate at her table. My guess is she knew he was coming. Had a suitcase packed. There's an empty coffee can in the bedroom and looks to me like she might have kept her house cash in it. Gone now. Door was open, unforced. She let him in or he walked in. He shot her twice, once in the chest, once in the back of the head. Carl D. shoved the sorrow aside, eyed the situation of the house, the land. Guess you've done a canvas. Yeah, talked to the neighbors. Finally got somebody to say they heard what maybe was gunshots about 5, 5.30 this morning. People mind their own around here. Nobody paid any attention to it. The heat was merciless. Carl D. dragged out a handkerchief and rubbed it over his face as sweat soaked through his fishing shirt. How the hell did he get here? Can't say. Hitched a ride, maybe. Stole a car. We're looking into it. For the money in a coffee can? Don't sit right. She had a suitcase packed? That's right. Her clothes in it and some of his. She knew he was coming. We're checking the phone records. Got a figure he called her and she gave him the lay of the land. She wasn't what you'd call cooperative with the police around these parts. And he blamed her, though she was dead as Eve, for the murder of his man. Mr. Mooney, going to be up to doing a next to Ken ID on her? Yeah. Carl D. rubbed his mouth again. He'll do it. You informed the deceased mother yet? No, I was going to handle that back at the office. I'd appreciate it if you'd let me do that, Sheriff Bridger, not want to step on your ground here, but she knows me. <laughs> You're welcome to that part of the job. It ain't one I relish. Fine, then. I'll take J.R. on by his mamas. It'll be easier for them that way. All right. He's a cop killer now, Chief Russ. If it gives your friend there any comfort, you let him know that bastard won't be able to run far enough or fast enough. You keep me up to date, Sheriff, and I'll do the same. I got the Federals coming tomorrow the day after. They'll want to pay you a call. Welcome to, but this is my turf, and that was my man they carried away in a bag this morning. Bridger spat on the ground. Bodine better pray to his almighty God the feds get to him before I do. Miles away, Hannibal Bodine tore into a pork chop. He'd gotten it along with bread and cheese and a bottle of Jim Beam from a house he'd broken into. It had been simple enough, with the family gone off to church. He'd watch them stroll out of the house in their fancy Sunday clothes and pile into a shiny minivan hypocrites, going to church to show off their material goods, into the house of the Lord to flaunt themselves. God would punish them just like he punished all the proud and pompous. And God had provided, he thought, as he gnawed the pork bone clean. He'd found plenty of food in that big house, meat wrapped up from last night's dinner enough to restore his body, and drink to sustain him in his hour of need. This was his trial, his test, this wandering in the wilderness. He tossed the bone aside and took a long drink from the bottle. For a time, he'd despaired. Why was he being punished, a righteous man? Then it all came clear. He was to be tested. He was to prove his worthiness. God had shouldered him with temptation time and time again. There'd been times he'd been weak, times he'd succumbed. But now he was given this chance. Satan had lived in his house under his roof for 18 years. He had done his best to drive the devil out, but he had failed. He would not fail again. He lifted the bottle, let the heat of the whiskey strengthen him. Soon, very soon, he would complete the task that had been given him. He would rest, he would pray, then the way would be shown to him. He closed his eyes and curled up to sleep. The Lord provided, he thought, and laid his hand over the gun tucked beside him. 27. Tori watched Chief Russ's car drive slowly down her lane, make the turn onto the road to progress. She sat where she had since her uncle had told her about her mother, where she'd lowered herself inch by inch into the old rocker on the front porch. It was her stillness that worried Cade, her stillness and her silence. Tori, come on inside and lie down a while. I don't want to lie down. I'm all right. I wish I weren't so all right. I wish I felt more than I do. There's a blankness inside me where there should be grief. 
I'm trying to write something on it, and I can't. What am I that I can't feel grief for my own mother? Don't push yourself. I felt more grief and pity for Sherry Bellows, a woman I met once. I felt more shock and horror for a stranger than I do for my own blood. I looked in my uncle's eyes and I could see the pain there, the sadness, but it's not in me. I've got no tears for her. Maybe you've shed enough of them already. Something's missing inside me. No, it's not. He came around now, knelt in front of her. She stopped being part of your life. It's easier to mourn a stranger than it is someone who should have been part of you and wasn't. My mother is dead. They believe my father killed her. And the question in my mind, most prominently in my mind at this moment, is why do you want to take on someone who comes from that? You know the answer. And if love isn't enough, we'll add sense. You aren't your parents any more than I'm mine. The life we'll begin and build together is ours. I should walk away from you. That's sensible. And I suppose loving, too. But I won't. I need you. I want so much what we might have together, so I won't do the courageous thing and walk away. Darling, you wouldn't get two feet. She let out her breath in a shaky laugh. <laughs> Maybe I know it, Cade. It was so easy to touch him, to brush her fingertips over the gilt edges of his hair. Would we have come together, do you think, if hope had lived? If nothing that happened had happened and we'd just grown up here like normal people? Yes. Sometimes your confidence is a comfort. She walked to the end of the porch to look at the trees that tucked the marsh into shadows. This is the second time since I've come home someone has died. The second time I thought it would be me he came for. He'll come yet. He won't get near you. Yes, she thought his confidence could be a comfort. He'll have to come. He'll have to try. She steadied herself, turned back. Can you get me a gun? Tori, don't say you'll protect me or that the police will find him, stop him. I believe all those things as far as they go. But he will come back for me, Cade. I know it as truly as I know anything. I must be able to defend myself if I have to. And I will defend myself. I won't hesitate to take his life to save my own. I might have once, but I have too much at stake now. I have you now. There was a sick dread in his stomach, but he nodded. Saying nothing, he walked to his car and opened the glove compartment. He'd started carrying the revolver with him since Sherry Bellow's murder. He brought it back to Tory. This is a revolver, thirty-eight. It's smaller than I imagined. It was my father's. Cade turned the old Smith & Wesson over in his hand, what you call a hideout gun, I suppose because it's compact. Do you know how to fire it? She pressed her lips together. It looked sinister and efficient in Cade's hand, the elegant farmer's hand. Pull the trigger? <laughs> well, there's a little more to it than that. Are you sure about this, Tori? Yes, she let out a breath. Yes, I'm sure. Come on, then. We'll go out in the yard and I'll give you a lesson. Faith sang in a voice surprisingly light and sweet as she carried groceries up the stairs into Wade's apartment. Bee scrambled after her, sniffing the air that held memories of countless dogs, cats, and pet rodents. Delighted with herself, Faith shifted bags, managed the knob, and bumped the door open with her hip. On a ragged pad in the living room, Mongo was lying with his head on his paws. His tail thumped and his head lifted as Faith walked in. Ah, oh, hello there. You looking lots better, you big old thing. B, Mongo's recuperating, don't chew on his ears. He'll swallow you in one bite. But B was already sniffing, nibbling, and nudging. Well, I guess the two of you better get acquainted. Where's the doctor? She found him in the kitchen, staring into a cup of coffee. There he is now. She dumped her bags on the counter, then turned to wrap her arms around his neck from behind and kissed the top of his head. I've got a big surprise for you, Doc Wade. You're going to get yourself a home-cooked supper, and if you play your cards right, a romantic interlude will follow dessert. There was a machine-gun burst of barking from the living room that sent her scurrying out. Now, isn't that the cutest thing? Wade, you ought to come out and see this. They're playing together. Well, this big dog here's pretty much squashing bee with one paw, but they're having such a time. She was still laughing when she came back, then stopped when she saw Wade's face. Honey, what's the matter? Did something go wrong with the horse out at the hill place last night? No, no. The mayor's fine. My aunt, my, my father's sister, she's dead. She was murdered early this morning. Oh, my God. Oh, Wade, that's awful. What is going on around here? She sat down across from him, wishing she knew what to do. Your daddy's sister, Tori's mama? 
Yes, I haven't seen her in Christ. I don't even remember the last time. I can't even get a picture of her in my head. That's all right now. It's not all right. My family's ripping itself apart. For God's sake, Faith, they think my uncle killed her. It was the horror in his eyes that had her pushing back her own. He's a bad man, Wade. A bad and dangerous man and nothing to do with you. I'm sorry for Tori, I swear I am, and for your aunt and your family, but... Well, I'm going to say it even if it makes you mad at me. She chose him, Wade, and she stayed with him. Maybe that's a kind of love, but it's a bad kind. It's a sorry kind. We don't know what goes on in other people's lives. Oh, hell, we don't. We're always saying that, but we do know. I know what went on in my parents' lives. I know that if either of them had had any gumption, they'd have made their marriage work or they'd have ended it. Instead, my mother clung to the Lavelle name like it was some sort of prize, and Papa took up with another woman. And whose fault was that? I spent a long time letting myself believe it was the other woman's, but it wasn't. It was Papa's for not honoring his marriage vows and Mama's for tolerating it. Maybe it's easier to say this is all Hannibal Bodine's fault, but it's not. And it sure as hell isn't yours or Tory's or your daddy's. She pushed back from the table. I wish I could think of nice things to say, of soft and comforting things to say, but I'm just no good at it. I guess you want to go on over to your daddy's. No, he kept his eyes on her face as he had since she'd begun to speak. He's better off with my mother. She'll know what to do for him. Who the hell would have thought you'd know what to do for me? He held out a hand. When she took it, he pulled her close, turned his face into her belly. Stay, will you? Of course I will. She stroked a hand down his hair. Her insides were a little shaky, an odd feeling. We'll just be quiet a while. He held on as surprised as she that she would be an anchor for him. I've been sitting here since my father called. I don't know how long, half an hour, an hour, frozen inside. I don't know what to do for my family. You will. When the time comes to do it, you always do. You want me to fix you some fresh coffee? No, thanks. No. I have to call my grandmother and Tori. I have to figure out what to say first. With his eyes closed and his face pressed against her, he listened to the dogs barking in the next room. I'm going to keep Mongo. I know it, honey. His leg's doing all right. It'll take a while to heal yet, but he'll be fine. A little gimpy, maybe. I was going to find him a good home, but I can't. He looked up puzzled. What do you mean you know it? I never keep dogs. You hadn't found the right one yet, is all. His eyes narrowed on her face, but his dimples deepened as they did when he was amused. You're getting a little too wise for comfort. It's the new me. I kind of like it. And this new you cooks supper? On rare occasions, I got us a couple of steaks in there and the trimmings. She walked to the counter, dug in the bag, and pulled out two white candles. Lucy, down at the market, asked me what kind of evening I'd planned buying red meat and white candles and a fancy cheesecake in a box. He smiled a little and rose from his chair. And what did you tell Lucy down at the market? I told her I was fixing a romantic dinner for two for myself and Dr. Wade Mooney. A number of interested ears pricked at that tidbit of information. She set the candles down. I hope you don't mind that I was indiscreet and that we will now find ourselves the subject of considerable talk and speculation. No. He slid his arms around her, laid his cheek on her hair. I don't mind. Lissy, honey, I don't feel right about this. Now, Dwight, we're paying a grievance call on friends and neighbors. Trying to find comfort... Lissy shifted on the seat of the car, hauling her belly up with one arm. Tori's just lost her mother, and she'll appreciate some sympathy. Tomorrow, maybe. Dwight gave the road ahead a pained look. The next day. Why, well, she won't feel up to making herself a decent meal now, will she? So I'm taking her a nice chicken casserole. Help keep her strength up. Lord, it will be trying for her. Despite her pious sigh, there was a lively fascination dancing inside her. Tori's own mother shot dead by her own father. Why, it was just like something out of the tabloid papers or out of Hollywood. And since she dragged Dwight out of the house hardly an hour after the news hit, she'd likely be the first to get a look at Tori. Not that she wasn't sympathetic to Tori. Naturally, she was. Hadn't she taken that casserole her mother had made for her to heat up after the baby came and brought it along? Food was for death. Everyone knew that. She's not going to feel up to company, Dwight insisted. We're not company. Why, I went to school with Tori. The both of us have known her since we were children. I couldn't bear the idea of her being alone at such a time. Or, she thought, of someone else getting there first. 
Besides all that, Dwight Fraser, you're mayor. It's your duty to call on the bereaved. Goodness, watch these bumps, honey. I have to pee again. I don't want you getting too upset or excited. He reached over to pat her hand. No going into labor out here, Lissy. Don't you worry. But it pleased her that he did. I've got three weeks left, at least. Goodness, how do I look? Anxious, she flipped down the vanity mirror. I must look a fright, rushing out the way I did, a big, fat, frightful cow. You're beautiful. Still the prettiest girl in progress and all mine. Oh, Dwight. She flushed rosily and fluffed her hair. You're so sweet. I just feel so fat and ugly these days, and Tori's so slim. Skin and bones. My woman's got curves. He reached over to rub her breast and made her squeal. Stop that. Giggling, she gave his hand a swat. Shame on you. Now look, we're almost there, and you got me all flustered. She snuck her hand between his legs. Got yourself flustered, too. Remember how we used to park out this way when we were young and foolish? And I talked you into the back seat of my daddy's car. Didn't take much talking. I was just crazy about you. The first time we made love, it was out here. It was so dark, so sexy. Dwight, she walked her fingers up his leg. After the baby comes and I get my figure back, let's have Mama come over and babysit. You and I'll drive on out here and see if you can still talk me into the back seat. He blew out a breath. Keep talking like that, Lissy, and I'm not going to be able to get out of this car without embarrassing myself. Slow down a little. I want to put some lipstick on anyway. She dug a tube out of her purse. Mama said she'd keep Luke overnight. We should go by and see Boots and J.R. after we leave Tories. I guess they'll have the funeral up around Florence. We'll have to go, of course, represent the town, and so on. I don't have any black maternity dresses. I suppose I'll have to make do with the navy, even though it has that pretty white collar. People will understand, don't you think, if I wear navy blue? And we'll have to send flowers. She chattered until they turned into the lane. Dwight was no longer aroused, but he was getting a vague headache. Fifteen minutes, he promised himself. He'd give Lissy fifteen minutes to fuss over Tori. Then he was taking her home and making her put up her feet. That way he could get himself a beer, kick back, and watch whatever was on ESPN. Nobody in progress was going to do any grieving over Sarah Beth Bodine except her immediate family. He didn't see why death so far removed from him and his town need occupy more than the minimum amount of his time, personal or official. He'd pay his duty calls, then forget it. I don't know why anybody would want to live way out here without a single soul for company, Lissy said as Dwight hauled her out of the car. Then again, Tori always was an odd one, rare as a two-headed duck, my mama would say. Then again, she trailed off and gave Cade's car a significant look. I guess she doesn't lack for company after all. I swear I can't see those two together, Dwight, not for a New York minute. They can't have a thing in common, and as far as I can see, Tori's not the kind to keep a man very warm, if you know what I mean. She's good-looking enough if you like that type, but she's nothing compared to Deborah Purcell. I can't for the life of me figure what Cade sees in her. A man in his position could have his pick of women. God knows I've tried to steer him toward plenty of them. Dwight said, hmm, and uh-huh, and yes, honey, a couple of times as he got the casserole dish out of the car. It wasn't necessary to actually listen to his wife when she started on one of her ramblings. After several years of marriage, he had her rhythm down so that he managed to punctuate her statements at the appropriate times without having a clue what she was talking about. The system served them both well. I imagine he'll get tired of her before much longer and they'll drift apart the way people do when they don't have a real bond like we do. She fluttered at him, gave his arm a little pat, and he read the signal correctly. He glanced down and gave her a warm and loving look. Once he's shaken loose again, we'll have to have him over for dinner with, oh, maybe Crystal Bean. I might even be able to find some nice man for Tori, more her kind. That'll take some doing, as I don't think there are many men who'd be willing to take on such a strange one. I swear sometimes she'll just look at me and give me the shivers, if you know what I mean. Tori! She exclaimed it when Tori opened the door and immediately opened her arms. Oh, honey, I'm just so sorry about your mother. Dwight and I came the minute we heard. You poor thing, now why aren't you resting? I was sure Cade would have you lying down at a time like this. The embrace was smothering and hot. I'm all right. Of course you're not all right. You don't have to pretend with us, old friends. She flapped her hand against Tori's back. Now I want you to sit down and I'm going to make you a nice cup of tea. I brought you a casserole here. I want you to have a hot meal. Keep your strength up during this painful time. Kate? She released Tori to turn her attention on Kate as he came in from the kitchen. I'm glad you're here seeing to Tori. Time like this, she needs all her friends. Now you come on with me, honey. 
She slipped an arm around Tori's waist as if to support her. Dwight, you bring that dish on back to the kitchen so I can warm it up for Tori. Lissy, that's very kind of you, Tori began. Nothing kind about it, not between friends. I know you must be half out of your mind right now, but we're here for you. Whatever's said or done, you can count on us. Isn't that right, Dwight, honey? Sure it is. He gave Kate a pained look as Lissy pulled Tori toward the kitchen. I couldn't stop her, he murmured. She means it for the best. I'm sure she does. It's a terrible thing, terrible. How's Tori holding up? She's coping. Kate glanced back toward the kitchen where Lissy's voice ran on and on. I'm worried about her, but she's coping. They're saying that it was Hannibal Bodine who did it. Word spreading fast. I figured you'd want to know what's being said. It's going to get worse, I expect, before it gets better. I don't think it gets any worse. Chief Russ, give you any updates on the manhunt? He's playing it close. I guess he's got to. Haven't had anything like this around here since you lost your sister, Cade. He hesitated, then shifted the dish still in his hands. Can't be easy on you either, bringing all that back again. No, it's not. But I'll tell you the way it's starting to look, and that might close this off once and for all. It's starting to look like it might have been Bodine who killed Hope. Killed? He took a long breath, blew it out again as he too glanced toward the kitchen. God Almighty, Kate, I don't know what to say, what to think. Neither do I yet. Dwight, come on and bring me that casserole, will you? On the way, he called back. I'll move Lissy along as soon as I can. I know you don't want company. I appreciate it, and I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't mention Tori's father's connection to Hope, to Lissy or anyone just yet. Things are hard enough on Tori right now. You can count on me. I mean that, Cade. You let me know what you want done and when, and I'll see to it. He managed to smile. You and me and Wade, we go back, all the way back. I will count on you. I do. I. There was a sudden squeal from the kitchen that had Dwight bolting across the room in alarm. He burst in to see Lissy, eyes wide, mouth open, with Tori's hand clutched in hers. Engaged? Why, I just can't believe it. Dwight, look here what Tori's wearing on her finger, and neither of them saying a word about it. She jerked Tori's hand forward, her own face alive with the bliss of being she was sure, the first to know. Isn't this something? Dwight studied the ring, then looked into Tori's eyes. He saw the fatigue, the embarrassment, the faint irritation. It sure is. I hope you'll be very happy. Of course she'll be happy. Lissy dropped Tori's hand so she could waddle around the table and hug Cade. Aren't you the sly one never letting on, then snapping Tori up so fast? Why, her head must still be spinning. We have to celebrate, drink a toast to the happy couple. Oh. She stopped, had the grace to flush even if her eyes continued to dance. What am I thinking? Just I'm just a scatterbrain, that's all. Oh, honey, you must be so torn. She scurried back to Tori as quickly as she could manage, getting engaged and losing your mama this way so close together. Life goes on, you remember that. Life does go on. Tori didn't bother to sigh, but she did manage to get her hand in her lap before Lissy could grab it again. Thank you, Lissy. I'm sorry. I hope you understand, but I need to call my grandmother. We have to see about arrangements. Of course we understand. Now I want you to let me know if there's anything I can do, anything at all. Nothing's too big or too small. Dwight and I are more than happy to help, aren't we, Dwight? That's right. He put his arm firmly around Lissy. We'll go on now, but you can call us if there's anything you need. No, don't you get up. He steered Lissy toward the doorway. We'll let ourselves out. You call now, you hear? Thank you. Imagine that. Imagine it. Lissy could hardly wait until they'd gotten to the front door. Wearing a diamond big enough to blind you, and on the day she finds out her daddy killed her mama. I swear, Dwight, I don't know what to think. She'll be planning a wedding and a funeral at the same time. I told you, didn't I tell you she was a strange one? You told me, honey. He nudged her into the car and shut the door. You surely told me, he murmured. Inside, Cade sat at the table. For a moment, he and Tori studied each other in silence. Sorry, he said at length. For Dwight's my friend, and she comes along with him. She's a silly woman, not particularly crafty, not particularly mean. She thrives on other people's business, good and bad. Right now, she doesn't know which to highlight. Here's Victoria Bodine in the middle of a tragedy and a scandal, and here she is again engaged to one of the most prominent men in the county. Tori paused, glanced down at the ring on her finger. It was a jolt to see it there, she thought. Not a bad sensation, just an odd one. 
Such bulletins, she continued, it all must be rattling around in her head like marbles, clinking together as there isn't much else in there to get in the way. His mouth twitched. Is that speculation or did you take a look? There's no need to, and I don't do that anyway when everything she's thinking runs riot over her face. Dwight would never have gotten her out so quickly if she hadn't been jumping to get to the phone and start spreading the word. And that bothers you? Yes. She pushed back from the table, wandered to the window. Odd that it comforted somehow to look out into the dark shadows of the marsh. I knew when I came back here I'd be under the microscope. I understood that, and I'll deal with it. My mother, I'll deal with that too. There's nothing else I can do. You don't have to deal with it alone. I know. I came back here to face myself, I suppose, to resolve or at least accept what had happened to Hope and my part in that. I expected the talk, the looks, the speculation and curiosity. I planned to use them to build my business. I have, and I'll keep on using them. That's cold. No, it's good sense. Tough, maybe, but not cold. I came back for me, she said quietly, to prove I could. I expected to pay for it, to quiet the restlessness inside me, but to pay for it. I never expected you. She turned back. I never expected you, Cade and I don't know quite what to do with all of this feeling I have inside me for you. He got to his feet, crossed to her to brush her hair back from her face. You'll figure it out. This is so easy for you. I guess I've been waiting for you. Cade, my father, what he is, part of that's in me. You have to consider that. You have to weigh it in. Do I? He gave her a considering look as he turned her to walk toward the bedroom. You're probably right. I suppose I should give you the same opportunity to weigh in my great-grandfather Horace, who engaged in a long, lascivious affair with his wife's brother. When she discovered it, and in what you can imagine was her shock distress, threatened to expose him, Horace, along with his lover, displeased by this reaction, dismembered her and kept the alligators fat and happy for several days. You're making that up. No, indeed. He drew her down on the bed. Well, the business about the alligators is family legend. There are some who say she simply fled to Savannah and lived to the age of 96 in mortified solitude. Either way, it isn't a proud footnote in the Lavelle family history. She turned to him, found the curve of his shoulder, and rested her head there. I suppose it's a good thing I don't have any brothers. There you go. Sleep a while, Tori. It's just you and me here. That's what matters now. While she slept, he lay wakeful, listening to the sounds of the night. 28. I'm asking you to indulge me. Tori looked up at the peaks and lines of Beaurev. You're putting me between yourself and your mother again, Kay. That's not fair to any of us. No, but I need to speak with her, and I don't want you driving into town by yourself. I don't want you alone until this is over, Tori. Well, that makes two of us, so you can rest easy there, but I'd as soon wait in the car while you do what you have to do inside. Let's compromise. Oh, when did that word enter your vocabulary? He slanted her a slow and very bland smile. We'll go around back. You can wait in the kitchen. My mother doesn't spend a lot of time there. She started to object again, subsided. He would, she knew, simply roll over her excuses, and she was too worn out to fight about it. Too many dreams in the night, too many images sliding into her head in the day. When it was over, he said, as if it would be, as if it could. She got out of the car, walked with him around the garden path, through the wildly blooming roses, past the glossy-leafed camellia where a young girl had once secreted her pretty pink bike, wound through the hills of azaleas with their blooms long since spent, and fragrant spires of lavender that would scent the air all the way into winter. The world was lush here, full of color and shape and perfume, a lazily elegant place of bricked paths and lovely benches set just so among the beds and shrubs with overflowing pots of mixed blooms tucked artistically among the stream. The result was like a painting, meticulously executed. Margaret's world again, Tori realized, just like the studied perfection of the rooms inside. Nothing to mar it, nothing to change it. How wrenching it would be to have some invader burst in and skew the balance of it all. You don't understand her. Excuse me, your mother. You don't understand her at all. Intrigued, Cade laced his fingers with Tori's. Did I give you the impression I thought I did? This is her world, Cade. This is her life. The house, the gardens, the view she sees out the windows. 
Even before Hope died, it was the center for her, what she tended and preserved, and continued to after she lost her child. She could keep this, she said, turning to him. Touch it, see it, make certain it didn't change. Don't take this from her. I'm not. He cupped Tori's face in his hands, now holding it up to his, but neither will I tolerate her using it or the farm as a threat to hold me under her thumb. I can't give her more than I've already offered, not even for you. There has to be a compromise, just as you said. One would think, he laid his lips on her brow, but sometimes with some people there's only yes or no. Don't take this on. He drew her back and his eyes were troubled. Don't ask me to, Victoria. The sound he made wasn't so much a sigh as a rush of air. Don't ask me to bargain our happiness against her approval. I've never had her approval to begin with. It was so strange to realize it, and all at once. He'd grown up in a castle and had been just as starved for kind words as she. It hurts you. I'm sorry I didn't see that it hurts you. Old wounds. He ran his hands down her arms, laced fingers again. They don't bleed like they used to. But they would seep and trickle from time to time, she thought, as they began to walk again. No one had ever used a belt on him or fists. There were other ways to pummel a child. Even here in all this beauty, so far removed from the barren and stifling rooms of her childhood. Beautiful, yes, Tori thought as they walked under an arbor buried in morning glories, but lonely. That was just another word for barren. There should be someone sitting on the bench or clipping the Gerberas for a basket, a child stretched belly down over the path studying a lizard or toad. The painting needed life and sound and movement. I want children. Cade stopped in his tracks. Excuse me. Where had that come from and why had it popped out of her mind as if it had always been there? I want children, she repeated. I'm tired of empty yards and quiet gardens and tidy rooms. If we live here, I want noise and crumbs on the floor and dishes in the sink. I couldn't survive in all those perfect, untouched rooms, and that's something you can't ask me to do. I don't want this house without life inside it. The words rushed out of her mouth, and the panic writing in them made him smile. He remembered a young boy who'd wanted to build a fort, scrap wood and tar paper. This is such an interesting coincidence. I was thinking two children with an option for three. Okay. She blew out a breath. All right. I should have known you'd already figured it out. I'm a farmer. We plan. Then we hope fate cooperates. He bent to pluck a sprig of rosemary from the kitchen garden. For remembrance, he said as he gave it to her. While you're waiting for me, remember we have a life to plan, as messy and noisy as we like. She went inside with him, and there was Lila, as she was so often, working at the sink. The air smelled of coffee and biscuits and the sweet rose scent Lila sprayed on every morning. You come in late for breakfast, she said. Lucky for you, I'm in a good mood. She'd been watching them for the last few minutes with a lightness of heart. They looked right together. She'd been waiting to see her boy look right with someone. Well, sit down. Coffee's fresh enough. I made up some flatjack batter nobody's bothered to eat. Is my mother upstairs? She is, and the judge is cooling his heels in the front parlor. Lila was already getting down mugs. Don't have much to say to me today. Been on the phone considerable and got her door shut. That sister of yours, she don't even bother coming home last night. Cade's stomach clutched. Faith's not home. Nothing to worry on. She's with Doc Wade. Breezed out of here yesterday saying that's where she'd be and I'd see her when I see her. Seems nobody sleeps in their own bed around here these days but me. Too damn hot for all these carryings on. Sit down and eat. I need to speak to my mother. Feed her, he ordered, pointing at Tori. I'm not a puppy, Tori muttered as he strode away. Don't go to any trouble, Lila. Sit down and take that martyr look off your face. It's his place to settle things with his mama, not yours to fuss your head over it. She got out the griddle to heat, and you'll eat what I put in front of you. I'm beginning to think he takes after you. Why shouldn't he? I did most of the raising of him. I'm not speaking against Miss Margaret. Some women aren't built to be mothers, is all. Don't make them less, just makes them what they are. She got a bowl out of the refrigerator, peeled back the cover. I was sorry to hear about your mother. Thank you. Lila stood a moment, bowl in the crook of her arm, her eyes dark and warm on Tori's face. Some women, she said again, aren't built for mothering. That's why, just like the song says, God blesses the child who's got his own. You got your own, honey, you always did. For the first time since she'd heard the news of her mother's death, Tori wept. Cade stopped at the parlor first, 
Manners would never have permitted him to walk by an old family friend. Judge? Gerald turned and the stern contemplative lines of his face relaxed fractionally when he saw Cade. I was hoping I'd have a chance to speak with you this morning. I hope you can spare me a minute. Of course, Cade stepped in, gestured to a chair. I hope you're well. A little arthritis acts up now and again. Old age, Gerald gestured at a side as he sat. Ever think it's going to happen to you, then you wake up one day and wonder who the hell that old man is in your shaving mirror. Well, Gerald laid his palms on the knees of his trousers. I've known you since you were born. So, there's no need to pick your words, Cade finished. I'm aware my mother has spoken to you about some legalities and changes in her will. She's a proud woman, and she's concerned for you. Is she? Cade lifted his eyebrows as if fascinated by that information. She needn't be. I'm fine, more than fine. If her concern is for Beaurev, he continued, it's also misplaced. We're having a very good year, better, I think, even than last. Gerald cleared his throat. Cade, I knew your father most of my life, was his friend. I hope you'll take what I have to say in that spirit. If you would postpone your personal plans, take a bit more time to consider. I'm fully aware of a man's needs and desires, but... When those desires are put ahead of duty, of practicality, and most of all ahead of family, it can never come to good. I've asked Tori to marry me. I don't need my mother's blessing, or yours for that matter. I can only regret those blessings aren't forthcoming. Cade, you're a young man with your life in front of you. I'm only asking as a friend of both your parents for you to take time to consider, time you can well spare at your age, to look at the entire picture particularly now that this tragedy has come into Tori Bodine's life. A tragedy, Gerald added, that speaks volumes of who and what she comes from. You were just a boy yourself when she lived here and were sheltered from the harder facts of life. What facts would they be? Gerald sighed. Hannibal Bodine is a dangerous man, undoubtedly ill in his mind. Such things come down in the blood. Now, I have every sympathy for the child, make no mistake, but there's no change in what is. Is this uh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, or is it uh, as a twig is bent so it grows? Irritation flickered over Gerald's face. Either is apt. Victoria Bodine lived in that house under his hand, too long not to be bent by it. Under his hand, Cade said carefully. Figuratively, and I'm afraid literally. Many years ago, Iris Mooney, Victoria's maternal grandmother, came to see me. She wanted to sue the Bodines for custody of the girl. She said Bodine beat the child. She wanted to hire you. She did. However, she had no proof of this abuse, no substantiation. I have no doubt, had none then, that she was telling the truth, but you knew, Cade said very quietly. You knew that he was beating her, putting welts and bruises on her, and you did nothing? The law, fuck the law, he spoke in that same deadly cool voice as he got to his feet. She came to you for help because she wanted to take a child out of a nightmare. And you did nothing. It was not my place to interfere with the blood family. She had no proof. The case was weak, flustered Gerald Rose as well. He was unused to being questioned or looked at with such disgust. There were no police reports, none from social services, just the word of a grandmother. If I had taken the case, nothing would have come of it. We'll never know, will we, because you didn't take the case. You didn't try to help. It was not my place, Gerald said again. It was your place. It's everyone's place. But she got through it without you, without anyone. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have personal business. He walked out quickly. Upstairs, Cade knocked on his mother's door. It occurred to him that there had often been closed doors in this house, barriers that required a polite request before they were removed. Manners forever took precedence here over intimacy. That would change. He could promise himself that. The doors of Beaurev would be open. His children wouldn't have to wait like company for an invitation to enter. Come in, Margaret continued to pack. She'd seen Cade drive up with that woman and had been expecting him to knock. She assumed he would ask her to change her mind about leaving, would attempt to reach a compromise. He was a deal-maker, she mused, as she laid tissue paper between precisely folded blouses, as his father had been. It would give her enormous satisfaction to listen to his requests and offers, and refuse them all. I'm sorry to disturb you. 
The prologue came automatically. He'd said the same thing countless times when admitted to her rooms. And I'm sorry you and I find ourselves at odds. She didn't bother to look over. I've made arrangements to have my luggage picked up this afternoon. I will naturally expect the rest of my belongings to be shipped to me. I have a partial list of what is mine. It will take a bit more time to complete. I've acquired a number of possessions in my years in this house. Of course. Have you decided where you'll be staying? The smooth tone of the question had her hands fumbling, her gaze darting toward him. I've made no permanent arrangements. Such things require careful consideration. Yes. I thought you might be more comfortable in a house of your own and somewhere nearby, as you have ties to the community. We own the property at the corner of Magnolia and Maine. It's an attractive brick house, two stories, with a well-established yard and garden. It's tenanted at the moment, but the lease runs out in just over two months. If you're interested, I'll give the tenants notice. Staggered, she stared at him. How easily you put me out. I'm not putting you out. The choice is yours. You're welcome to stay here at your home and can continue to be. But it will also be Tori's home. You'll see what she is eventually, but she'll have ruined you by then. Her mother was trash, her father is a murderer, and she herself is nothing but an opportunist, a calculating sneak who never knew her place. Her place is here with me. If you can't accept that and her, then you'll have to make your place elsewhere. Sometimes, for some people, the answer was yes or no. It occurred to him that this time it applied to him as much as his mother. The house on Magnolia is yours if you want it. If, however, you prefer to go elsewhere, Beau Rev will acquire the property of your choice. Out of guilt? No, Mama, I have no guilt for taking my happiness or loving a woman I also admire and respect. Respect, Margaret spat out. You can speak of respect? Yes, I've never known anyone I respect more. So guilt plays no part here, but I will see to it you have a comfortable home. I need nothing from you. I have money of my own. I know that. Take whatever time you need to decide. Whatever that decision is, I hope you'll be happy with it, or at least content. I wish... He closed his eyes a moment, weary from maintaining the facade of manners. I wish there was more between us than this. I wish I knew why there can't be. We disappoint each other, Mama. I'm sorry for that. She had to press her lips together to stop their trembling. When I leave this house, you'll be dead to me. Grief swam into his eyes, swirled there, then cleared away. Yes, I know. He stepped back, then quietly shut the door between them. Alone, Margaret sank onto the bed and listened to the silence. Cade gathered what paperwork he thought he'd need over the next day or two and listened to his phone messages while he loaded his briefcase. He needed to check in with Piney, return calls from the factory, and run by a couple of the rental units. There was a board meeting the next day, but that could be rescheduled. His quarterly meeting with his bookkeeper couldn't. He'd just have to find a safe place to plant Tory for a few hours. He glanced at his watch, picked up the phone. Faith answered, her voice slurred with sleep. Where's Wade? Hmm, down with a cocker spaniel or something. What time is it? It's after nine. Go away, I'm sleeping. I'm coming into town. Tori's with me. She's making noises about going into the shop. She doesn't plan to open today, but I expect she wants to find something to keep her busy. I want you to keep an eye out, then go over and stay with her. Maybe you didn't hear me. I'm sleeping. Get up. We'll be there within a half hour. You're awful damn bossy this morning. I don't want either of you alone until Bodine's in custody. You stick with her, you hear. I'll be back around as soon as I can. What the hell am I supposed to do with her? You'll think of something. Get up, he repeated, then broke the connection. Satisfied, he carried his briefcase downstairs. The first thing he noticed was that Tori's plate was nearly cleared. The second was that she'd been crying. What's wrong? What did you say to her? Oh, stop fussing. Lila swatted him off like a fly. She's had herself a nice weep, and she's the better for it. Isn't that so, little girl? Yes, thanks. I can't eat any more, Lila. I really can't. Lips pursed, Lila studied the plate, then nodded. You did all right. She glanced over at Cade. Will Miss Margaret or the judge be wanting breakfast? I don't think so. My mother's made arrangements to leave this afternoon. She's going through with it. Apparently. I don't want you staying here alone, Lila. I thought you might like to visit your sister for a couple of days. I could do that. She picked up Tori's plate to carry it to the sink. I'll wait and see if it's all the same to you, Cade. I'll check in later. Best thing, her going.
she breaks free of this house, she'll be the happier for it in the long run. I hope you're right. You call your sister, he said, and held out a hand for Tori. Tori got to her feet and, after a moment's hesitation, stepped over to press her cheek to Lila's. Thank you. You're a good girl. Just remember to hold on to your own. I'm going to. She waited until they were outside in the car and driving down the tree-lined lane away from the house. I don't want a big wedding. Cade arched his brows. Okay. I'd like to do it as quietly as possible and as... And? He made the turn onto the road. Tori glanced out the window toward the edges of the swamp. And as soon as possible. Why? How like him to ask, she thought, and turned to him again. Because I want to start our life. I want to begin. We'll arrange for the license tomorrow. Will that suit you? Yes. She laid a hand over his. That suits me fine. Smiling at him, she saw nothing, felt nothing from the marsh, or what waited in it. Faith strolled across to Southern Comfort when she saw Cade's car pull up. She put on a big smile and hooked her arm companionably through Cade's. There you are. I thought you'd forgotten. Forgotten? Remember, honey, you said I could borrow your car today. Here you go. She dropped her own keys in his hand and fluttered her lashes. So sweet of you, too. Isn't he just the best brother, Tori? He knows I have a partiality for his little convertible, and he's always letting me borrow it. She nipped the keys out of Cade's fingers and gave him a big, noisy kiss. Tori, I'm just bored silly with Wade so busy today. I'm just going to keep you company a while, all right? I'm thinking of buying Wade one of those fat candlesticks you've got in here. Smoothly, she transferred her grip from Cade to Tori. His place could sure use some fixing up. Well, you've seen it yourself, so you know. Looks like I'm going to be spending more time there, and I just can't abide that primitive male decor of his. Cars around the back of Wade's building, she called out to Kate as she steered Tori toward the door. It's low on gas. With a last glance at Kate's annoyed face, Tori unlocked the shop. Was the car a bribe? No, he didn't bother to offer a bribe. He woke me up this morning, so he's got to pay a price. He wants us looking out for each other. Where's your dog? Oh, she's having a fine time at Wade's. Faith turned to the window and waved cheerfully to Cade. Oh, he's steaming. He just hates for me to drive this toy of his. So naturally, you drive it as often as possible. Naturally. Got anything cold to drink? It's hot enough to steal your breath out there today. In the back, help yourself. Are you opening today? No, I don't want people today, so don't be offended if I ignore you. Same goes. Faith slipped into the back room and came back with two bottles of Coke. Tori had the music on low and was busy with glass cleaner and a cloth. You might as well give me something to do before I die of boredom. Tori held out the cloth. You ought to be able to manage this. I have plenty of work in the back. Please don't let anyone in. If someone comes to the door, just tell them we're closed today. Fine by me. She shrugged as Tori went into the back, then entertained herself by rearranging stock to her liking, imagining what it would be like to run a shop. Entirely too much work, she decided. Too much trouble. Though it was fun to be around so many nice things and speculate who would buy what. She found the keys for the jewelry case behind the counter and tried on several pairs of earrings, admired a bracelet fashioned out of a coil of silver, and tried that on as well. When someone knocked on the door, she jumped guiltily and closed the display. She didn't recognize the faces. The man and woman stood outside the door, studying her as she studied them. It was a shame, Faith thought, that Tori wasn't open. At least customers would be a diversion. Faith smiled brightly and tapped the closed sign. The woman held up a badge. Whoops. The FBI, she thought. An even better diversion. She unlocked the door. Miss Bodine? No, she's in the back. Faith took a moment to size them up. The woman was tall and tough with short black hair and cool, dark eyes. She wore what Faith considered a very unflattering gray suit and dead ugly shoes. The man had more potential with curling brown hair and a square jaw with a sexy little dent in it. She tried the smile on him and got the faintest glimmer of response. I've never met an FBI agent before. I guess I'm a little flustered. Would you ask Miss Bodine to come out? The woman requested. Of course. Just excuse me for one minute. Y'all wait right here. She hurried to the stockroom and closed the door behind her. It's the FBI. Tori's head snapped up. Here? Right out there. A man and a woman and nothing like those two on the TV show. He's not half bad, but she's wearing a suit I wouldn't be buried in. She's a Yankee, too. I don't know about him. He hadn't opened his mouth. Ask me. She runs the show. For God's sake, what do I care about that? 
Tori got to her feet, but her knees were shaking. Before she could steady herself, there was a brisk knock on the door, and it opened. Miss Bodine? Yes, I, I'm Special Agent Tatcha Lynn Williams. The woman showed her badge again. And this is Special Agent Marks. We need to speak with you. Have you found my father? Not at this time. Has he contacted you? No, I haven't seen him or heard from him. He'd know I wouldn't help him. We'd like to ask you some questions. Williams gave Faith a pointed look. Instantly, Faith scooted behind the desk to wrap an arm around Tori's shoulder. This is my brother's fiance. I promised him I'd stay with her. I won't break my word to my brother. Marks took out his notebook, flipped pages. And you would be... Faith LaVale, Tori's going through a very distressing time. I'm staying with her. You're acquainted with Hannibal Bodine? I know him, and I believe he killed my sister 18 years ago. We have no evidence of that, William said flatly. Miss Bodine, when did you last see your mother? In April. My uncle and I went to see her. I've been estranged from my parents for a number of years. I hadn't seen her since I was 20, or my father either, until he came here to my shop. And at that time you were aware he was a fugitive? Yes. Yet you gave him money. He took money, Tory corrected, but I'd have given it to him to keep him away from me. Your father was physically violent with you. All of my life, giving in, Tory sat. And with your mother? No, not really. He didn't have to be. I believe he battered her in more recent years when I wasn't there, but that would be speculation. I'm told you don't have to speculate, Williams glanced up, fixed her eyes on Tori's face. You claim to be psychic. I don't claim anything. You were involved in several cases of abducted children a few years ago. What would that have to do with my mother's murder? You were friends with Hope Lavelle. Marks picked up the pattern smoothly, slid into a chair himself while his partner remained standing. Yes, very good friends. And you led her family and the authorities to her body. Yes, I'm sure you have the reports. There's nothing I can add to them. You claim to have seen her murder. When Tori didn't respond, Marks leaned forward. Recently, you enlisted the aid of Abigail Lawrence, an attorney in Charleston. You were interested in a series of sexual homicides. Why? Because they were all killed by the same person, the same person who murdered Hope. Because each of them was Hope to him at a different age. You sense this, Williams commented and drew Tori's gaze. I know this. I don't expect you to believe me. If you know this, Williams continued, why didn't you come forward? To what purpose? To amuse someone like you? To have what happened to Jonah Mansfield dragged up again and my part in it thrown in my face? You know all there is to know about me, Agent Williams. Marks took a plastic bag from his pocket, tossed it on the desk. Inside was a single earring, a simple gold hoop. What can you tell me about that? Tori kept her hands in her lap. It's an earring. One of the things we know is you're very cool under fire. William stepped forward. You were interested enough in the murders to gather information on them. Aren't you interested enough to see what you can pick up, let's say, from that? I've told you all I can about my father. I'll do whatever I can to help you find him. Marks picked up the bag. Start with this. Was it my mother's? Without thinking, Tori snatched it out of his hand, broke the seal, then closed her fingers over the earring. She opened herself, wanting this last connection more than she'd realized. She shivered once, then dropped the earring onto the desk. The mate's in your pocket, she said to Williams. You took them off as you were driving into town. Put this one in here. Her eyes tracked up, stayed level. I'm not required to put myself on display for you. I apologize. William stepped forward to pick up the earring. I do know quite a bit about you, Miss Bodine. I was interested in the work you did in New York. I've studied the Mansfield case. She slipped the earring back into her pocket. They should have listened to you. She gave her partner a quiet look. I intend to. There's nothing more I can tell you. She got to her feet. Faith, would you show them out, please? Sure. Williams took out a card, laid it on the desk, then followed Faith out of the storeroom. Minutes later, Faith came back in, took out a fresh Coke, and settled down in the chair Marks had vacated. You could tell that just by touching that earring. You knew it was hers and all that just by touching it. I have work to do. Oh, get over yourself. Faith took a long swig from the bottle. I swear, I've never known anybody who takes every damn thing so serious. What we ought to do is go buy ourselves some lottery tickets or run on up to the racetrack. Can you tell with horses? I don't see why you couldn't. For God's sake. 
Well, why not? Why can't you have some fun with it? It doesn't have to be some dark, depressing weight. Oh, I've got it. Better than horses. We'll go to Vegas and play blackjack. Jesus Christ, Tori, we'd break the bank in every casino. It's not something to profit from. Why not? Oh, of course, I forgot this is you. You'd rather mope about it. Poor little me. Faith dabbed an invisible hanky under her eye. I'm psychic, so I must suffer. The insult was so huge, Tori couldn't imagine why her lips wanted to twitch into a ridiculous grin. I'm not moping. You would, given half a chance. I'm an expert on moping. She edged a hip onto the desk. Come on over to Wade's with me. You can, like, brush up against him or whatever and find out what's going on in his head about me. I will not. Oh, be a pal. No, you're such a bitch. That's right, now go away and put that bracelet back where you got it. Fine, it's not my style anyway. She leaned over the desk. What am I thinking right now? Tori glanced up and her mouth quivered. It's inventive, but anatomically impossible. She swiveled back to her keyboard. Faith, thanks. With a sniff, Faith pulled open the door. For what? For deliberately annoying me so I wouldn't mope. Oh, that, my pleasure. It's so easy after all. 29. Wait, honey. Faith cocked the phone on her shoulder and peered over the counter toward the storeroom where it seemed to her Tori had been holed up for ten days. You busy? Me? Of course not. I just finished neutering a dachshund. Another day in paradise. Oh, what exactly do you... No, never mind. I don't think I want to know. How's my baby? I'm just fine. And how are you? I meant B. Is she all right? Usurped by puppy breath. He let out a weighty sigh for form. She's enjoying herself. I'm sure she'll tell you all about her first day at work later. I'm having a first day at work, too, sort of. Faith studied, with a surprising sense of satisfaction, the glass displays she'd polished to a sparkle. What time do you think you're going to be done over there? I should be wrapped up by 5.30. What'd you have in mind? I have Cade's convertible, and I was thinking how it would be if we took us a long drive. It's so hot and sticky. I'm not wearing a thing but that red dress. With a sly smile on her face, she twirled a lock of hair around her finger. You remember my red dress, don't you, honey? There was a long, long pause. You're trying to kill me. Her laugh was low and satisfied. I'm just trying to be sure, since we've been spending a lot of time lately having conversations and so forth, that a certain part of our relationship is neglected. I can get behind that. Then why don't we take that drive? We could find us a cheap motel and play traveling salesman. What are you selling? This time her laugh was long and robust. Oh, honey, just trust me. The price is going to be right. Then I'm buying. We'd have to drive back late tonight or early tomorrow morning. I have appointments. That'll be fine. She was getting used to this making plans business. Wade? Yeah? You remember how you said you were in love with me? I seem to recollect something of the sort. Well, I think I love you back. And you know what? It doesn't feel half bad. There was another long pause. I think I can get out of here by 5.15. I'll pick you up. She hung up and danced around the counter. Tori, come on out of there. Might as well be in jail, she stated as she pulled open the door. Tori merely looked up from her inventory list. You've never actually had a job, have you? What would I want one of those for? I have an inheritance. Fulfillment, self-satisfaction, the pleasure of completing a task. All right, I'll work with you. Have they built a ski lift in hell? No, really, it might be fun, but we'll talk about that later. Now, you have to come along with me. i got to run home and get some things together. Go ahead. Where I go, you go. I promised Cade. And we've played here your way for, she checked her watch, rolled her eyes, almost four hours. I haven't finished here. Well, I have. And if we stay here the rest of the day, those FBI people might come back. All right. Tori tossed down her pencil, but I promised my grandmother I'd be at my uncle's by five. That's perfect. I'll drop you off there before I pick up Wade. Grab us a couple of Cokes, honey. I'm just parched. Faith breezed out to freshen her lipstick in one of Tori's decorative mirrors. Since when do you have a reflection? Tori asked sweetly as she brought out the bottles. Unoffended, Faith slipped the top on the lipstick tube and dropped it in her purse. You're just cross because you've been holed up in your cave all day. You're going to thank me when we get out on the road and I open up that beauty of Cade's. Get some wind in your hair. It might actually have a little style. There's nothing wrong with my hair. Not a thing if you want to look like an old maid librarian. That's a ridiculous cliché and an insult to an entire profession. Faith stood another moment at the mirror, fluffed her own sleek blonde mane. 
Have you seen Miss Matilda down at the Progress Library lately? Despite her best intentions, Tori's lips quivered. Oh, shut up, she suggested, and shoved the Coke bottle into Faith's hands. That's what I like about you, always the snappy comeback. She gave her hair a toss, then started to leave. Well, come on. You change things. Tori scanned the shelves, the cases, noted the small shifts in stock. Snappy comebacks, Faith thought, and an eye like a damn hawk. So? She wanted to complain, nearly did on principle, but honesty got the better of her. It's not bad. Excuse me, I'm so overwhelmed with flattery I feel a little faint. In that case, I'll drive. The hell you will! Laughing Faith danced out the door. As she followed, locked up, Tori realized she was enjoying herself. Dealing with Faith made it impossible to brood. The idea of a fast ride in an open car held a great deal of appeal. She'd focus on that, just that, and worry about the rest later. Fasten your seat belt, she ordered as she slid into the passenger seat. Oh, right. The air's so thick you could chew it. Faith clicked her belt on, took out her sunglasses, then turned the key. Gunning the engine, she gave Tori a mischievous grin. Now for some mood music. She punched the CD button, flipping through until Bob Seeger wailed out about rock and roll. Ah, classical, perfect. We're about to see what you're made of, Victoria. Deliberately, Tori took out her own sunglasses, slipped them on. Stern stuff. Good. Faith waited for a break in traffic, then shot away from the curb in a screaming U-turn. She nipped through the light at the square seconds before it turned red. You're going to get a ticket before you get out of town. Oh, I bet the FBI's keeping our locals plenty busy. Jesus, don't you just love this car? Why don't you buy one of your own? Then I'd miss the fun of nagging Kay to death about borrowing it. She crossed the town limits and poured it on. The wind whipped over Tori's face, tore at her hair, and thrilled her blood. An adventure, she thought, as they streamed around turns. Foolishness. It had been a long, long time since she indulged in simple idiocy. Speed. Hope had loved going fast, riding her bike like it was a stallion or a rocket ship, daring the devil as she threw her arms high in the air and gave herself to the moment. Tori did the same now, throwing her head back and letting the speed and the music pour over her. The smells were summer, and summer was childhood. Hot tar melting under the searing sun, still water going ripe in the heat. She could race through the fields when the cotton had burst from its bowls and pretend she was an explorer on an alien planet. Do cartwheels across the road and feel the tar go soft under her palms, into the marsh that was any world she wanted it to be. Running there, running with the ground spongy under her feet, with the moss tumbling down and mosquitoes singing for blood, running, running away, with her heart pounding and a scream trapped in her throat, running. There's Kate! What? Tori jerked back, lightheaded, clammy, her eyes wide and nearly blind as she swiveled her head. There! Carelessly, Faith gestured toward the field where two men stood in a sea of green cotton. She gave the horn a cheerful toot, waved, and laughed. Oh, he's cursing us now, giving Piney an earful about his crazy, irresponsible sister. Don't you worry, she added smugly. He'll just figure I'm trying to corrupt you. I'm all right. Tori forced herself to breathe in, breathe out. I'm fine. Faith gave her a longer, more considering look. Sure you are. You sure go pale, though. Why don't you— Oh, shit! The rabbit darted across the road, a brown streak of confusion. Instinctively, Faith hit the brakes and swerved. The car fishtailed, squealed, and under her firm hands found its balance again. I just can't stand hitting anything, though God knows why they run out like that. Seems they wait for a car to come along, and... She trailed off as she looked at Tori again. The snicker escaped before she cleared her throat and slowed down. Uh-oh. Saying nothing, Tori looked down. Most of the coke that had been in the bottle was now splattered all over her shirt. With two fingertips, she pulled it away from her skin and slanted her gaze to Faith. Well, gee whiz, I couldn't run down the little bunny, could I? Just do me a favor and get me home so I can change, okay? Tapping her fingers on the wheel, Faith swung into Tori's lane, kicking dust and gravel into the air as she braked. Laughing but cautious, Faith hopped out of the car. I'll run some cold water over that shirt while you clean up. Shame to ruin it, even if it is deadly ordinary. Classic. You keep believing that. Pleased with the diversion, Faith strolled up the steps. You take your time straightening yourself up, she said as Tori pulled open the door. You need it more than I do. I don't suppose it takes long to look ready to hop in the next available bed. Grinning, Faith followed her into the bedroom, then making herself at home, she opened Tori's closet and poked through. 
Hey, some of this stuff's not half bad. Get your fingers out of my clothes. This is a good color for me. She pulled out a silk blouse in a deep, dusky blue, then turned to the mirror. Brings out my eyes. Stripped down to her bra, Tori snatched the blouse and shoved the damp shirt at Faith. Go make yourself useful. Faith rolled her eyes but headed out to rinse the shirt in the bathroom sink. If you're not wearing it in the next few days, you could lend it to me. I was thinking Wade and I could have an evening at home tomorrow night. If things go as they're supposed to, I wouldn't have it on that long anyway. Then it doesn't matter what you wear. A statement like that just proves you need me. Faith splashed the shirt around in the bowl. What a woman wears is directly related to how she wants a man to respond. Tori reached in her closet for a white camp shirt, frowned, then eyed the silk blouse. Well, why not? Tori buttoned the blouse and walked to the mirror to brush out her hair. It needed to be tamed and tied back, she told herself. She was going to comfort her grandmother to do what she could to help hold what was left of her family together. It wasn't the time for the frivolous or the selfish now. Though God, she'd needed just that and wouldn't forget that Faith had provided it. Lifting her arm, she began to work her hair into a braid. The repetitive motion, the hum of the ceiling fan, lulled her until her eyes were half-closed and she was smiling dreamily into the mirror. She saw the rabbit dart out into the road, a panicked brown streak, running, fleeing from the scent of man. Someone was coming. Someone was watching. Her arms froze over her head and the panic tripped her heart. The air went thick, heavy, edged with the faintest taste of stale whiskey. She scented him, prey to hunt her. In one leap, she was at the nightstand, and the gun Kate had given her was in her hand. There was a whimper in the back of her throat, but she closed it off. All that came out was the ragged panting of fear. She rushed from the room just as Faith wandered out of the bathroom. I left it soaking. You can wring it out when... She saw the gun first, then Tori's face. Oh, God, was all she managed before Tori grabbed her arm. Listen to me. Don't ask questions. There isn't much time. Go out the front. Hurry. Get in the car and go for help. Get help. I'll stop him if I can. Come on with me. Come on now. No. Tori broke away, swung toward the kitchen. He's coming. Go. She ran toward the back of the house to give Faith time to escape and to face her father. He kicked in the back door, lurched through. His clothes were filthy, his face and arms raw with scratches and the swollen bites of greedy insects. He swayed a little, but his eyes stayed steady on his daughter's face. He had an empty bottle in one hand and a gun in the other. I've been waiting for you. Tori tightened her grip on the revolver. I know. Where's that Lavelle bitch? Gone. Safe, Tori thought, then said, There's no one here but me. You lying little whore. You don't take two steps without that rich man's brat. I want to talk to her, he grinned. I want to talk to both of you. Hope's dead. There's just me now. That's right, that's right. He lifted the bottle, then realizing it was empty, heaved it against the wall where it shattered like gunshots. Got herself killed. Asked for it. Both of you asked for everything you got, lying and sneaking, touching each other in unholy ways. There was nothing but innocence between me and hope. Tori strained her ears for the panther roar of Cade's engine, but heard nothing. You think I didn't know? He gestured wildly with the gun, but she didn't flinch. You think I didn't see you swimming naked, floating in the water, splashing in it so it ran down your bodies? It sickened her that he could twist a simple childhood memory into the profane. We were eight years old, but you weren't. The sin was in you, it always was. No, you stay back. She lifted the gun now and the trembling ran from her shoulder to her fingertips. You won't lay a hand on me again or anyone else. Didn't Mama give you enough money this time? Didn't she move fast enough? Is that why you did it? I never raised my hand to your mother unless she needed it. God made man head of the house. Put that down and get me a drink. The police are on their way by now. They've been looking for you, for Hope, for Mama, for all the others. The gun jerked in her hand as he came forward. In her mind, there was the hiss and snap of a Sam Brown belt. You come near me and we won't wait for them. I'll end it now. You think you worry me you never had a lick of gumption. Nobody's ever said that about me. Faith stepped up behind Tori. The little gun gleamed in her hand. If she won't shoot you, I promise I will. You said she was dead. You said she was dead. He was a big man with a long reach. In panic as much as fury, he lunged, knocking Tori hard against the wall. A gunshot rang out and the smell of blood drenched her senses. She stumbled back against Faith as her father howled and stormed out the broken doorway. I told you to go. Teeth chattering, Tori went down to her knees. Well, I didn't listen, did I? Because her vision was going gray, Faith braced against the wall and shook her head fiercely. 
I used Kate's car phone to call the police. You came back? Yeah. Blowing little panting breaths, Faith bent over from the waist to try to get some blood back in her head. You wouldn't have left me. There was blood. I smelled blood. Instantly, Tori was on her feet, jerking Faith upright again. Are you shot? Did he shoot you? No, it was you. You shot him. Tori, snap out of it. Tori stared down at her own hand. The gun was still in it, shaking as if it were alive. With a little gasp of shock, she dropped it, clattering to the floor. I shot him? Your gun went off when he shoved you, I think. God, it happens so fast. There was blood on his shirt, I'm sure that much. And I didn't fire. I think I'm going to be sick. I hate being sick. Sirens. Hearing them, Faith rested her head back against the wall. Oh, thank God. Then she heard the roar of an engine and shoved away from the wall. Oh, no. Oh, Jesus. Cade's car. I left the keys in the car. Before Tori could stop her, she was darting toward the front door. They burst out together in time to see the car squeal onto the road. Cade's going to kill me. Tori drew in a breath like a sob, but when it came out, it was laughter, edging toward hysteria, but laughter. We just chased off a madman, and you're worried about your big brother? Only you. Well, Cade can be pretty fierce. As much to comfort as to support herself, Faith draped an arm around Tori's shoulder. Tori let her head droop and closed her eyes. The scream of sirens battered her ears. She saw hands on the wheel of the car, her father's hands scored deep with scratches. She felt the speed, the dance of the tires as the car was whipped around, coming back, pushing for speed. The radio blaring hot rock, lights whirling. You see them in the rearview mirror as your eyes dart up. Panic, outrage, hate, they're getting closer. Your arm burns from the bullet and the blood drips. But you'll get away. God's on your side. He left the car for you fast, faster. A test, it's just another test. You'll get away, have to get away. But you'll come back for her. Oh, you'll come back and you'll make her pay. Hands slicked with blood. The wheel spins out of your grip. The world rushes at you, shapes tumbling. Screaming, is that you screaming? Tori, for God's sake, Tori, stop it, wake up. She came back, face down on the shoulder of the road, her body jerking, screams ripping through her head. Don't do this. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm all right. Painfully, Tori rolled over, shielded her eyes with her arm. I just need a minute. All right, you went tearing out to the road when they drove by. I was afraid you were going to run right out in front of them. Then your eyes rolled back in your head and you went down. Faith dropped her head in her hands. This is too much for me. This is just more than enough. It's all right. It's over. He's dead. I think I figured that part out. Look. She pointed down the road. The flames and smoke pillared up and the sun bounced off the chrome and glass of the police cars circled in the distance. I heard the crash, then a kind of explosion. A fiery death, Tori murmured. I wished it on him. He wished it on himself. I won't wade. Oh, my God, I won't wade. We'll get someone to call him. Steadier, Tori got to her feet, held out a hand for faith. We'll go down and ask someone to call him. Okay. I feel a little drunk. Me too. We'll just hold on to each other. Arms wrapped around each other's waists, they started down the road. The heat bounced off the asphalt, shimmered on the air. Through the waves of it, Tori saw the fire, the spin of lights, the dull beige of the government car with the FBI agents beside it. Do you see where he crashed? Tori murmured. Just across from where Hope, just on the bend of the road, across from Hope. She heard the car coming behind them, stopped, and turned. Cade leaped out, raced forward to wrap his arms around both of them. You're all right. You're all right. I heard the sirens, then saw the fire. Oh, God. I thought... He didn't hurt us. Cade's scent was there, sweat and man. Hers. Tori let it fill her. He's dead. I felt him die. Shh, don't. I'm going to get you home, both of you. I won't wade. He pressed his lips to the top of Faith's head. We'll get him, honey. Come on with me. Hold on to me for now. He took your car, Cade. Faith kept her eyes shut, her face pressed against her brother's chest. I'm sorry. Cade only shook his head and held her tighter. Don't think about it. Everything's going to be all right. Clinging to control by a thread, he helped them into the car. As he drove forward, Agent Williams stepped out in the road and signaled. 
Miss Bodine, can you verify that's your father? She gestured toward the wreck, that Hannibal Bodine was driving that vehicle. Yes, he's dead. I need to ask you a few questions. Not here, not now. Cage shoved the truck back in first gear. You come to Beaurev when you're done out here. I'm taking them home. All right. Williams looked past him toward Tory. Are you injured? Not anymore. Her mind went dull for a while. She was aware, in a secondary way, of Cade taking her into the house, leading her up the stairs. She drifted a little further away when he laid her on a bed. After a while, there was something cool on her face. She opened her eyes and looked into his. I'm all right, just a little tired. I got one of Faith's nightgowns. You'll feel better once we get it on you. No. She sat up, put her arms around him. Now I feel better. He stroked her hair gently. Then his grip vised around her and he buried his face in her hair. I need a minute. <laughs> Me too, probably a lot of minutes. Don't let go. I won't. I can't. I saw you all go by, Faith driving like a maniac. I was going to blister her good for it. <laughs> she did it on purpose. She loves to agitate you. Well, she did, plenty. I stalked back over the fields, vowing to pay her back for it, with Piney walking along with me, grinning like an idiot. Then I heard the shot, like to stop my heart. I started running, but I was still a good piece from the road in the car when the police went by. I saw the explosion. I thought I'd lost you. He began to rock her. I thought I'd lost you, Tori. I was in the car with him in my mind. I think I wanted to be so I'd know the exact moment it was over. He can't ever touch you again. No, I can't touch any of us again. She rested her head on the strong curve of his shoulder. Where's Faith? She's downstairs. Wade's here. She can't keep still. He leaned back, let his gaze roam her face. She'll rev until she falls down, and he'll be there for her. She stayed with me, just like you asked her to. She let out a sigh. I have to go to my grandmother. She's coming here. I called her. This is your home now, Tori. We'll get your things from the Marsh House later. That sounds like a very good idea. Dusk had fallen when she walked the gardens with her grandmother. I wish you'd stay here with us, Gran, you and Cecil. J.R. needs me. He lost a sister, one he wasn't able to save from herself. I lost a child. Her voice cracked. I lost her long ago. Still, no matter how you deny it, there's always that stubborn hope that you'll get it all back and put it right. Now that's gone. I don't know what to do for you. You're doing it. You're alive and you're happy. She clung to Tori's hand. She couldn't seem to stop holding, stop touching. We all have to make our peace with this in our own way. Iris drew in a steadying breath. I'm going to bury her here in progress. I think that's the way it should be. She had some happy years here and, well, J.R. wants it. I don't want a church service. I'm holding against him on that. We'll bury her day after tomorrow in the morning. If J.R. wants it, his minister can say a few words at the gravesite. I won't blame you, Tori, if you choose not to come. Of course I'll come. I'm glad. Iris lowered to a bench. The fireflies were out, bumping their lights against the dark. Funerals are for the living to help close a gap. You'll be better for it. She drew Tori down beside her. I'm feeling my age, honeypot. Don't say that. Oh, it'll pass. I won't tolerate otherwise, but tonight I'm feeling old and tired. They say a parent isn't meant to outlive the child, but nature and fate, they decide what's meant. We just live with it. We'll all live with this, Tori. I want to know you're going to take what's in front of you with both hands and hold it tight. I am. I will. Hope sister knows how to do that. I'm taking lessons. I always liked that girl. She mean to marry my Wade? I think he means to marry her, and he's going to let her think it was her idea. Clever boy, and a steady one. He'll keep her in line without bruising her wings. I'm going to see both my grandchildren happy. That's what I'm holding on to tight, Tori. 30. Wade fought with the knot of his tie. He hated the damn things. Every time he put one on, it brought a flashback of his mother wearing an Easter hat that looked like an overturned bowl of flowers, strangling him into a bright blue tie to match his much-hated bright blue suit. He'd been six and figured it had traumatized him for life. You wore ties for weddings and you wore ties for funerals. There was no getting around it, even if you were lucky enough to have a profession that didn't require a goddamn noose around your neck every day of the week. They were burying his aunt in an hour. There was no getting around that either. 
It was raining, a thundering bitch of a storm. Funerals demanded lousy weather, he figured, just like they demanded ties and black crepe and overly sweet-scented flowers. He'd have given a year of his life to have crawled back in bed, pulled the covers over his head, and let the entire mess happen without him. Maxine said she'll be glad to look after the dogs, Faith announced. She walked in, dressed in the most dignified black dress she could find in her closet. Wade, what have you done to that tie? I tied it. That's what you do with ties. Mauled it's more like. Here, let me see what I can do. She plucked at it, tugged, twisted. Don't fuss. It doesn't matter. Not if you want to go out looking like you got a black goiter under your chin. My great-aunt Harriet had goiters, and they were not attractive. Just hold still a minute. I've nearly got it. Just let it be, Faith. He turned away from her to pick up his suit jacket. I want you to stay here. There's no point in your going out in this or in both of us being wet and miserable for the next couple of hours. You've been through enough as it is. She set down the purse she'd just picked up. You don't want me with you? You should go on home. She glanced at him, then around the room. Her perfume was on his dresser, her robe on the hook behind the door. Funny. Here I was thinking that's just where I was. Is that my mistake? He took his wallet off the dresser, stuffed it in his back pocket, scooped up the loose change. My aunt's funeral is the last place you should be. That doesn't answer my question, but I'll pose another. Why is your aunt's funeral the last place I should be? For Christ's sake, Faith, put it together. My aunt was married to the man who killed your sister and who might have killed you just two days ago. If you've forgotten that, I haven't. No, I hadn't forgotten it. She turned to the mirror and, to keep her hands busy, picked up her brush. With every appearance of calm, she ran it over her hair. You know, a lot of people, probably most, believe I don't have much more sense than a turnip green, that I'm flighty and foolish and too shallow to stick to anything for longer than it takes to file my nails. That's all right. She set the brush down, picked up her bottle of perfume and dabbed scent on her collarbone. That's all right, she repeated, for most people. But the funny thing is, I expect you to think better of me. I expect you to think better of me than I do of myself. I think considerable of you. Do you, Wade? Her eyes shifted and met his in the mirror. Do you really? And at the same time, you think you can put on that irritable attitude and buzz me off today. Maybe I should just go get my hair done while you're at your aunt's funeral. Then the next time you have to deal with something difficult or uncomfortable, I'll go shopping. And the time after that, she continued, her voice rising, hardening. I'll just have moved on anyway, so it won't be an issue. This is different, Faith. I thought it was. She set the bottle down, turned. I hoped it was. But if you don't want me with you today, if you don't think I want to be with you today or have the belly for it, then this is no different than what I've already done. I'm not interested in repeating myself. Emotion stormed into his eyes, raged through him until his hands were fists. I hate this. I hate seeing my father torn to pieces this way. I hate knowing your family's been ripped again and that mine had a part in it. I hate knowing you were in the same room with Bodine, imagining what could have happened. Well, that's good, because I hate all those things, too. And I'll tell you something maybe you don't know. As soon as it was over that day, as soon as I started thinking again, I wanted you. You were the one person I needed with me. I knew you'd take care of me and hold on to me and everything would be all right. If you don't need the same from me, then I won't let myself need you either. I'm selfish enough to stop. I'll go with you today and stand with you and try to be some comfort to you. Or I'll go back to Bo Rev and start working on getting over you. You could do it, too, he said quietly. Why is it I admire that? Flighty? Foolish? He shook his head as he walked to her. You're the strongest woman I know. Stay with me. He lowered his forehead to hers. Stay with me. That's my plan. She slipped her arms around him, ran her hands up and down his back. I want to be there for you. That's new for me. It's your own fault. You kept at me till I was in love with you. First time I had him aimed and shot first. I kind of like it. She held him, felt him lean on her. She liked that too, she realized. No one had ever leaned on her before. Now come on. She spoke briskly, kissed his cheek. We'll be late, and funerals aren't the kind of occasions where you make grand entrances. He had to laugh. Right. Got an umbrella? Of course not. Of course not. Let me get one. When he went to the closet to root around, she angled her head and studied him with a faint smile. Wait. When we get engaged, will you buy me a sapphire instead of a diamond? 
His hand closed over the handle of the umbrella, then simply froze there. Are we getting engaged? A nice one, not too big or gaudy, mind. Square cut. That first moron I was married to didn't even get me a ring, and the second got me the tackiest diamond. She picked up the black straw hat she'd tossed on the bed and walked to the mirror to set it on her head at an appropriately dignified angle. Might as well have been a big hunk of glass for all the style it had. I sold it after the divorce and had a lovely two weeks at a fancy spa on the proceeds. So what I'd like is a square-cut sapphire. He took the umbrella down, stepped back out of the closet. Are you proposing, Faith? Certainly not. She tipped back her head to look down her nose. And don't think because I'm giving you some inclination of my response it gets you out of asking. I expect you to follow tradition all the way down on one knee. With, she added, a square-cut sapphire in your hand. I'll make a note of it. Fine, you do that little thing. She held out a hand. Ready? I used to think I was. He took her hand, laced his fingers firmly with hers. No one's ever ready for you. They buried her mother in rain that pelted the ground like bullets while lightning ripped and clawed at the eastern sky. Violence, Tori thought. Her mother had lived with it, died from it, and even now it seemed drew it to her. She didn't listen to the minister, though she was sure his words were meant to comfort. She felt too detached to need it and couldn't be sorry for it. She'd never known the woman inside the flower-draped box, never understood her, never depended on her. If Tori had grief, it was for the lack she'd lived with all her life. She watched the rain beat against the casket, listened to it hammer on the umbrella, and waited for it to be over. More had come than she'd expected and stood in a small dark circle in the gloom. She and her uncle flanked her grandmother with the sturdy Cecil just behind them, and Cade stood beside her. Boots, bless her easy heart, wept quietly between her husband and son. Heads were bowed as prayers were read, but faiths lifted and her eyes met Tories, and there was comfort so unexpected from someone who understood. Dwight had come, as mayor, Tory supposed, and as Wade's friend. He stood a little apart, looking solemn and respectful. She imagined he'd be glad to be done with this duty and get back to Lissy. There was Lila, steady as a rock, eyes dry as she silently mouthed the prayers with the minister. And oddly, Cade's Aunt Rosie in full black, complete with hat and veil. It had caught everyone off guard when she'd arrived with a trunk the night before. Margaret was staying temporarily at her place, she'd announced, which meant Rosie had immediately packed to stay temporarily elsewhere. She'd offered Tori her mother's wedding dress, gone yellow as butter with age and smelling strongly of mothballs, then had put it on herself and worn it the rest of the evening. When the casket was lowered into the fresh grave and the minister closed his book, J.R. stepped forward. She had a harder life than she needed to, he cleared his throat, and a harder death than she deserved. She's at peace now. When she was a little girl, she liked yellow daisies best. He kissed the one he held in his hand, then dropped it into the grave and turned away to his wife. He'd have done more for her, Iris said, if she'd let him. I'm going to visit Jimmy while, she told Tori, then we'll be going home. She took Tori's shoulders, kissed her cheeks. I'm happy for you, Tori, and proud. Kincaid, you take care of my little girl. Yes, ma'am. I hope you'll come stay with us, both of you, when you come back to progress. Cecil bent down to touch his lips to Tori's cheek. I'll look after her, he whispered. Don't you worry. I won't. She turned, knowing she was expected to receive condolences. Rosie was right there, her eyes bird-bright behind her veil. It was a proper service, dignified and brief, reflects well on you. Thank you, Miss Rosie. We can't choose our blood, but we can choose what to do with it, what to do about it. She tipped up her face and looked at her nephew. You've chosen well. Margaret will come around, or she won't, but that's not for you to worry about. I'm going to talk to Iris, find out who that big strapping man is she's got with her. She plowed through the wet in a $2,000 Chanel suit and Birkenstocks. Struggling against twin urges to laugh and weep, Tori laid a hand on Cade's arm. Go take her your umbrella. I'll be fine. I'll be right back. Tori, I'm very sorry. Dwight held out a hand and clasping hers, kissed her cheek even as he shifted his umbrella to shield her from the rain. Lissy wanted to come, but I made her stay home. I'm glad you did. It wouldn't be good for her to be out in this weather today. It was kind of you to come, Dwight. We've known each other a long time, and Wade, he's one of my two closest friends. Tori, is there anything I can do for you? No, but thank you. 
I'm going to walk over and visit Hope's grave before I leave. You should go on back to Lissy. I will. Take this. He brought her hand up to the handle of the umbrella. No, I'll be fine. Take it, he insisted, and don't stay out in the wet too long. He left her to walk back to Wade. Grateful for the shelter, Tori turned away from her mother's grave to walk through the grass, through the stones, to Hope's. Rain ran down the angel's face like tears and beat at the fairy roses. Inside the globe, the winged horse flew. It's all over now. Doesn't feel settled yet, Tori said with a sigh. I have this heaviness inside me. Well, it's so much to take in at once. I wish I could. There are too many things to wish for. I never bring flowers here, Faith said from behind her. I don't know why. She has the roses. That's not it. They're not my roses, not mine to bring her. Tori looked behind her, then shifted so they were standing together. I can't feel her here. Maybe you can't either. I don't want to go in the ground when my time comes. I want my ashes spread somewhere. The sea, I think, as that's where I plan to have Wade ask me to marry him. By the sea. She might have felt the same, only hers would have been for the river or near it in the marsh. That was her place. Yes, it was. It is. It seemed important and natural to reach out a hand and clasp faiths. There are flowers at Beau Rev. That was her place, too. I could cut some when the storm passes, take them to the marsh, to the river, put them there for hope. Maybe it would be the right way, laying flowers on the water instead of letting them die on the ground. Would you do that with me? I hated sharing her with you. Faith paused and closed her eyes. Now I don't. It'll be clear this afternoon. I'll tell Wade. She started to walk away and stopped. Tori, if you get there first, I'll wait for you. Tori watched her go, looked back over the gentle slope, the curtaining rain, the gathering ground fog. There was her grandmother with Cecil strong at her back, Rosie in her veil and Lila holding an umbrella over her. J.R. and Boots still by the grave of the sister he had loved more than he might have realized. And there was Cade with his friends, waiting. As she walked to him, the rain began to thin, and the first hint of sun shimmered watery light through the gloom. You understand why I want to do this? I understand you want to. Tori smiled a little as she shook rain from the spears of lavender she'd cut. And you're annoyed just a little that I'm not asking you to come with me. A little. It's counterbalanced by the fact that you and Faith are becoming friends, and... All of that is overpowered by the sheer terror of knowing I'm going to be at Aunt Rosie's mercy until you return. She has a gift for me, and I've seen it. It's a moldy top hat, which she expects I will wear for our wedding. It'll go well with the moth-eaten dress she's giving me. I tell you what, you wear the hat, I'll wear the dress, and we'll have Lila take our picture. We'll put it in a nice frame for Miss Rosie, then we'll pack them away someplace dark and safe before the wedding. That's brilliant. I'm marrying a very wise woman. But we'll have to take the picture tonight. We're getting married tomorrow. Tomorrow, but here, he said as he turned her into his arm, quietly, in the garden. I've taken care of most of the details, and we'll get to the rest this afternoon. But my grandmother, I spoke with her. She and Cecil will be staying another night. They'll be here. I haven't had time to buy a dress, or your grandmother mentioned that and hoped you'd be receptive to wearing the one she wore when she married your grandfather. She's running up to Florence to get it this afternoon. She said it would mean a lot to her. Thought of everything, didn't you? Yes, you have a problem with that? Oh, we're going to have lots of problems with that over the next 50 or 60 years, but just now, no. Good. Lila's baking a cake. J.R.'s bringing a case of champagne. The idea brightened him considerably. Thank you. Since you're grateful, I'll just add Aunt Rosie plans to sing. Don't tell me. She drew back. Let's not spoil the moment. Well, since everyone has approved the schedule and the details, who am I to object? Have you arranged for the honeymoon, too? She saw him wince and rolled her eyes. Cade, really? You're not going to argue about a trip to Paris, are you? Of course not. He gave her a quick kiss before she could. You might want to close the shop for a few days, but Boots really liked the idea of running it for you, and Faith had some ideas. Oh, God. But that's up to you. Thank you very much. She pushed a hand through her hair. My head's spinning. We'll discuss all this when I get back. Sure, I'm flexible. The hell you are, she muttered. You just pretend to be. She shifted the basket of flowers, handed him the shears. 
Don't start naming the children while I'm gone. Exasperating man, she thought as she slid into her car and set the basket of flowers on the seat, planning their wedding behind her back. Planning exactly the sort of wedding she wanted to. How irritating and how lovely to be known that well. So why wasn't she relaxed? As she turned onto the road, she shifted her shoulders. She just couldn't quite break through the tension. Understandable, she reminded herself, she'd been through a hideous ordeal. She couldn't imagine getting married within 24 hours with so much still tied up inside her. But she wanted to begin. She wanted to close this door and open the next. She glanced at the flowers beside her. Maybe she was about to. She pulled off onto the side of the road where Hope had once parked her bike. And climbing out, she crossed the little bridge where tiger lilies burst into storybook bloom, then took the path she knew her friend had taken that night. Hope Lavelle, Girl Spy The rain had turned to steam, and the steam rose out of the ground in curling fingers that broke apart, then twined together again around her ankles. The air was thick with wet, with green, with rot, mysteries waiting to be solved. As she approached the clearing, she wished she'd thought to bring some wood. Everything would be too damp to start a fire, and perhaps it was foolish to want to in all the heat, but she wished she'd thought of it and could have laid one the way Hope had. Just thinking of it, remembering it, she caught a drift of smoke. There was the fire, small and carefully built to burn low, a little circle of flame with long, sharpened sticks beside it waiting for marshmallows. She blinked once to clear the vision but the fire simmered and the smoke puffed sluggishly in the mist. Dazed, Tori stepped into the clearing, the basket tipping to spill out flowers at her feet. Hope? She pressed a hand to her heart almost to make sure it continued to beat, but the marble child who'd been her friend stood in her pool of flowers and said nothing. With a trembling hand, she picked up one of the sticks and saw that the cuts to sharpen it were fresh. Not a dream. Not a flashback but here and now, real. Not hope, never again hope. The pressure rose up in her, a hot gush of fear and of knowledge. In the brush came a rustling, wet and sly. She whirled toward it. Password. She thought it, heard it sound in her head. But she wasn't hope. She wasn't eight, and dear God, it wasn't over after all. Cade was in the garden deciding where they should set up tables for the wedding reception when Chief Russ pulled in. Glad you're here. I just got news I thought you should know. Come on inside where it's cool. No, I gotta get back, but I wanted to tell you in person. We got ballistic reports on Sarah Beth Bodine. The gun she was killed with wasn't the same one Bodine had with him, not even the same caliber. Cade felt one quick knock of dread. I'm not sure I understand. Turns out the one Bodine had when he broke in on Tori and your sister was stolen from a house about 15 miles south of here on the morning Tori's mother was killed. House was broken into between 9 and 10 a.m. that same day. How can that be? Only way it could be is as if Bodine sprouted wings and flew down here from Darlington County or if somebody else put those bullets in Ms. Bodine. Carl D. cupped a hand over his chin and rubbed it hard. His eyes burned with fatigue. I've been in touch with those Federals, and I'm piecing it together. The phone records show Miss Bodine got a call just after two that morning from the payphone outside the Winn-Dixie north of town here. Now, we were figuring that would have been Bodine calling her from here, telling her he was coming for her, and that's fine as far as it goes, but it don't fit when you add the rest. It had to be Bodine calling her. Why else would she have packed up? I can't say. But you got him calling from here at around 2 in the morning, getting up there, doing the shooting between 5 and 5.30, then heading back here, moving south another 15 miles, breaking into a house and stealing a gun, a bottle, and some leftover supper. Now why would the man be zigzagging back and forth that way? He was crazy. I won't argue with that, but being crazy doesn't make him able to all but break land and speed records in one morning, especially since it doesn't look like he had any kind of vehicle. Now, I'm not saying it couldn't be done. I'm saying it don't make sense. What kind of sense does it make otherwise? Who else would have killed Tori's mother? I can't answer that. I got to work with facts here. He had the wrong gun. We got nothing to show the man had a car. Now, could be we'll find one yet, and the gun that he used on his wife, that could be. He took his handkerchief out of his pocket, wiped the back of his neck. 
But it appears to me, if Bodine didn't do those murders up in Darlington County, maybe he didn't kill anyone. That means whoever did still walking free. I was hoping to have a talk with Tori. She's not here. She's white-hot fear burned through his belly. She's gone to hope. Tori opened herself, tried to feel him, gauge him, but all she saw was dark, cold, blank dark. The rustling moved in a circle, a taunting. She turned with it even as the saliva dried up in her mouth. She turned to face it, head on. Which of us did you want that night, or did it matter? It was never you. Why would I want you? She was beautiful. She was a child. True. Dwight stepped out into the clearing. But so was I. It broke her heart. One quick snap. You were Cade's friend. Sure. Cade and Wade, like twins themselves, rich and privileged and handsome. And I was their chubby little token, Dwight the Dweeb. Well, I fooled them all, didn't I? He'd have been twelve, she thought, staring at the easy smile on his face. No more than twelve years old. Why? Call it a rite of passage. They were always first, one or the other of them, always first in everything. I was going to be the first one to have a girl. Amusement, it couldn't be anything but amusement, danced in his eyes. Not that I could brag on it, kind of like being Batman. Oh, God, Dwight. Hard for you to see that, you being a female. We'll call it a guy thing. I had a bad itch. Why shouldn't it have been my good friend Cade's precious sister I used to scratch it? He spoke so calmly, so casually, that the birds continued to sing, liquid notes that ran like tears. I didn't know I was going to kill her. That just happened. I'd snuck some of my daddy's whiskey, drink like a man, you know. My mind was a little fuzzy. You were only twelve. How could you want such a thing? He circled the clearing, not really coming closer, just stalking, a patient, anticipatory cat and mouse. I used to watch the two of you skinny-dipping or sprawled out here on your bellies telling secrets. So'd your old man, he said with a grin. You might say I was inspired by him. He wanted you. Your old man wanted to fuck you all right, but he didn't have the guts. I was better than him, better than any of them. I proved it that night. I was a man that night. Town mayor, proud father, devoted husband, loyal friend. What kind of madness could hide so well? You raped and murdered a child. That made you a man? All my life I heard, be a man, Dwight. The amusement died out of his eyes, so they turned cold and blank. For Christ's sake, be a man. Can't be a man if you're a virgin, can you? And no girl would look twice at me. I fixed that. That night changed my life. Look at me now. He spread his arms, stepped closer, watching her. I got confidence, got myself in shape, and didn't I end up with the prettiest girl in progress? I got respect, a beautiful wife, a son, I got position. It all started that night. All those other girls. Why not? You can't imagine what it's like, or maybe you can, yeah, and <laughs> maybe you can. You know how to feel it, don't you? Their fear. While it's happening, I'm the most important person in the world to them. I am the world of them. There's a hell of a kick to that. She thought of running. The idea whipped in and out of her mind, and she saw the gleam in his eye, saw he was waiting for her to do just that. Deliberately, she slowed her breathing and opened herself. There was the blankness again like a pit, but around the edges was a kind of ugly hunger. Recognizing it, anticipating it, was the only weapon she had. You didn't even know them. Dwight, they were strangers to you. I just imagine their hope, and it's that first night all over again. They're nothing but tramps and losers until I make them into her. It wasn't the same with Sherry. I didn't want to wait, he shrugged. Lissy isn't much on sex these days, can't blame her, and that sexy little teacher, she wanted it. Wanted it from Wade, those stupid bitch. Well, she got it from me. She wasn't quite right, though, not quite. Faith's perfect. He saw Tori jolt. Yeah, you've gotten pretty tight with Faith, haven't you? I plan to be pretty tight with her myself. I was going to wait till August for her, got my little ritual, you know, but I'll have to move things up. Oh, she'll be late, by the way. I talked Lissy into going over to see her, and I know my girl. She'll keep Faith occupied just long enough. They'll know this time, Dwight. 
you won't be able to pass it off on someone else. Yeah, your father sure did cooperate, didn't he? Did I mention I was the one who killed your mother? Gave her a call, told her I was a friend, and her loving husband was on his way to get her. Just seemed like a nice touch, one that kept the cops on his ass and let me sit back and watch with my concerned mayor attitude. She was nothing to you. None of them was, except Hope. And don't you worry about me. Nobody will look to me. I'm an upstanding citizen. And right now I'm out at the mall buying a teddy bear for my unborn child. A big yellow bear. Lizzie's just going to love it. I could never really feel you, she murmured, because there's nothing there to feel. You're almost blank inside. I wondered about that. It gave me some bad moments. I took your hand today, a kind of test, just to see. You got nothing from me. But you're going to feel me before we're done. Why don't you run the way she did? You know how she ran and called out. I'll give you a chance. No, I'll give myself one. Without an instant's hesitation, she stabbed out with the stick aiming for his eye. When he screamed, she ran, as Hope had done. The moss tangled in her hair, slithering spider legs, and the ground sucked greedily at her feet. Her shoes slithered, tearing through soaked ferns as she batted viciously at branches. She saw, as Hope had seen, the two images blending into one, hot summer night merging with steamy afternoon and felt as Hope had felt, with her own fear and rage leaping just ahead of the childhood terror. She heard as Hope had heard, the footsteps pounding behind her, the thrashing through the brush. It was the rage that stopped her, that made her turn before the intent was clear in her mind. It seared through her, black as pitch, as she charged him with teeth and claws. Stunned by the sudden attack, half blind from the blood, he went down beneath her, howling as she sank her teeth into his shoulder. He struck out, felt the blow connect, but she clung like a burr, raking her nails down his face. None of the others had been able to fight him, but she would. God, she would. I am Tori. The words were a battle cry ringing in her ears. She was Tori, and she would fight. Even when his hands closed around her throat, she tore at him. When her vision grayed, when she was gasping for air, she used her fists. Someone was shouting her name, wild, desperate calls that echoed inside the roar of blood in her head. She clawed at the hands around her throat, choking when the grip loosened. I feel you now, fear and pain. Now you know, now you know, you bastard. She was being lifted away, and she fought mindlessly, her gaze locked on Dwight's face. Blood ran from his eye, and his cheeks were ripped from her hands. Now you know, now you know. Tori, stop, stop, look at me. His face white and running with sweat, Cade held hers until her eyes cleared. He killed her. It was always him. I never saw it. He's hated you his whole life. He's hated all of you. You're hurt. No, I'm not. It's his blood. Cade, my God, she went crazy. Coughing, Dwight rolled to his side, struggled up to hands and knees. It felt as if he were bleeding from a thousand wounds. His right eye was a burning coal, but his mind worked and worked fast and cool. She thought I was her father. Liar! Rage bloomed again and had her struggling wildly against Cade. He killed Hope! He was waiting here for me! Killed Hope! Blood dripped from his torn mouth as Dwight sank back on his knees. That was almost twenty years ago. She's sick, Cade. Anybody could see she's sick. Jesus, my eye, you have to help me. He tried to get to his feet and was genuinely shocked when his legs wouldn't hold him. For God's sake, Cade, call an ambulance. I'm going to lose my fucking eye. You knew they came here. Cade kept Tori's arms pinned as he studied the ravaged face of his old friend. You knew they snuck out at night to come in here. I told you myself. We laughed about it. What does that have to do with anything? Dwight's good eye wheeled as he heard the slash of wet branches. Carl D., panting with the effort, pushed through the brush. Thank Christ. Chief, call an ambulance. Tori had some kind of breakdown. Look what she did to me. Sweet Jesus Christ, Carl D. muttered as he hurried forward to Dwight's side. He wanted me to run, but I've stopped running. Tori stopped struggling and lay a hand over Cade's as Carl D. crouched to tie his handkerchief over Dwight's ruined eye. He killed Hope and the others. He killed my mother. I tell you, she's crazy, Dwight shouted. He couldn't see. God damn it, he couldn't see. His teeth began to chatter. She can't face what her father did. We'll get you to the hospital. Dwight, then we'll sort this all out. Carl D. looked over at Tori. Are you hurt? No, I'm not hurt. 
you don't want to believe me. You don't want to believe what he is has been living side by side with you all these years. But it has. It found a way. She shifted, met Cade's eyes. I'm sorry. I don't want to believe you either, but I do. I know it. And drawing on that, she got to her feet. The gun he killed my mother with is in the attic of his house, up in the rafters on the south side. Gently she rubbed a hand over her throat where the violence of his fingers left their mark. You made a mistake, Dwight, letting me in that far, getting that close. Should have been more careful with your thoughts. She's lying. She planted it there herself. She's crazy. He stumbled as Carl D. pulled him to his feet. Cade, we've been friends all our lives. You have to believe me. There's something you have to believe, Cade told him. If I'd gotten here sooner, you'd be dead now. You believe that, and you remember it. You gotta come on with me now, Dwight, Carl D. snapped cuffs over his wrists. What are you doing? What the hell are you doing? You're taking the word of a crazy woman over mine? That gun in where she said, or it doesn't match what was used to kill a young police officer and a helpless woman, I'll give you a big apology. Come on with me. Miss Tory, you best go on to the hospital yourself. No, she wiped the blood off her mouth with the back of her hand. I haven't done what I came to do. You go ahead, Carl D. told him. I'll take care of this. Miss Tory, I'll be by to see you later. She's crazy, Dwight screamed it, kept screaming it as Carl D. pulled him away. He's insulted. With a shaky laugh, Tori pressed her fingers to her eyes. That's the primary emotion running through him right now. Insult that he would be treated like a criminal. It's even bigger than the hate and the hunger. Step back from him, Cade demanded. Don't look at him. You're right, Cade. You're right. Second time I almost lost you, I'll be damned if it'll ever happen again. You believed me, Tori murmured. I could feel how it hurt you, but you believed me. I can't tell you what that means. She put her arms around him and held tight. You loved him. I'm so sorry. I didn't even know him. And still, Cade grieved. If I could go back, we can't. I've spent a lot of time learning that. Your face is bruised. He turned his lips to it. His is worse. She leaned her head against his shoulder as they began to walk. I was running, and I was going to keep on running. Then, all at once, there was this life inside me, this rage of life. He wasn't going to win. He wasn't going to chase me like a fox after a rabbit. For once, he was going to know what it was like. He was going to know. He would never get the picture completely out of his head, Cade knew, of Tori, her face bruised and bloody, tearing like a cat at Dwight, and his hands around her throat. He'll keep denying, Cade said. He'll hire lawyers, but it won't matter. In the end, it won't matter what he does. No, I think you can depend on Agent Williams to tie it all up. Poor Lissy, she sighed. What will she do? Tori stopped in the clearing to gather the fallen flowers. The fire had burned down to sputters, and the light, watery streams of it slanted through the trees. I'll come back and do this another time with Faith. This time is for you and me. Together they walked to the banks of the river. We loved her, and we'll always remember her. Tori tossed flowers on the water. But it's over now. Finally. I've waited so long to say goodbye. She had tears in her yet, but they were quiet and they were healing. They glimmered on her cheeks as she turned to Cade. I'd like to marry you in the garden tomorrow and wear my grandmother's dress. He took her hand and kissed it. Would you? Yes, I would. Yes, I very much would. And I'd like to go to Paris with you and sit at a table in the sunlight and drink wine, make love with you when the sun's coming up. Then I want to come back here and build a life with you. We're already building one. He drew her close. The sun shimmered in thin beams and moss dripped with rain. Flowers, bright blossoms, floated silently down the river. God help us, but I'm hungry enough myself, I'll risk it. Branna walked back with them, glancing back once. Right up the arse, she thought. <laughs>